This is Audible. Blender Babies Written by John Athen Narrated by Jamal West Warning This book contains scenes of intense violence and some disturbing themes. Some parts of this book may be considered violent, cruel, disturbing, or unusual. This book is not intended for those easily offended or appalled. Please enjoy your own discretion. Chapter 1. When it began. Can I see your phone? Leslie Turner asked. She sat in the passenger seat of the station wagon, holding her hand out over the center console, palm up. Her other hand rested on her baby bump. Her husband, Brian, sat in the driver's seat, gripping the steering wheel at ten and two and their five-year-old son, Cameron, was sitting in the back seat. He played with his toys, a small red car and a Lego minifigure dressed as a Minecraft character, while making engine sound effects with his mouth. Why? Brian responded, keeping his eyes on the road. Leslie said, Why not? Because I'm driving and my phone's in my back pocket. Oh, please. I've seen you drive with a burger in one hand and a drink in the other but I've never done that with precious cargo on board, have I? Okay, whatever. Lean over and I'll grab it myself. The station wagon crawled to a stop behind a pickup truck at a red light. Brian turned to face his wife, a devilish smile playing at the corner of his mouth. He said, You just want to change the music, don't you? Brown-Eyed Girl by Van Morrison was playing over the stereo, which was connected to Brian's phone via Bluetooth. Can't Take My Eyes Off You by Andy Williams was up next in his queue. Please, Brian, Leslie said. I'm just not really in the mood for this old stuff, and you play the same playlist every time. Well, it is my turn to control the radio. Your turn? Come on, you're sounding more childish than Cam right now. From the back seat, Cameron said, I'm a big kid now, Mommy. I know, honey. You're more mature than Daddy, Leslie said glancing back and smiling at him. The little boy rammed the toy car into the minifigure, then moved the toys away from each other and made a loud explosion sound with his mouth. Lips fluttering, spittle flew out in every direction. Leslie curled her index finger at her husband and said, Now hand it over, bub. Brian said, All right, all right, I'll be a gentleman and share my turn with you. As he reached for his back pocket, The traffic light turned green and the truck in front of them sprang forward. Smirking, Brian said, Oh, would you look at that? No time now. Maybe at the next stop, hon. Shaking her head, Leslie snickered and said, You're such a brat. They kept driving. Their destination was a Mexican restaurant called La Cocina de Nacho, which translated to Nacho's Kitchen in a downtown strip mall. Brian met Leslie in the middle and switched to his playlist of 90s music. The family rocked out to NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, Weezer, and TLC. After a few songs, however, Cameron's attention wandered to the sun. He wondered if it was following them. He imagined the station wagon was a spaceship, and they were racing to the restaurant against the sun. What's happening over there? Leslie asked, peering through the passenger window. Keeping one eye on the road, Brian lowered the volume on the stereo and said, It's a lot of cops. You think it was a... Leslie peeked over at Cameron before lowering her voice to finish her sentence. A mass shooting? I mean, it could be. But I feel like they wouldn't let us drive through here if there was an active shooter. Maybe it's already over. Or maybe it's more like a hostage situation. In a hospital? Christ, who would do something like that? To their right, SWAT trucks and patrol cars cluttered every aisle of the parking lot surrounding a local hospital. Police officers and SWAT teams maneuvered between the civilian vehicles and the parking spaces. They were all armed with semi-automatic rifles and led by cops wielding ballistic shields. Police blocked all the entrances and exits to the parking lot. Some pedestrians gathered on the sidewalks and watched the situation unfold from afar, chattering and recording with their cell phones as if they were watching a street performance. Brian said, Maybe it's a John Q. style situation. John Q.? You mean the the Denzel Washington movie? The Denzel Washington classic. Leslie gave him a look of disapproval and said, Now's not the time for joking. I'm serious. Not just about the movie being a classic, but about everything. 
I mean, if it is a hostage situation, why else would it be going down in a hospital? It has to be a disgruntled person. Maybe it's an employee going postal, or maybe it's a parent trying to get their child some medical assistance that their insurance won't cover. I know I'd be willing to do anything to protect you guys. Yeah, well, I just hope no one's hurt. Five minutes later, they found themselves seated in La Cocina de Nacho. Leslie sat next to Cameron while Brian sat directly across from his wife. Spanish music played through the restaurant's sound system. Although he didn't understand the Spanish lyrics, Cameron enjoyed the sound of the guitars and trumpets. He danced in his seat and tried to hum along to the music. While visiting their table to take their order, a young waitress patted Cameron's shoulder and said, Que lindo! It translated to, How cute! The boy couldn't help but giggle and blush. Eating for two, Leslie was on a protein-rich diet, so she had been craving burritos with beans and beef, as well as salty tortilla chips with avocado and pico de gallo sauce. Brian opted for a plate of enchiladas, and Cameron ate a quesadilla with carne asada. The restaurant was busy and loud, but it had a relaxing atmosphere. All the patrons, families, couples, singles were enjoying their food. It was a regular day. During their meal, Brian smiled as he noticed Leslie instinctively rubbing her baby bump. He remembered seeing her stroke her belly during her sleep when she was pregnant with Cameron. He wondered if babies could feel their mother's touch before birth. Although they already had a child, taking a variety of classes and reading a ton of books to prepare in the process, he still had hundreds of questions, and new ones popped into his mind every day. After lunch, while cruising through the parking lot, Leslie said, Let's take the long way home. The long way, Brian repeated. I don't think I've ever heard you say that before. What's the long way? I mean, I just want to avoid the hospital. I checked Twitter when we were in the restaurant, she said as she took her phone out and opened the social media app. You were right. They're calling it a hostage crisis in a maternity ward. Something bad is happening over there, and I don't want to get caught in a shootout. Maternity ward? Oh, shit. That's not what I was. Dad said a bad word, Cameron announced from the back seat. Yeah, you caught me, buddy. I'll put a quarter in the swear jar when we get home, Brian said, peeking at his son through the rearview mirror. He stopped the car at a stop sign and took a turn out of the parking lot. He said, a hostage crisis. I didn't expect it to be something like that, Les. Now that's just cruel. It's a crazy world. It's a scary world, Leslie said, scrolling through tragedy after tragedy in her Twitter timeline. She stopped the music and switched to the radio, searching for a local news report on the situation. Brian could see her anxiety was spiking. She struggled with chronic worrying. What ifs were flooding her mind? What if the violence spills out into the streets? What if this becomes more common in the future? What if this happens to us? The station wagon stopped at a red light. Looking out his window, Cameron asked, Why is that guy running with a baby? Without looking back, Brian answered, Babies need exercise too, kiddo. He touched Leslie's wrist and said, Hun, hun, hey, you gotta relax. You remember what the doctor said about stress, don't you? I can relax after I know what's happening, Leslie said. You already know what's happening. Now you're just doom surfing. Looking for information isn't doom surfing, Brian. Green light, Cameron said. Brian said, I know you, Les. That thing at the hospital, it really has nothing to do with you, but you're already overthinking it. Nothing to do with me? I'm pregnant, aren't I? Leslie responded. But we've never been to that hospital. Dad, green light, Cameron exclaimed. Driving forward, Brian continued. Whatever happened over there, you can't let it. The station wagon collided with a man. The guy rolled over the hood of the vehicle and hit the windshield. Leslie gasped in horror one hand on her baby bump and the other on the dashboard. Cameron yelped as the seatbelt locked up against his ribcage. Shit! Brian shouted as he stomped on the brakes. The man was thrown off the station wagon. One of his shoes flew off as he hit the asphalt with a loud thud. He rode a few meters forward, bones crunching and skin shredding. The sleeves of his black, tattered hoodie were pushing up. His grimy, tattered arms were bloody, cut and scraped. There were more abrasions on his rugged face. A chunk of his chin was torn off, turning his goatee into a horseshoe mustache. 
Blood came out from somewhere under his beanie, too, trickling down to his forehead and cheek. He groaned and squirmed on the ground, body aching all over. Fearing the airbags were going to activate, Brian cautiously took Leslie's hand off the dashboard and asked, Are you okay? Leslie lowered her head and inspected her abdomen. She had felt some pressure from the seatbelt during the collision, but she didn't feel any pain at the moment. Y yeah, she said, voice trembling. She took off her seatbelt and turned in her seat to face Cameron. She reached for his leg and asked, Are you okay, baby? Teary-eyed, Cameron nodded and said, Dad, Daddy said a, a, a bad word again. And the baby? Brian asked. And when his wife didn't respond, he raised his voice. Leslie, hey, how's the baby? We're fine, Brian, she said with her concerned eyes glued on their son. Sweetie, does your neck hurt? Brian stepped out of the car. From over the driver's door, he watched as the victim struggled to his feet. He could see the traffic light was still green and they hadn't driven past the crosswalk yet. He had struck a jaywalker. He felt some relief knowing the crash wasn't entirely his fault. The guy's right leg wobbled uncontrollably. Fibula and tibia cracked, kneecap busted, ankle sprained. He tried to limp towards Brian, but he lost his footing. He came reeling towards the vehicle, catching himself on the hood of the car before he could fall to the ground. Brian said, Hey, man, you. I'm sorry, you, you came out of nowhere, are you? He flinched as the driver behind him honked his horn. The truck swerved around the station wagon, then sped down the neighboring lane. Other vehicles cruised past them. Some of the drivers and passengers rubbernecked at the accident, but no one stopped to offer a helping hand. Sir, I know this might sound stupid, but are you okay? Brian asked. Swaying from side to side, the man grumbled unintelligibly. Of course he's not okay. Brian whispered to himself. He cleared his throat, then said, We should get you off the street. I can help you over to the sidewalk. You can sit at that bus stop over there. There's a bench, see? I'll pull over, um, around the corner, I guess, and then I'll call an ambulance. You're not dying, are you? How's your head? The man leaned away from the hood, drops of blood and strings of drool falling from his face. He glanced into the station wagon through the windshield, then did a wide-eyed double-take. His eyes lit up in a frenzy of rabbit hunger as he honed in on Leslie. He licked the blood off his flaky, cracked lips, flicking his tongue like a snake. Focused on Leslie, he hobbled over to the driver's side of the station wagon. Although he dragged his injured leg behind him, he moved as if he didn't feel any pain. Oh shit, man, you're bleeding pretty badly, Brian said as he took his cell phone out of his pocket. I'll call 911 right now, but shit, man, what were you thinking right now in front of us like? Mid-sentence. The man screamed and rammed Brian's chest with his bony shoulder, simultaneously slamming his back against the side of the car. Dad! Cameron cried as he slapped his window. With the wind knocked out of him, Brian curled up and dropped his phone. The man pushed him to the ground and forced his way into the station wagon through the driver's door. Don't make this hard for me, cunt! He growled as he lunged at Leslie. Fumbling with her seatbelt and clawing at her loose dress, he said, The baby! Give me the baby, bitch! Give me! Give me! Give me! Leslie pivoted in her seat, leaned back against the passenger door and shouted, Get out! Get off me! Get off me! Don't touch my mom! Cameron yelled as he threw his toy car at the intruder's head. Brian, help! Brian, oh my God, help! Stop! Don't hurt her! No, stop it! The intruder took a utility knife out of his pocket and thumbed its slider. Half of the blade shot out with a rapid succession of clicks. Leslie couldn't see the weapon, but she recognized the noise. In a panic, she swung her elbows and fists at the man's face. Cameron flung his minifigure at his head then hit his arm with the bottom of his fist. He injured his own hands more than he hurt the intruder, but he fought through the pain to defend his mother. Give me the fucking baby, the man screamed. Just as he raised the blade overhead, Brian grabbed the back of the intruder's waistband and pulled him out of the car. They stumbled to the ground outside. Brian jumped to his feet and kicked the utility knife out of the man's hand. It bounced into an oncoming lane where traffic continued unimpeded. The intruder wasn't interested in Brian, though. He scrambled back to the car and climbed onto the driver's seat. What's your fucking problem? Brian yelled as he pulled the man out again. He pushed him up against the rear passenger door, causing Cameron to recoil. They started trading blows. Brian wrestled him to the ground by sweeping his broken leg, but the guy kept standing back up. The intruder was feverish, fueled by a surge of hysterical strength. Between the punching and grappling, he glanced back at Leslie an inch closer to the driver's door. 
he only had one thing on his mind. The baby. Cameron pulled on his door's handle repeatedly and slapped his window. He wanted to help his father, but the child's safety lock prevented him from getting out of the car. Stop, Cam, Leslie said while fiddling with her cell phone. She had trouble unlocking it because of her clammy hands. The touchscreen didn't recognize her taps, and the fingerprint scanner couldn't read her fingerprint. Dad needs help, Cameron cried, bouncing anxiously in his seat. Honey, he's okay. We, we're going to be okay. No, he's hurting him. Cameron, please, you have to. Her voice trailed off as she heard a clack behind her. She turned her head slowly until she noticed the movement at the periphery of her vision. Screaming, she slid to the opposite edge of her seat, the small of her back against the center console. A lanky man with a patchy beard was tugging on the door handle. His eyes were bloodshot and his face was deathly pale. His wide, manacled grin revealed two rows of yellow decaying teeth in his bloody, rotting gums. Brian! she yelled. Over the station wagon's roof, Brian spied the other man, but he couldn't get a good look at him. He had no idea why these strangers had converged on his car, but he could feel the danger in the air. They wanted to harm them. He had to get his family out of there. He grabbed the intruder's arms, one in each hand, pulled him away from the station wagon then turned and pushed him into the neighboring oncoming lane. As the intruder landed on his knees, a speeding bus plowed into him. With a bang, every bone in his ribcage shattered. His head, caught under one of the massive wheels, burst like a big, throbbing, pulse-filled pimple. His beanie flew off his head like a rocket, leaving a streak of blood behind it before stopping at the sidewalk on the other side of the street. The bus dragged him ten meters before completely rolling over his body. The bus driver didn't stop didn't even touch his brake pedal. He was driving well over the speed limit while swerving between lanes. Back against the rear passenger door, Brian gaffed at the aftermath of the crash. A slope of liquefied brain, chunks of detached scalp, a crushed eyeball, and a severed ear were smeared on the asphalt. The man's mangled legs were tangled together like a braided ponytail. His left shoulder, dragged across the pavement, was whittled down, leaving his arm attached to his torso by some threads of meat. His head was flattened, Pulverized. A pickup truck sped down the oncoming lane. As the truck hit the human roadkill, Brian turned his back to the gory accident. He heard a moist crunching sound from the dead body. In a soft, awed voice, he said, What the fuck? What the fuck? He began to notice the chaos unfolding all around him. There was a McDonald's at the corner of the block. A police cruiser was parked in front of the fast food joint, its emergency light bar flashing red and blue. The driver's door was open, but the cop was nowhere to be seen. A playground was attached to the restaurant. Near a jungle gym, a man lay dead in a puddle of blood between a stroller and a table. He had been stabbed in the neck three times. A child's ashen, bloodied, limp hand stuck out from a ball pit. Two men, one in a suit and the other covered in layers of coats, chased a woman and her baby through a network of transparent tubes in the playground. At a park across the street, a group of men and a woman ran through a field cheering and clapping. One of them appeared to be carrying an infant. A woman lay on a walkway next to an overturned stroller. She was crying for help. They took my baby, she was saying. My baby, oh my God, my baby. On the other side of the station wagon, the guy with the patchy beard was hitting Leslie's window with his fist and elbows. He headbutted it once, unintentionally dazing himself. Another man ran up to the station wagon. He tried to open the rear passenger door, then the trunk. Brian got into the car, slamming and locking the door behind him before the other man could reach him. He turned the key in the ignition and put the pedal to the metal. Through the rear view mirror, he saw one of the men tumble and the other give chase. The guy gave up after a few seconds, though. Brian couldn't hear anything except his own breathing and his thoughts. Everything else, Leslie's voice, Cameron's crying, the screaming and the sirens outside, was muffled. He didn't know where to go either. It didn't seem safe anywhere. He had to slow down at another intersection. Most drivers were still following traffic laws, but there were enough outlaws on the road for the law-abiding citizens to notice something was among. Those outlaws were barreling through intersections and weaving through traffic, ignoring red lights and stop signs and even pedestrians. They treated the roads like racetracks and vehicles like bumper cars. Stopped at the intersection, Leslie grabbed Brian's arm. He gasped and looked at her as if he had forgotten she was there. His hearing returned, gradually becoming clearer. Although she seemed to be yelling, Leslie's voice sounded like a loud whisper. He could hardly hear her over Brian's bawling in the back seat. A feeling of uselessness left him with a knot in his stomach. He was old-fashioned, to an extent. 
As the man of the house, the husband, the father, the patriarch, he felt responsible for his family's safety. He was just as scared as Leslie and Cameron. He wasn't afraid to admit it. He wasn't afraid to admit it. He wasn't afraid to be vulnerable or emotional, but he knew it wasn't time to show it. Like a contagious disease, panic was easy to spread and difficult to stop. He shut his eyes and calmed himself with a few deep breaths. When he opened his eyes, the traffic light was green. Yet, despite the green light, he stopped over the crosswalk and checked both ways before continuing the drive forward. Are you listening? Leslie asked, her voice quivering. What's happening? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? Mom, I'm scared. Cameron whined, tears spilling down his red cheeks. Brian said, Everything. His voice cracked right away. He grunted, breathed deeply, then said, Everything's okay. We're going to get away from, from whatever's happening over there. We can't go home. Not that way anyway. So we'll find somewhere safe and we'll call the police. Or we'll go to a police station or a fire station or a hospital. Just, we will find somewhere safe. You hear me back there, buddy? We're all okay. I just got a couple of scratches and mom and the baby are fine. Right, Les? You're good, right? Breathing shakily, Leslie looked down at herself. Her dress was disheveled, but she was unharmed. Her heart was pounding so hard that she felt some discomfort in her chest. It made her worry more about the baby than herself. We're good, she answered. She looked back at Cameron and said, We're okay, sweetie. I wish you hadn't put yourself in danger like that, but you were very strong, baby. Thank you. Cameron could only snivel. Wandering through the city, they noticed a stampede at a shopping plaza. The customers were trying to get away from something or someone. A column of black smoke rose from one of the stores in the back. On another street, they saw a patrol car speeding down a sidewalk with its emergency lights on and its siren blaring. The car clipped an elderly man, launching him into the street. The driver didn't stop. Speaking quietly so as not to alarm their son, Leslie said, This is insane. This could be some sort of terrorist attack. Maybe we should avoid the sirens. We can go home and lock ourselves in until there's some sort of announcement, a state of emergency, or an order to evacuate, or, or something. All I know is it isn't safe out here. We'd have to go all around the city to avoid that craziness back there, Brian said as he turned onto a quiet residential street. Then where are we supposed to go? The hospitals are probably crowded by now. If not, Who's to say they're not having a hostage crisis like that other hospital we passed earlier? It could all be connected, right? And the police, look at them. They're out here running over people. You saw that, didn't you? Who can we trust? Maybe we should just get on the highway and leave town. That could work, right? Wait, we, we're close to Tommy's place right now. We can hunker down with him, at least until we get an idea of what's going on. Tommy, oh jeez, I don't know if that's a good idea, Brian. Snorting between words because of the mucus dripping from his nose, Cameron said, We're going to see Uncle Tommy. At 34 years old, Thomas Tommy Turner was Brian's younger brother. He had a history of drug and alcohol addiction. He was now on his longest streak of sobriety since his teenage years. Using the connections he had made as a security guard, Brian had helped him find a job at a power plant. Leslie supported Tommy through his struggles, but she didn't want Cameron spending too much time with him. She feared he was always on the verge of relapse. Cameron only met him for the first time a few months earlier. He didn't notice anything unusual about his uncle, but due to his unkept appearance, he believed Tommy was older than his dad. Brian took another turn. He rolled his window down an inch. The neighborhood was calm. He detected some movement inside the duplexes to his left. A sedan rolled down that same road. It turned into a driveway. The driver, a portly guy with a white mustache and a trucker cap on his head exited the vehicle. He was in no hurry. On another street, they saw a teenager strolling down a sidewalk while dribbling a basketball. He listened to music through his Bluetooth earbuds. They couldn't tell whether he was unaware of the pandemonium spreading through the city or he simply didn't care about it. Feeble echoes of pain, groans, cries, shrieks reached the street from other neighborhoods too. Brian parked on the side of the road next to a palm tree. To their right, there were two three-story apartment complexes. The one behind them had a green and white exterior. Its walls were sprayed with graffiti from the local gangs and tagging crews. The other building had an orange exterior. The bird shit on the walls resembled white polka dots. Tommy lived in the orange building. 
A sign on the side of the building read, Sunny Vista. From their parking space, they could see the pool behind the apartment complex. Wait here, Brian said as he took his seatbelt off. Huh? Leslie responded. I'm going to head in by myself. I have to make sure it's safe before I can let you waltz in there. You don't have to let me do anything. I can make my own decisions. Leslie, I heard what that guy said back there. I saw the way those other guys looked at you. I don't know why, but they wanted you. They wanted our baby. I don't want to take any unnecessary risk. I'll go in there and make sure the coast is clear. You wait here with the doors locked. If anything goes wrong, if someone approaches you, if you hear me scream, if you just have a bad feeling in your gut, you drive off. Leslie frowned and asked, You want me to just leave you? Brian held her hand, gave her a reassuring smile and said, I'll find a way to catch up to you. Circle the block a couple of times and maybe you'll see me running after you. Go home. Go to your mom's. Go to your obstetrician or Tam's pediatrician. He laughed half-heartedly, then said, One way or another, I'll find you. Let's not dwell on this, though. We're talking the worst-case scenario as if it's guaranteed to happen. I'll be okay. I'll be back in five minutes. Yeah, I... I guess you're right. Daddy, I want to go with you, Cameron said. Brian exited the car and... While helping Leslie climb into the driver's seat, he said, I'll be right back, buddy. You have to stay here and take care of your mom, okay? You can do that, right? You're our big boy, aren't you? Y- yeah. Atta boy. I'll be right back. Give me five minutes, okay? Five minutes. He closed the door gently to avoid making noise, then hustled over to the orange building. He had been there before, so he knew his way around. The front door opened to a hallway with more doors on each side. At the other end of the corridor, an exit led to the pool area behind the building. The laundry room was to his left, and the superintendent's office was to his right. Directly beyond the office, a flight of stairs led up to the other floors. The apartments appeared to have paper-thin walls. Muted voices, in English and Spanish, clashed in the hallway, joined by the ceaseless barking from a chihuahua. Brian hurried up the U-shaped stairs, but stopped in his tracks as he reached the top of the steps on the third floor. The door in front of him was cracked open. It had the indentation of a boot on it. The edge of the door was splintered and bloodied, and the door knob was barely attached to it. Slivers of wood and screws were scattered across the threshold. An episode of SpongeBob SquarePants was playing on a TV inside the apartment. Weak moans emerged from the home as well. Brian cast his eyes down at the dark splatter stains on the floorboard. Blood, he thought. He followed the trail with his gaze to the apartment at the end of the hall to his right, Tommy's apartment. He sidestepped down the hall, ready to run at the first sign of trouble. He kept glancing back at the broken door. He knew something terrible had happened in that home. People didn't kick down doors just to say hello after all. He wanted to call the police and check on the residents, but he was more concerned about his brother. The same question ran laps in his mind. What have you done, Tommy? The plaque next to the door read 308. Brian raised a clenched fist, but stopped before he could knock. His heart sank as he saw the blood smeared on the doorknob. He let out a shudder exhale as he turned the knob. It was unlocked. Curtains closed, the home was barely lit by a single lamp. Dirty laundry and trash, cereal and pizza boxes, empty two-liter bottles of soda, crushed cans of beers, crumpled plastic bags, and sheets of paper, shards of glass from broken mason jars, plastic eating utensils, and burnt silverware flooded the living room. The stench of urine, sweat, and alcohol stained the apartment. Brian had flashbacks to Tommy's past relapses. Over the bars separating the living room and kitchen, he could see his brother standing in front of a counter. Tommy had curly black hair like Brian, but his was thinning. With some fresh blood oozing out, he had recently given himself some ball patches, too. He had ripped locks of his hair off his head because he felt like something was crawling under his scalp. His cheeks were cratered with pitted acne scars, while a rash of blackheads spread across his nose and chin. Mazes of scriggly blood vessels surrounded his brown irises. His right arm was stretched out in front of him, only his index finger unhurled. It looked like he was pointing at something on the counter. Blood leaked from a gash on his palm. His knuckles were red, swollen, and scraped. There were scratches on his forearms, neck, and face, too. The neckline of his striped T-shirt, dabbled with drops of blood, was stretched as if someone had been pulling at it during a fight. Brian slunk into the room, walking with extreme caution, 
as if he believed there was a landmine hidden somewhere under the garbage. His face scrunched up in a grimace of sadness as he heard his brother's indistinct rambling and whimpering. He could feel his regret, his shame. He gasped and slapped his hand over his mouth as he reached the middle of the living room. Tears came to his eyes in an instant. He could finally see past the microwave on the counter. Tommy wasn't pointing at something. His index finger was on the start button of a large commercial blender on the counter in front of him. A small baby boy, no older than two months old, was stuffed into the blender's pitcher. The blades, sticking out of the mixer rod at the center of the pitcher, cut into the boy's flabby legs and abdomen. He was naked and unconscious. Brian lowered his hands slowly. His mouth was wide open, but he couldn't force any words out. He was only able to croak and grunt. He was so distraught by the discovery that he had forgotten to breathe. After hearing the raspy noises coming out of Brian's throat, Tommy noticed him from the corner of his eye. He looked away and, with his free hand, he wiped the tears from his cheeks. Brian, he said wonderingly. Yes? The answer was trapped in Brian's throat. Tommy asked, Is, is that you? Uh, uh, are you real? It, me, Brian squeaked out. Tommy looked his way. His mouth altered between a smile and a frown, switching every other second. The expression of horror remained on Brian's face. He stuttered, What, what is this? It's a baby. In a blender. I can... I can see that. Where did you get him? The... The blender? It's nice, huh? Roomy. I got it from that, uh... That smoothie place down the... Him! Brian interrupted. I said him! The baby! Where did you get him? Oh, him. He's... Well, um, he's my baby, Tommy said, forcing the smile to stay on his face a little longer while shrugging the shoulder. The truth, Tommy, Brian hissed, growing frustrated. The truth? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He lives down the hall. I don't know his name. Don't want to know it. His mom, she's, uh, her name's Alexandria? I heard her, but I didn't kill her. I swear I didn't. They got another kid, too, but I didn't touch him. And hey, you, you want to know something funny? Alexandria's husband? His name is Alejandro. So both of them had the same nickname, Alex and Alex. It's funny, no? This kid, his real name's probably... That's enough. Ryan glanced at the front door. He thought about the apartment with the kicked-in door down the hall. It was easy for him to connect the pieces. You didn't kill your neighbor, but you took her baby, Brian said. Okay, we got that cleared up. So, why is that baby in that blender? Because he's a, a blender baby. A what? Tommy explained. It's the latest craze. It's like a drug, but better. Powerful like fentanyl, homemade like crocodile, natural like the miracle life. It, 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 it is life. He pointed at the ceiling with his free hand, while his other index finger stayed on the blender's start button. He said, it takes you so, so, so fucking high, man. It takes you through a, a, a universe of alternate dimensions, and it's all in the baby's blood. The adrenochrome, man. It does shit to you. What the hell are you talking about? I don't know, Tommy said, chuckling. I can't explain this to someone like you. You've never been in my shoes, never seen the world through my eyes, never understood me, and you never tried. That's not true. I helped you get cleaned up. I got you a job. I stuck with you when mom and dad turned their backs on you. It doesn't matter. No, not at all. You got questions? Go find the people who started this. It was in Russia, I think. No, no. Maybe it was China. Heard it start in an underground lab. Shit. Maybe it even started in our own backyard. Some people said it was a uh, popular with the 
elite before it started to spread through social media and shit. I read all about it on the internet once, you know. Look it up. You'll see. Just don't try it for yourself or, or you'll end up like me. Brian raised his hand at him, palm out, as if trying to keep a wild animal under control. He said, you're not making any sense. You're not in the right headspace right now. I need you to step away from the blender. Come here, Tommy. Let's have a seat. Let's talk about this. I can't do that. It's too strong. I need another hit, another sip. The baby boy regained consciousness, although his eyes remained closed. His arms squeaked on the plastic pitcher as he fidgeted in the tight space. His whining seeped past the lid. Get him out of there, Brian said through his gritted teeth. I can't do that, man. I want to, but I can't. I'm always thirsty for more. This isn't a fucking joke, Thomas, Brian said, taking one step forward. Get that baby out of that goddamn blender. He was ready to fight his brother. He was willing to spill his own family's blood to protect another parent's child, but he knew his limits. He wasn't fast enough to reach Tommy and stop him from pressing the button, and one of the blades was cutting into the baby's soft abdomen now. If the blender started, his death was guaranteed. Tommy looked down at the newborn and said, Get Les and Cam out of the city. Go far, far away. Build a tree house in the woods or take a boat out into the ocean. Things are only going to get worse from here on out. We can still fix this. Take the baby out of that blender. We can give him back to his mother and make sure they're all okay. Then we can get out of here together. You, me, Leslie, Cameron. We can get you some help. This isn't what you... I'm so sorry, Tommy interrupted. Brian ran forward and shouted, No! As his brother reached the bar, Tommy pressed the blender's start button. The baby's high-pitched wail reverberated through the apartment complex for two seconds before being replaced by whirling, clunking, clacking, gurgling, squelching, and crunching noises. Chapter 2 Nine Months Later The staff lounge in the police station was illuminated by the dim emergency lights in the corners of the room. The electricity was provided by the facility's standby power system. Two dining booths lined one wall. A three-seat sofa hugged another. Against another wall, there was a row of counters with a sink, a coffee maker, and a microwave. And next to the counters, there was a refrigerator and an empty water cooler. Three round tables stood in the middle of the room. Brian, Leslie, and Cameron sat on the sofa. Leslie held their baby, Harper, in her arms. She was close to being six months old. Swallowed in a blanket, she slept while wearing soft earmuffs. Other survivors sat at the booths and tables. The Marshalls sat at a booth with Carson, their eight-year-old son, and Ellie, their four-year-old daughter. The Mendozas occupied a table. Their toddler played with Play-Doh under them. A young man named Lee Stanford paced back and forth in front of the door leading to the staff locker room, mumbling unintelligibly to himself. Addison Agena, a 15-year-old girl, sat on the floor in the corner of the room next to the water cooler, staring blankly at her feet. Addison had been separated from her family when their van was ambushed by a pack of maniacs as they attempted to evacuate the city via a freeway. A police officer had managed to rescue her from the baby fiends. She had to watch as her younger brother, father, and pregnant mother were attacked while she was dragged into a patrol car. She didn't see them die, but she saw blood splattering on the windows as the maniacs stabbed them. Some days she felt hopeful, believing her family would come pick her up. Other days, she was convinced they were dead, and she contemplated suicide as a way of reuniting with them. There were other families in the police station, too. They took shelter in the jail cells and the offices. When the anarchy started, the high-risk offenders incarcerated in the jail were transferred to prisons in the area. The low-risk offenders and juvenile delinquents were freed, forced to fend for themselves. Audrey Steiner, a 27-year-old redhead, slept in a woman's cell with her newborn, her baby Bella was a month and a half younger than Harper. Audrey hadn't left the cell since Bella's birth. She was of the opinion that she was safer locked up with her baby than roaming free, especially if the baby fiend succeeded in raiding the precinct. Daryl Andrews stepped to the middle of the room. His hair was short and wiry, and he wore a thick gray and goatee. He was dressed in a police uniform. On a strap, a shotgun was slung across his back. 
he swept his gaze around the room. I need volunteers, he announced. Fuck that, Lee answered, still pacing with his head down. A good Samaritan is a dead Samaritan. I volunteered to help someone once. Yeah, back when this shit started. You know what I got when I went to check on my neighbor? A knife to the stomach. That shit hurt like a motherfucker, man. I made it, but my girl didn't. She got it. Enough. In her neck. Then the bastard started cutting her open like, like, like he was dissecting a frog in biology class, man. I didn't know what the hell he was doing back then, but I know now. He was looking for a baby. But she wasn't even pregnant. Nah, man. She wasn't. No way. She was on the pill, you know. He just... He pulled out her guts, her intestines, you know. Why did he have to kill her like that? Why, man? I said that's enough from you, Dale said sternly. Settle down, son. Lee kept rambling, but he lowered his voice until only he could make out his words. The group was saddened by his story, but it didn't shock them. They didn't even bother to cover the children's ears. He had been telling the same story since he arrived at the precinct, and he kept recounting it because it kept replaying in his head. He was tormented by survivor's guilt. Dale said, I need stable and reliable volunteers. For what? Brian asked in a hushed voice so as not to awaken Harper. We're running low on supplies. We have plenty of firearms and ammunition, but we're running out of the essentials, medicine, gas, food, and yes, that includes formula for the babies. Leslie said, You told us the National Guard was coming. What happened to the evacuation plan? Daryl explained, as most of you know already, we lost access to internet, radio, and phone services a little over a week ago. Days before that, we lost all contact with the government. It's dead air. A rescue team may still be on the way, but it could be weeks or even months before they can get to us. It's not something I want to say, but we don't have that kind of time. A defeated silence befell the lounge. Caesar, the patriarch of the Mendoza family, ruffled his son's curly hair and asked, What are you planning now? Officer Carpenter and I will lead a group to the city. We'll pile into a patrol car and drive out to the local supermarkets and pharmacies. We'll fill the truck with as much supplies as possible. Hell, we'll fill the whole car if we can. Then we'll come back here and wait until rescue comes. If we run out of supplies before that happens, rinse and repeat. That plan is bullshit, Donald Stevens said, wagging his head in annoyance. He was seated at one of the tables. In his fifties, he was one of the older survivors in the precinct. Although he had a receding hairline, his grizzled hair was long and swept back, covering the nape of his neck. A long, wild beard covered his rugged face. An inextinguishable blaze of rage burned in his eyes. He continued, They'll spot you before you lead the block, and if you make it into a supermarket, they'll slaughter you before you can make it out. And I hate to be a downer. No, you don't, Daryl chimed in. But there are no goddamn rescue teams on the way. No way the government is coming to waste their resources rescuing normal folks like us. They're out there saving themselves. They're hunkered down in some underground bunkers or some ships out at sea. They might even be in space for all we know. Maybe that's why they ain't returning your calls, huh? It's dead air, Donald. You really believe that? You really think they'd risk their safety by sending a team of commandos, their personal security to save us? They don't need our taxes anymore, do they? But you know what? If they do send someone to snatch us, it'll be so they can harvest our blood and organs for themselves. Might even keep us for food. These politicians ain't no better than those rabbit cannibalistic baby-eating psychos out there, and you know it. We were in regular contact with the National Guard before communications were cut off. We also know the mayor was still in his residence at that time. You don't know jack shit, Donald said, swinging his hands up as if he was swatting a fly away. You only know what they're telling you, and it could all be bullshit. The man could be calling you from a casino in Vegas, and you wouldn't even know it. They've just been dragging you along to keep up appearances, and now you've got to make decisions like this, decisions that will put us all at risk. He, he's right, Lee stuttered. Me and my girlfriend, we decided to help our neighbor one time. We heard people screaming in their apartment. We thought someone was hurt, like, like seriously hurt. We called the police, but the neighbor's door was open. It, it was practically wide open, so we went to see if they needed help. Lee continued recounting his story for the umpteen time. Caesar was now holding his son on his lap, fearing Donald was going to flip his table. The group understood his anger, though. Donald was the last of the survivors to arrive at the precinct. 
However, unlike the others, he wasn't seeking refuge. He sought direction. He was separated from his family while searching for an open entrance to the city's subway system. But after entering the police station, he wasn't allowed to leave since Darrow and the other officers believed his departure would risk everyone else's safety. The right choice has been right under our noses this whole time, Donald said, ending his sentence by thrusting his index finger at the table. We have to get to the subway. All the entrances have been barricaded, Darrow replied. From below, yes. From within the station, yes. The baby fiends didn't do it. They're not vampires, right? They got no reason to be hiding underground. They want to be out here hunting women and babies. That means there are survivors down there. And we're surviving here. But they have a fighting chance. They have the space to navigate and build defenses down there. You barricade the doors and windows up here, but you know it's not enough. I'm telling you, those baby fiends are rabbit. They've gone dumb over some homemade drug. They're like cavemen, no? And sooner or later, those cavemen are going to discover fire. Then what's going to stop them from torching this place? What's stopping them from lighting a ring of fire around the building to smoke us out or to funnel us to one exit so they can capture or exterminate us? Guns, Donald. We have firepower and training that they don't. We'll shoot them before they can light a ring of fire around us. And what if they drive a bus or a semi-truck or a damn bulldozer through the building? What then? Daryl said, we have plans for every contingency. You're here. You're all here because your safety is our only priority. And that's exactly why we need to resupply. We're not going out there for fun. We know it's risky and we know we're asking for a lot, but we're doing this for you and your families. Now I need volunteers. During the argument, Addison had wrenched her gaze from the floor to stare at Donald. The teenager agreed with him. She believed they were all going to die if they stayed in the police station. In her hopeless state, a smile blossomed on her face. She was ready to welcome death with open arms. I'll go, Caesar said. Eva, his wife, clasped his arm and said, You can't. You never even shot a gun before. I can learn. Besides, he's going to need food, Caesar responded. He tickled his son's ribs. And in a gentle voice, he said, You're hungry, aren't you, little man? And what if you don't come back? Don't talk like that. We need you here. I'll come back. But what if you don't? Eva cried. Their toddler stopped giggling. He wasn't old enough to understand their argument, but he felt his mother's fear. Leslie leaned closer to her husband and grabbed his hand. Brian got the message loud and clear. Don't go. The other survivors had quiet conversations with themselves and with their loved ones. From the booth, Philip Marshall said, Caesar, you stay. I'll go. I've got experience in hunting. Not people, but... Same rules apply, I suppose. I can make it back. His kids whimpered. He slung his arm over his son's shoulder to comfort him. Sitting on the other side of the booth, his wife Kristen coddled their young daughter. There was a mixture of anger and pride in Kristen's tearful eyes. She knew what her husband was doing was noble, but she didn't want him to lead their family to embark on a suicide mission. Although he wasn't going to say it out loud, Philip figured that if he didn't return, at least Christian would still have their two kids to keep her company. If Caesar died out in the city or vanished, Eva would have been left alone with a toddler who was only just getting comfortable walking on his own. That's one, Darrell announced. He walked up to the sofa, raised his brow at Brian and asked, How about you? Smiling nervously, Brian said, I'm no hunter. If I remember correctly, you said you were a security guard, an armed security guard. Yeah, I've had some firearms training, but that gun you've got. Listen, I've only used a shotgun once, and I've never fired a rifle. We have plenty of pistols with enough firepower to put anyone down. He doesn't want to go, and you can't make him, Leslie said. You're right about that, ma'am, Darrell responded. But if we don't get those supplies, sooner or later, someone's going to make him fight. It would be a whole lot better and safer if he fought with us instead of alone. Brian said, I'm sorry, sir, but I am unfit for this task. You guys are comparing this to hunting and it's fine if you see it that way, but I don't. You call them baby fiends. I call them people. My, my brother was, is, was one of them. He was a self-destructive guy, but he never hurt a person before the, the craze started to spread. I can't go out there knowing I have to kill people like him. I won't go, 
That's my final answer. Daryl sighed and nodded. He glanced over at Edgar Carpenter, his partner, waiting in the archway behind him. He said, Get Mr. Philip Marshall prepped to head out. I'll try to round up some more volunteers from the cells. After the meeting, Edgar escorted Philip to the police station's shooting range for some target practice. Feeling like she was to blame for Philip's departure, Eva brought some of her family's rationed chocolate to the Marshalls as an apology. The kids accepted the gift. Kristen's anger had subsided, replaced by sadness and regret. I should have done more to stop him, she had been telling herself. You did good standing up to him, Donald said to Brian. He's not on a power trip yet, but once he knows he can control you, all of you, he's not going to take no for an answer. Brian didn't know how to respond. He didn't feel brave. Dale didn't threaten anyone in the room. He had sounded more desperate than intimidating. Leslie said, Mr. Stevens, Donald responded. But you can call me Don or Donnie or Donald. Makes no difference to me. Donald, you sound like a pessimist. I'd appreciate if you kept your negativity away from my family. Mom, what's a pessimist? Cameron asked. Donald said, a pessimist, son, is a person who stays alive during crises like this one. Ignoring him, Leslie looked down at Cameron and said, a pessimist is someone who sees the worst in everything. They're sad, angry people. They're honest people, boy. And that's all I've been since I got here. Honest. Our best bet for survival is the subway system. It's like an underground city. The politicians may have abandoned ship, but I know for certain regular people are taking care of each other down there. They have doctors and nurses. It ain't a five-star fare, but they've got food, too. They're raising pigs and taking fishing trips. It sounds too good to be true, Brian said. How do you know all of this? I used to work at a... an agency that planned for these types of crises. You're saying your agency predicted there was going to be a... a... a baby blending craze? In a way, yes. The survivors became quiet as they digested his claim. How? Addison asked, finally breaking her silence. Donald said, Trends, this global craze started, what, nine months ago? Well, videos of this crap, this blender baby nonsense, actually started circulating a few months before that. There was one in China. A poor woman had a baby in the middle of the street. She dropped her pants and the baby followed. Already a sick story, ain't it? Well, it gets sicker. Christian led her kids out of the lounge, disgusted by Donald's words. Leslie nudged her husband's arm and whispered, Cover Cam's ears or take him to another room. He shouldn't be listening to any of this. Brian was interested in finding the origin of the craze, so he refused to leave the room. He brought Cameron over to his side of the sofa and sat him on his lap. This is just for a few minutes, all right, bud, he said, before pressing his palms against Cameron's ears. Donald continued. The baby was still alive when it hit that pavement. The pedestrians around her didn't offer much more than a sheet of cardboard for her to sit on, and while she sat there, bleeding from her, Please, Donald, we don't need all of the details, Leslie said, a hint of annoyance in her voice. Bleeding from her, somewhere, a man ran up and snatched the baby. The video ended with the bystanders watching this guy disappear down an alley. Well, reading through some eyewitness reports, it turns out the police found him holed up in an apartment. He seemed to be going through a state of delirium, laughing while attacking the cops. They said he had blended the baby and drank its remains. I think I heard about that, Caesar said. When we were staying at a church earlier this year, my co-worker Corey, rest in peace, told us it all started in China. He talked about that video too. He was saying some weird stuff though. He said that this thing was like a biological weapon, that China was trying to wipe out America by making us, you know eat our babies. I don't believe him, though. I mean, I didn't believe him. Why would this be happening in China if it was meant for us? What, did they accidentally attack themselves, too? Donald raised his hands and said, well, I never said it started over there. I said there was an early case. There was another early case here in the States, too. A guy in Florida dissected his ex-girlfriend. Poor girl was seven months pregnant. The police said he cut the fetus into small pieces before blending it in. 
I can't listen to this anymore, Leslie said. Carrying Harper in one arm, she grabbed Cameron's hand and escorted him out of the room. Donald stared at Brian, giving him a moment to decide if he wanted to stay or leave. Brian didn't move a muscle. Then he drank its remains, Donald said, finishing his sentence. They blended on bath salts and do psychosis. Florida, huh? This shit always happens in Florida. Not for me, Lee murmured. We were at my apartment complex. We thought we could help our neighbor. The survivors paid him no mind. Brian remembered reading about the case in Florida months before the craze spread through the country. He had been saddened and disgusted by the news for a few minutes before another national tragedy broke his heart. Then another tragedy made headline news. And then another one. Coverage of bloody tragedies was normal in mainstream media. Bad news dominated the headlines to the point where it all started to blur together. Donald said, At my agency, we start linking all of these cases of isolated psychosis involving femicide and infitricide together. We didn't predict it would be a crisis of this magnitude, but we knew something was coming. Maybe it was a biological weapon created by a foreign government, China or Russia or Iran or Israel. Or maybe it was our own government touring with population control. Or maybe it was just a bunch of drug enthusiasts who decided to put a baby in a blender and discovered a new way of getting high because they heard stories of the political elite and the chemical compound they called adrenochrome. Maybe social media helped people spread their sickness. You remember seeing that hashtag baby food challenge, right? People putting their babies in blenders and ovens and microwaves for shits and giggles. Maybe that kicked all of this off. I don't know. What I do know is all of you need to leave this city as soon as possible. Get into the subway system or get away from society. This isn't even close to over. Brian cast his mind back to his last encounter with Tommy. His brother had given him similar advice. Get Les and Cam out of the city. Go far, far away. His gut feeling told him that Tommy and Donald were correct. He shambled out of the lounge and joined his family in a woman's jail cell. He found Leslie feeding Harper some formula with a baby bottle. The baby giggled as she laid her eyes on her father, milk cascading down her chin. Using the fading light from an LED lantern, Cameron drew a creeper from Minecraft on a police report using some green and black crayons. Brian didn't tell them about Donald's theories or Tommy's advice. He played it cool, so he wouldn't alarm his family. In the back of his mind, however, he started devising an escape plan. Chapter 3. Hope Brian stood next to a pillar in the police station's garage, eyes on the patrol cars parked in the aisles in front of him. Armed with handguns, Philip and two other volunteers sat in the back seat of the vehicle. They were pale and stiff, cold sweat dewed across their foreheads. There were two semi-automatic rifles on the rack between the front seats. Darrow and Edgar, along with a few other police officers, dismount the homemade barricade comprised of furniture from within the precinct, blocking one of the garage doors. Other survivors were huddled together with their families, standing around the patrol cars and SUVs in the parking spaces. Most of the other police vehicles were parked in the outdoor parking lot, which was surrounded by a tall chain-link fence. A few of the survivors were crying, afraid they were saying their final goodbyes to their loved ones. Some of the starving sick survivors were hopeful, but they didn't let it show on their faces. Hey. Donald said as he approached Brian. Brian furled his brow at him. The older man was carrying a shoulder bag. In all capital letters, a word on the side of the bag read, Police. You're going with them? Brian asked. No, I'm leaving, but I'm not following them. You already know I never intended on staying this long. I was only looking for some assistance, but Darrow and his ilk kept me locked in here for security purposes. I didn't revolt or break out because I understood where they were coming from because I respected you and your families. If I were in a safe place with my family, I wouldn't open the door to let anyone in or out either, but they're opening the door this time for survival purposes. They can't keep me here against my will, so I'm gone. And they let you take our supplies? Donald put a little smile on his face and said, And they let you take our supplies? Donald put a little smile on his face and said, Don't get this misconstrued. Daryl was kind enough to give me some weapons, ammunition, and maps. Considering you got an army of guns in here, you won't miss any of it. He also gave me a letter to deliver. He wants to reach out to other, uh, well, 
I guess we can call them colonies of survivors. He wants to build a network of some sort. In this next colony you're visiting, you're sure it's in the subway system? I am. Brian crossed his arms and nodded. Donald could see he was in deep thought. Quiet, hesitant, torn. You're interested, aren't you? He asked. Brian couldn't say yes because he didn't want to make plans without his family, but he couldn't say no either. His silence was enough to answer Donald's question. The older guy said, Yeah, you should be. Listen, the main entrances to the subways has been sealed off. There is another way in, though. Go to Boucher College. You know, the school they opened up over that old insane asylum. Go to Alcott Hall. Make your way down to the maintenance level. There's a door on the first floor that'll take you down there. You'll know it when you see it. You'll find a path into the tunnels located under the school. Go west and you'll eventually find an abandoned subway station or an old culvert going to the outskirts of the city. I think you'd be safe out there, but you're better off in the subway system. You'll have a lot of people to support you, and those baby fiends won't be able to hear your little girl's cries down there. Yeah, well, um, I appreciate the info. You should come with us. With me, I mean. Your wife, little girl, your boy, they deserve better than this. You might still have time to get them out of here and... Listen up, everyone, Daryl announced as he mosaic over to the front of the patrol car. We're going now. Before we head out, we need to make sure we're on the same page. Speaking out of one side of his mouth, Donald whispered, You can forget about joining me, I guess. Daryl continued, Officer Diego Reyes will be in charge while I'm gone. We plan on being back within 24 hours. We expect a few of you to be waiting for us here in the garage in case we come in hot. Since Carpenter and I will be gone, some of you will be given new duties to fend any other entrances to this facility. No one comes in or out except us. I don't care if you hear a baby crying out there. Don't fall for that bait. Good luck. He got into the driver's seat of the patrol car and Edgar climbed into the front passenger seat. The garage door rumbled and rattled as it rolled up. Hope to see you around, Donald said as he walked away from Brian. Brian followed the patrol car as it crawled out of the garage. He stopped at the threshold, but continued tracking the vehicle with his eyes. The vehicle crept through the parking lot like a stalker following his prey. Quieter than the wind, the engine purred. Crouching, Donald stayed behind the vehicle. The vehicle stalled in front of a gate, its red brake lights piercing the night. There was some shuffling in the car. Fifteen seconds later, the gate trundled open. The patrol car went left while Donald ran into the overgrown park across the street. The gate closed behind them. Brian took a good look at the city. Beyond the block, burning buildings coughed up a blanket of black smoke. It swallowed the sky. Vehicles, some with flat tires, others with broken windows, a few in perfect condition were abandoned in the streets. Some cars were ditched on the sidewalks and lawns. There were pileups in every intersection. Most of them were caused by the baby fiends to create blockades. There were no people in sight. He couldn't see or hear Donald anymore. With the street lights off, the blood stains on the sidewalks in front of the building looked black in the moonlight. Strips of bloody, tattered clothing were strewn across the ground, too. The bloated, greenish corpses of a man lay in the street outside of the parking lot. About a week earlier, one of the cops shot him in the neck as he attempted to climb the fence. He had been armed with a machete. There was an overturned stroller in front of the station. He couldn't remember whether it belonged to one of the survivors in the precinct or if someone had been abducted at their doorstep. The craze had overwhelmed the city. When it started, the government issued a strict shelter-at-home order, so the baby fiends banded together and started invading homes, searching for babies to blend and women to abduct. Block by block, they took over residential neighborhoods. By the time the government imposed martial law, the baby fiends had multiplied their numbers by abducting people and forcing them to consume the homemade drug known as blender babies. They organized in gangs of addicts, working together, they razzed fire departments and government buildings to the ground. Then they started raiding hospitals and clinics. Since they couldn't get close to most police stations without being gunned down, they blocked all the streets around the precincts to stop the cops from interfering with their plans. They attacked all the cops that attempted to leave as well. The craze even spread to the military, limiting its capabilities. Although Centers for Disease Control and Prevention stated the craze only affected those who consumed a blender baby, Many people believed it was an airborne disease 
since it had spread so fast to people from all walks of life. There were reports of priests kidnapping babies during baptisms. Even some mothers were arrested for consuming their own babies at the beginning of the craze. Looks like they made it out, Diego Reyes said from behind Brian. Lock it up. The cop was about the same age as Brian. He had wavy black hair and a thick beard, which he trimmed once a week with a pair of scissors from an office. He was holding a semi-automatic rifle. Brian went to the panel on the wall next to the garage door. As he put his thumb against a button, he heard a faint scream outside. He leaned to his left and looked out the door, peering over the cars in the parking lot. He heard it again. It sounded like a woman weeping in the park. What are you waiting for? Diego asked. I... I heard something. I think someone needs our help. We're not equipped to go out on a rescue mission right now. Let's just hold down the fort until Daryl gets back. What if she has a... Lock it up, Brian. Now! Brian hesitated. What if it was Lucille out there with Cameron and Harper? He asked himself. He understood Diego's decision, though. They were already outnumbered by the baby fiends, and six capable men had just left their group. Although he didn't quite believe it, he told himself it was all a ruse by the baby fiends to lure them out of the police station. The timing is too coincidental, he thought. Shoulders slumped in disappointment. He held the button down for three seconds. The garage door began to descend. The screaming in the park was blocked out as the door shut. He helped the others rebuild the barricade. They talked amongst themselves, but he didn't hear a word. On loop, the woman screaming replayed in his mind. There was nothing he could do but think about the world beyond the precinct's walls and Donald's directions to the safe haven below the city. Brian sat on a desk in the police station's office area, staring out a window overlooking the park across the street. It had been hours since he heard the woman's crying. Now he didn't detect any signs of life out there. He held a shotgun. He had asked Diego for a pistol, but his request went ignored. You can handle the firepower, the acting leader had said. The others can't. He turned his attention to Lee, who sat on a desk in the corner of the room across from him. Under Diego's order, Lee was supposed to be monitoring the front entrance. He was scared and antsy, though, fidgeting and mumbling to himself. Unlike Brian's trigger discipline, Lee's index finger was twitching on the trigger of his handgun. He was pointing it at the desk, though. The only exit in the office area led to a hallway. The other doors opened up to the private offices. Cork boards, picture frames, and clocks hung from the walls. A flagpole and an American flag stood in one corner of the room, and an empty water cooler stood in another. A pink box from a local bakery sat on one of the desks in the middle of the office. It was empty now, but it looked like the cops had celebrated someone's birthday before the madness erupted. Leslie and Cameron sat on the floor in another corner of the room. They were joined by Christian and her kids. Between them, Harper lay on her stomach on a blanket. They were playing with her, shaking a rattle to try to get her to crawl to them. Would you stop that noise? Lori Sadler snarled. She was pacing next to the door, leading to the police chief's private office. Like Lee, she was keyed up. She was a small woman with a big mouth. Her blonde hair was streaked with gray, and wrinkles spread from the corners of her mouth and eyes like branches from a tree. Leslie said, Calm down. You're going to upset the children. You people don't get it, Lori said. They should be upset. We should all be upset. We lost six men tonight. Six. We're practically defenseless. Who, who's going to protect us now? I don't know how to use a gun. I, I've never used a gun before. They're coming back. They're coming back, she says. Well, I've got news for you. They're not. We sent them to their deaths. Hey, watch your mouth. Harper started crying after hearing his mother scream. Leslie lifted her from the floor and rocked her in her arms. Kristen brought her children closer to her while scowling at Lori. You're angry because you know I'm speaking the truth, Lori said. We sent them out with targets on their backs and, and, and signed death warrants in their pockets. And if they don't die, they're going to come back here like them, with them. We've heard enough from you, Leslie replied over Harper sobbing. We don't need your negativity right now. Go back to your cell. She's a pissed miss, Mom, Cameron interjected, mispronouncing pessimist again. Don't listen to her, sweetie. No, I won't go back to my cell. I won't go and corner myself like those other fools, Lori said as she walked to the middle of the room. Do you know what's going on out there? Do any of you know what's really happening? 
because you look like you're having a damn sleepover. Did you forget that we're surrounded by psychotic junkies? They're people, too, Brian said, sounding melancholic. People don't blend babies and drink their remains. People don't slaughter and cannibalize each other for no reason. People don't kidnap women and girls, little girls, and force them into baby factories. Yeah, that's what they call them, baby factories. And that's what they're doing out there. You know that already, don't you? I saw it all with my own eyes before I came here. I, I swear I did. I swear. Speaking to himself, Lee said, I swear we were only trying to help. I swear I saw him dissect my girlfriend after he stabbed me in the stomach. A couple exited the room, revulsion written on their faces. Cameron ran over to his father and hugged his leg, spooked by Lori's erratic behavior. Harper continued whining, but she quieted a little. No one knew how to defuse the situation. They figured they'd let her talk until she was out of breath. Brian was interested in what she had to say, though. Lori continued, I lived in a big apartment complex with my daughter. She's, she was 19. Her name was Erin, the kindest, funniest, most beautiful girl you could ever meet. The thought of her daughter brought a temporary smile to her face. It only lasted five seconds. Tears running down her cheeks, she said, She was going to school, to community college, when the shelter-at-home order came, but she, she never came home. I spent weeks looking for her, but I never found her, and by then, it was too dangerous to go out. The government wouldn't let us go anywhere. We ran out of food a few months ago, so all the neighbors on our floor got together and we decided to go out and find a safe zone. But on the first floor of our building, we found a... She stopped to release her pent-up breath. Another woman brought her a box of tissues so she could wipe her face. Lori said, We had a laundry room in our building, a big one. And in that room, we found a... Hive... Those monsters had been holding kidnapped women against their will in there. They impregnated them by force. They raped them. I don't know why they didn't go up to the upper floor to kill or kidnap the rest of us. Maybe they were saving us for later. Maybe they just forgot. But I wish they did come up and get me because then, then I would have seen Aaron earlier. My girl, my precious girl was in the laundry room. She was blindfolded and gagged and chained and pregnant, but no, I mean, no, she wasn't pregnant. They had already cut her open to, to take the baby out. Like my girlfriend, Lee commented, staring out the window. But she wasn't pregnant. No, she wasn't. And Aaron wasn't pregnant before this started. She would have told me. She tells... She used to tell me everything. They used her body to make a baby, but they couldn't wait those 40 weeks. Maybe they didn't want to. Someone told me that those monsters think they taste better and they get higher if the baby is premature. Maybe I should be relieved that Aaron died. Some women are going to be stuck in that vicious, disgusting cycle in those baby factories for years if those monsters aren't stopped. It just, it breaks my heart knowing my baby was suffering right under my nose. She must have been close to home when they abducted her, maybe even in the lobby. Brian believed her. Before seeking refuge in the police station, he had heard reports of the so-called baby factories on the radio. Governments around the world were also rumored to be cloning and mass-producing human babies like chickens in a factory, hoping to substitute the artificial infants for the real ones. They theorized the artificial babies would satisfy the addict's thirst and halt the craze until a rehabilitation program could be developed. However, updates stopped after several prominent politicians were discovered to be addicted to blender babies. The instability of society before and after the outbreak didn't help either. Outside, in all major cities, there was a war going on between anarchists, vigilantes, and baby fiends with everyday survivors caught in the middle. Leslie hadn't spoken much to Lori during her family's stay at the precinct. Although she didn't appreciate her negativity, she felt sorry for her after hearing her story. She knew everyone had lost something, their homes, their pets, their friends, and families, but she couldn't imagine what it was like for a mother to find her child dead, mutilated, and dehumanized. 
Leslie got to her feet. She approached Lori and put a comforting arm around her. Lori's face twisted with conflicted emotion, joy and hope, fright and sadness, as she stared down at Harper. Kristen and her children joined them in a group embrace. Dad, is that lady going to be okay? Cameron asked. Brian said, yeah, she'll be fine. Was she telling the truth? Are there monsters outside, like the boogeyman? Not like the boogeyman, champ. There are people, uh, who made bad decisions out there. They want to hurt us because they're not thinking straight. They can't think straight anymore, so we have to be careful. Is Uncle Tommy with them? Uncle Tommy is... Don't worry about all that stuff right now, okay? Remember, your old man has a very important job tonight. I have to make sure we're all safe and sound, so you just stay close to your mom and behave yourself. Got it? Cameron nodded before running off to his mother. Brian looked at Lee. The guy was still rambling about his girlfriend's murder. Then he went back to surveilling the park. Chapter 4. Hopeless. A bang echoed through the neighborhood. Brian leaned closer to the window. Black bags hung under his red, tired eyes. He hadn't slept much since the scavenging party left the precinct two nights earlier. Head on a swivel, he examined the park across the street. The tall, wide blades of grass swayed in the wind. Due to the lack of light, it was difficult to see beyond the first set of trees closest to the sidewalk. For a moment, Brian wondered if he had dozed off and dreamt the noise, or if he was hallucinating, but he knew he wasn't severely sleep-deprived. I can't be losing my mind already, he murmured. There was another bang. Weaving and bobbing his head, Brian peered between the trees. Believing someone was shooting at the police station, he searched for a muzzle flash. The park was dark, quiet, and tranquil. Then he stared up at the night sky and looked for the colorful sparks from a firework. He couldn't even see any stars up there. Forehead against the window, he peeked over at the parallel street to the left and right. He considered the possibility that Darrow and the others were returning to the precinct with a gang of addicts hot on their heels. On the other hand, he was worried someone was hitting a dumpster or detonating fireworks in an alleyway to try to lure the survivors out of the building. The door on the other side of the office flew open. Diego stormed in and asked, Did you hear that too? Brian looked back at him and said, Gunfire? You asking me or telling me? I don't know, I'm not an expert. Diego leaned over the neighboring desk, looked out another window and asked, Did you see anything out of the ordinary? No, nothing. All right. Let's sit on this for now. I'll let the other lookouts know we're on heightened alert, but I want to keep the others in the dark. We won't be able to keep track of what's going on out there if everyone's panicking in here, right? Come get me if... A third bang interrupted him. It was louder and closer than the first two. They didn't see any activity in the park, though. Diego said, You two keep your eyes peeled. I'm going to... His voice fell away as he turned away from the desk and gazed at the corner of the room. Stony-faced, he looked at Brian and asked, Where's Lee? He's on his bathroom break. He said he wasn't feeling well. He mentioned, uh, diarrhea. How long has he been gone? I'm not really sure. Kind of hard to keep track of time these days. Give me an estimate, Brian. An educated guess. Something. Anything. Shit, well, maybe 10 or 15 minutes? I was just in the restroom a few minutes ago, and I didn't see him anywhere around there. Diego said as he walked to the exit, Follow me. Something's not right. He marched out of the office area. Brian reluctantly followed him, constantly glancing back at the windows before leaving the room. They went down a hallway. At the end of the hall, the door to their left was open. To the right, another corridor led to the garage, storage room, and shooting range. They went through the open door and found themselves in a lobby. At the other end of the room, there was a large curved reception desk with a reinforced door on each side. One door led to the men's cells and the other to the women's cells. The police station had cells to hold juvenile offenders in temporary custody, but they were located in another part of the facility. Lockers of varying sizes covered one wall in the lobby. On another, there was a bank of payphones next to three drinking fountains. There were four rows of seats in the middle of the room. Unlike the building's main lobby, only the precinct staff approved visitors and prisoners used this room before the craze. Survivors had started gathering in the room, wide awake and overwrought because of the noise outside. Speaking over each other, they argued about their emergency plans. We gotta break into their army and get their guns, a man said. 
I don't give a fuck if I don't have my contacts or glasses. Fuck their rules. I need a gun. We all need guns. Why don't we lock ourselves in the cells? An elderly woman suggested. We can do that, can't we? Can't we? Leslie was walking in circles next to the payphones, rocking Harper in her arms to try to stop her from crying. Half asleep, Cameron stood next to the drinking fountains and watched the bickering. Upon noticing him, Lori ran up to Diego and asked, What was that noise? Was it a gun? Are they shooting at us? From the reception desk, her son to her left and her daughter to her right, Christian said, Is it Philip? Are they back? Remain calm, please, Diego said, hands raised with his palms facing forward. We have no evidence of a breach or an attempt to breach the precinct. The situation is under control. Now I'm looking for Lee. Has anyone seen him? Who? Lori asked, glaring at the officer as if he had offended her with his question. Lee, the young man with long hair, talks to himself a lot. Has anyone seen him? What did he do? Was he one of them? I knew we shouldn't have trusted him. Bella! Bella! A desperate female voice screamed in the women's cells. Diego jostled past the crowd to go check on her. Brian stayed close to his family. Before Diego could reach the door to the women's cell, Audrey lurched over and crashed into the cop. He grabbed her arm to stop her from plummeting to the floor. Bella, she said. My baby, my baby's gone. Someone took her. My Bella's gone. She dissolved into tears, voice slurring into a word salad. Her knees were on the verge of buckling, so the cop pushed her up against the reception desk to keep her on her feet. The survivors in the room fell silent. Who? Who took your daughter? Diego asked. When Audrey didn't respond, he shook her shoulder gently and said, Hey, you need to focus on your baby. The sooner you talk, the sooner we can get to the bottom of this. What did you see? I... I don't know. I I dozed off for a minute. I swear it was only a minute. I remember someone was walking outside of my room. It it was a, like, God, I don't know how to say it. Not like a big guy or anything like that. Like a teenager or something. You're saying it was someone small, short, skinny? Yes, yes, Audrey cried. Someone like Lee? Someone here. It has to be someone here. Bella has to be here. She pushed past the cop. Palms on the table, she hopped and looked over the reception desk. There was no one on the other side. She tottered over to the marshals. Christian pulled her children closer to her legs and stepped back. Then Audrey hurried over to Eva and her toddler, who were sitting in the middle of the room. It took her a few seconds to realize Eva's child was a boy who was a few months older than Bella. You, she said as she wobbled her way over to Leslie. Th that's my baby. Bella, Bella, mommy's here. Stay back, Leslie said. You took her from me. That's my baby. Stay away from us. Just as Brian took a step towards them, Cameron jumped in front of his mother with his arms spread wide and shouted, Stay away from my mom. The boy was scared, trembling from head to toe, but he was willing to do anything to protect his mother and sister. He didn't know much about life and death, but his parents had taught him about safety and danger, about right and wrong. The instinct to protect his family came naturally to him. Audrey's mouth, gaping open, moved as if she was giving a speech, but no sound came out. She crossed her arms and shivered, shoulders hitching up to her ears. Then she hunched over and dry heaved. She was battling her motherly impulse to do anything to rescue her daughter. She wanted to attack Cameron and yank the baby out of Leslie's arms. Brian stepped between them, his shotgun aimed at the floor. In a calm, understanding tone, he said, It's not Bella. Don't do this. We only want to help you find your daughter. The elderly woman stroked Audrey's back and said, Well, fine, Bella, sweetie. I, I, I'm sorry. Audrey stammered in a hoarse voice. A loud snapping sound rang to the building. Diego, Diego, a man yelled in another room. Eva lifted her son from the floor and said, That's Caesar, Officer Reyes. As he ran out of the room, Diego shouted, If you're unarmed, wait here. If you've got a gun, follow me. I'll be back, Brian said. He kissed Leslie on the cheek, then jogged off. He followed the cop down a network of hallways. The noise grew louder with each step, snapping, cracking, banging. They ended up in the main lobby, which also served as a waiting room. Caesar was standing behind the information desk, pointing a pistol at the main entrance at the other end of the room. Lee had dismounted the barricade, pushing the furniture aside and breaking through two sheets of plywood. He was now tackling the heavy double doors, which could only be unlocked with a key. 
With a weak grip, he held a handgun down at his side. Diego aimed his rifle at him and barked, Drop the weapon! Drop it! That cut her open, Lee cried. She wasn't even pregnant, man. She couldn't be. She was on the pill. I saw her take it. Where's the baby? She wasn't pregnant. Stop saying she was. She wasn't. Lee threw himself at the doors again. A reinforced glass pane on one of the doors cracked. The hinges emitted a high-pitched squeaking sound. Audrey's baby, Diego yelled. Where's Bella? Where'd you put her? There was no baby, man. She wasn't pregnant. God damn it, drop the weapon and show me your hands. Show me your fucking hands. Heart racing, Brian glanced over his shoulder at the doorway behind him. He heard some banging, then some rattling and rumbling. Excluding all the windows, there were only three ways into the precinct. The main entrance the staff entrance at the side of the building and the garage in the back. Diego, I think someone's trying to break in, he said in a timid voice. The cop didn't hear him. He was concentrating on Lee. Although Lee hadn't directly threatened anyone, the officer refused to let his guard down while he was armed. His training told him that he was in a life-or-death situation. One false move, one second of distraction could lead to tragedy. Put it down, Diego demanded. I'll shoot you. I'll fucking shoot you. Drop it. As Lee continued tackling the door, Audrey staggered into the main lobby. The elderly woman walked closely behind her, helping her stay on her feet. Is that my baby? Audrey asked. Does he have my baby? My Bella, does he have her? Diego shot him twice. The first bullet shattered a rib. It entered his body with so much force that the tissue around the entry room rippled like water and his ribs clacked against each other like dominoes. The bullet ruptured his lung before exiting through his back and destroying a glass pane on one of the doors. The second bullet disintegrated his sternum, then liquefied his heart. Gelatinous bits and stringy shreds of the organ sprayed out of his back in a thick mist as the round severed his spinal cord. The bullet broke another one of the glass panes. Lee's body slammed into the doors, causing them to fly open. He landed at the top of the stoop steps. No! Audrey yelled. No! My baby! She hurried to the doorway. She landed hard on her knees next to Lee's body, but she didn't seem to feel any pain. Through the massive exit wounds on his back, she could see his dissolved, gooey organs jiggling like jelly in his blood. She didn't think much of it. She rode him onto his back and stared at his torso. Bella wasn't there. Where is she? Audrey whispered. She looked to her left, down the wheelchair ramp, connected to the stoop, upon hearing a gate rolling and rattling. Diego stepped around her. Holding the rifle in one hand, he pointed his gun at the sidewalk to the left while kneeling down to check Lee's pulse. The young man was clearly dead, but he had to be sure. As he approached the entrance, Brian asked, Is that the parking lot's gate? I think so, Diego answered. Is someone coming in or out? We have to lock this place down. A baby's cry reverberated through the street. From the stoop, the group watched as Addison, the 15-year-old survivor ran out of the parking lot. She was carrying an infant in her arms. Although she couldn't see her from afar, Audrey recognized the baby's cries and the pink blanket wrapped around her body. It was her daughter. Bella! She screamed as she scrambled to her feet. Diego made a grab for her shoulder but missed her by an inch. Brian managed to grab her arm but she slipped out of his grasp. Audrey reeled down the wheelchair ramp and gave chase. Addison made it to the park across the street. The overgrown grass reached her thighs, thick enough to slow her down. As she reached the park, Audrey sped up into a sprint with wide strides despite the grass. Fear for her daughter's safety gave her a dose of superhuman strength. From behind a tree, a man jumped out and chopped Audrey's neck with a machete. The blade cut through her muscles and external jugular vein in her windpipe. She fell back with the machete sticking out of her neck. Splashes of blood leapt out of her throat. More blood flowed through her trachea. Gurgling and crackling noises came out of her mouth as she attempted to call out to her daughter. Adrenaline couldn't make a person invincible, though. Addison ran without looking back. Before she could exit the park, a man jumped out from the grass and grabbed her. Another man lunged at her from behind a neighboring tree. The teenager kicked and swung her free arm at them, but she couldn't overpower the men. One of them pried the baby out of her arms, then ran off with her. The other guy grabbed her from behind, one arm around her waist and the other around her neck. He held her in a chokehold while carrying her away. They disappeared in the darkness, but the teenager's sobs continued haunting the park. It's them, Brian said, stunned. 
Get inside, Diego demanded. We have to. She needs our... Shit, why aren't you shooting? We don't know how many of them are out there. We can't waste our ammunition. Wait, what? What is he doing? Audrey's attacker stood over her, yellow and red, his jaundiced eyes scored with veins appearing to be glowing in the dark. His pupils were alarmingly dilated. His long hair was frizzy but thinning while his beard was thick and wild. Blood and grime stained his hands. Flakes of dried blood caked his long, brittle, yellow fingernails. On one foot, he wore a Converse sneaker, and on the other, a torn black sock with his big toe sticking out of a hole. There were more dark stains on his jeans. His button-up shirt was open down the middle. Most of the buttons were missing. He didn't wear anything under it, leaving his torso exposed. His abdomen was hollow, and his ribs jutted out like a starved dog's. This man hadn't had a nutritious meal in months. The craze, the hunger for more, kept him going, though. Blender babies fueled him. The man took a knee on her chest. Then, while gazing into Audrey's eyes, he lowered his other knee onto the spine of the machete's blade. She squeezed her eyes shut as the blade sank deeper. It split her esophagus in two, then severed one of her internal jugular veins. Blood shot out of the side of her neck in huge spurts, drenching the overgrown lawn. She passed out 15 seconds later, but her head continued spinning like a tumbleweed tumbling in place. The man's knee slipped off the blade and crashed into her upper teeth, chipping three incisors. He grinned as an idea popped into his head. He leaned forward and planted his palms on the ground, chuckling. He started kneeing her face repeatedly. Her crushed, bloodied nose resembled a squashed wad of gum on a sidewalk. Two teeth would dislodge from her gums. They spiraled down her throat like pills falling into a sink. She couldn't swallow them because of the blade buried deep in her neck, though. Her cheekbones and forehead were caved in. Blood came out of her eyes and ears. A siren wailed in the park. Another blared behind the police station. The noise came from cheap megaphones, loud and scratchy. The survivor's eyes widened in perfect unison. Baby fiends emerged from behind every tree in the park and stood from the lawns. They had been crawling through the grass and hiding behind the trees to avoid detection, waiting for the perfect opportunity to attack. They were frenzied, but organized, hungry, but tactile. Audrey's killer jumped up to his feet. He whipped the machete out of her carved-up neck, a whip of blood flying off the blade. He pointed the machete at the stoop and shouted, Charge! 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 Chapter 5 The Siege The baby fiends, teenage to middle age, dashed towards the police station, growling and laughing and screaming and whooping. Some of them ran on all fours. Diego fired his rifle at them. In the park, a young woman was shot in the head. Her left eye burst in its socket as the bullet went through it. The round exited through the back of her head, along with shards of skull and worm-like bits of brain. She collapsed on the sidewalk across the street. The cop shot the two men behind her but missed. He took his rifle and fired at a man on the street. The bullet hit the baby fiend's knee. Every bone, ligament, and tendon was shredded. The bottom half of his leg was barely attached to his body, dangling from strings of pulpy flesh. He fell to the ground and howled. The cop missed his head with a follow-up shot. Brian saw a horde of raiders running into the parking lot. A few splintered away from the group and ran towards the main entrance. He shot at them. He didn't hit anyone directly, but some of the pellets ricocheted off the sidewalk. The ricochets struck their legs and abdomens. As if they didn't feel any pain, they kept running. Brian retreated from the police station. Diego followed him, walking backwards while shooting at their attackers. He closed the doors, but they didn't stay shut due to the damage caused by Lee's body. Block the entrance, the cop shouted. Brian pushed a large filing cabinet in front of one of the doors. It wasn't big enough to block both. He heard people screaming and running in the police station. A baby fiend crashed into the filing cabinet. Brian pushed his body up against it to stop it from toppling over. A crazed woman passed through the opening next to him. As she made a beeline for him, Diego shot her in the neck. The gunshot made her stray off course. She reeled to her right with her hands wrapped around her throat as if she was strangling herself. 
She crashed into a wall face first, dropped to her knees, got unsteadily to her feet, then collapsed. Blood accumulated into a puddle under her twitching body. On his hands and knees to avoid friendly fire, Brian scurried over to the other side of the room. He pushed the sofa up against the side of the filing cabinet. It wasn't big enough to block most of the other door, but it served as a small hurdle for the raiders. The cop shot a man attempting to vault over the sofa. The guy was hit in the chest, propelling him back. He landed on top of Lee's body on the stoop. Brian ran backwards to Diego's side. He shot the doorway twice while the cop reloaded his rifle. There was no one there, but he was hoping the gunfire would keep the raiders at bay. He heard glass shattering and wood snapping through the precinct. He knew the baby fiends were trying to break through the boarded windows. He recoiled upon hearing gunfire inside of the building. He glanced back at the information desk, then at the neighboring doorway. Caesar was gone. They're already inside, he said. He flinched again as the shooting resumed in the lobby. Diego had shot another baby fiend before he could enter the building. The man was shot in the arm. His bicep popped like a balloon filled with blood while a flap of his tricep hung over his elbow. The man bellowed and took cover behind the barricade. Instead of trying to jump over the sofa, the raiders started pushing the filing cabinet forward, using it as a shield. Shoot, Diego ordered. It's too late, Brian yelled. We have to evacuate. Don't just stand there, damn it. Shoot, I have to save my family. Brian ran through the doorway, racing through the hallways. He heard a song of chaos playing all around him. Sirens, destruction, gunfire, screaming, weeping. He bumped into another cop outside the police station's office area. Have you seen my family? He asked rapidly, spitting words like bullets. Without answering him, the cop barged into the office. He immediately started shooting at the windows with his rifle. Brian went to the jail lobby. Some of the survivors had gathered in there. It was noisy and chaotic. One of the survivors was holding a chair overhead, ready to hurl at the first baby fiend to step into the room. Another one had torn a headset off a payphone, the severed armored cord dangling from it. Leslie! Brian shouted as he dashed into the room. What's happening? A brunette woman asked. Are they inside? Did they get inside? Leslie, Cameron! Hands buried in her hair, Lori said, They're here, aren't they? They're really here. I knew this was going to happen. We're dead. We're all dead. Christ, help us. Les, Cam! The man with a headset grabbed Brian's arm and said, Hey, man, what the hell is going on? What are we supposed to do now? Get out! Ollie, get out! Brian yelled. You have to evacuate. You're cornering yourselves in here. Go anywhere but the main entrance. Once you're outside, run like hell and don't look back. Now let go of me and let me find my family. He jerked his arm free and kept marching forward. The survivors continued firing off questions at him, but he didn't have any time for them. Over here! Kristen hollered from behind the reception desk. She was cowering back there with her kids, as well as Leslie, Harper, and Cameron. They were all sniveling. Leslie was wearing a backpack. It was loaded with supplies for their baby and for their survival, including reusable diapers, formula, ration food, and a flashlight. Brian grabbed his family in a bear hug. He felt his blood pressure drop as relief swept through him. We have to go, he said. Leslie stuttered. But what about the rest of our stuff? No, no, we don't have time to pack anything. We don't have any time to talk about this. It's over. We have to leave, Leslie, or we... We're dead. He couldn't say those words in front of his son or Christian's children. Leslie didn't have to hear the rest of the sentence to get the message, though. She saw the intense fear in his eyes. We're right behind you, she said. Brian crouched in front of Cameron and said, Grab Mom's pants. Whatever you do, don't let go. You hear me, little guy? Huh? Cameron sniffled and nodded as he hooked his little fingers over his mother's waistband. Brian stood up, looked Christian in the eye, and in a quiet voice so the kids wouldn't hear him, he said, Stay close, or you're on your own. Don't make me pick between us and you. We will follow you, Brian, Kristen said with a tremor in her voice. Brian lifted his shotgun and put his finger on the trigger, entering a shooting stance. He led his family and Christians through the jail lobby. As they reached the doorway, the door to the garage broke open down the hall in front of them. A shirtless baby fiend, nicks and scratches across his bald scalp, had tackled the door. He lost his balance as he stumbled into the corridor, but he kept himself on the opposite wall. He was armed with a sickle. The maniac cackled as he oogled the families. His eyes were shining with happiness, excitement, arousal. He looked like he had just won a jackpot. Plug your ears, Brian shouted. The maniac barreled towards them. At point-blank range, Brian squeezed the trigger. 
The survivors behind him screamed with the roaring gunfire. The maniac was blown off his feet by the blast. He fell back with a crater on the left side of his chest. He writhed on the floor, fighting for air. Fragments of bone from his ribs and pellets collapsed his lung, pierced his heart, and penetrated his diaphragm. Hurry, Brian said, his ears ringing. Stay close. My ears hurt, Cameron whimpered. Dad, it, it hurts. Since he was still holding on to his mother's waistband, the boy only blocked one of his ears with his free hand. Harper was bawling, too. Leslie held her close to her chest, trying to smother her cries with her bosom without suffocating her. She used her body to block Cameron's view of the carnage, too. I know, Cam, I know, Brian said, dread and frustration straining his voice. You're okay, you're fine, just stay close. He led them down the other hallway. They could still hear the cops shooting in the other rooms. They took a right, moving away from the main lobby. Leslie was heartbroken by the blood-curling screams from survivors behind them. More raiders had entered the police station through the garage, and they had poured into the jail lobby. The families hurried down another corridor. Brian stopped at the archway to his right. Hugging the wall, he took a peek around the corner into the staff lounge. He felt his heart drop into the pit of his stomach like a grenade, igniting a bout of paralysis. Tables and chairs were knocked over. Fresh blood streaked the walls and carpet. Caesar sat on the floor in the corner of the room, a limp arm outstretched in front of him. He drew noisy, irregular breaths, mouth wide open with blood coating his lips. A chef's knife stuck out of his neck. His other hand was on the handle. He didn't have the strength to pull it out. There were nine deep stab wounds down the left side of his torso, from his ribs to his hip. Three more on his back and two on his shoulder. Eva was on the floor in the middle of the room. She was on top of her son, propping herself up on her elbows as if she was planking so she wouldn't crush him. The toddler was crying under her, kicking and screaming. Three baby fiends towered over them, all of them armed with machetes. It was a tall man with long hair, matted with dried blood and fecal matter. A short guy with a thick mustache and stubble, and a woman with a shaved head. No, no, please, Eva was screaming. Help me, help. You cut me, you cunt, the female maniac hissed. Eva had used a box cutter to slice the woman's face open from the corner of her mouth to the center of her cheek, leaving her with half a Glasgow smile. The baby fiends had attempted to abduct her and her son, but she put up a fight. Caesar had tried to rescue his family, but he was taken by surprise and stabbed from behind. The man with the long hair had Caesar's pistol tucked in the back of his waistband. We gave you a chance to come with us, the female maniac said, circling her like a vulture. If you shared with us, we would have shared with you. We ain't greedy. And even if we are, we could have gotten some more babies out of you. More babies, more chances to share, right? We could have worked something out. Shit, we could have replaced that brat for you while we were at it. This didn't have to be the end for y'all. Stop it. Get away from us, Eva shouted. Oh, we'll be on our way soon, ma'am. And we'll be taking that sweet, juicy baby with us. Gonna give him never a new home right in our bellies. We're gonna slurp him up. Isn't that right, boys? That's right, the man with the long hair said, grinning. Eva looked up at them and yelled, don't you fucking... The female maniac punted her side with her steel-toed boot, knocking the wind out of her. The other baby fiends joined in. They kicked and stomped and treaded all over her. Over her grunting and groaning, Eva could hear her bones cracking and crunching. Her broken ribs caused hot pulses of pain to shoot through her body with each breath. Her arm wobbled as a kick dislocated her elbow with a loud pop. She blacked out after a kick to the side of her head. She awoke five seconds later, dizzy and nauseated with her ears ringing. Blood ran down her cheek from a gash on her temple. She felt her son sliding out from under her. He was a shapeless blot in her blurred vision, but she could still hear his crying over the buzzing in her ears. Although she was scared of crushing him, she wrapped her arms tightly around the boy and let her body fall on top of him. She convinced herself that she was going to die in that room, and that it was better for her to suffocate her son and take him with her than to let them take him and turn him into a blunder baby. A punt to the back of her head cut her scalp open, 
blood drenched her hair before trickling down to her forehead in the nape of her neck. During the beating, Brian sidestepped past the archway while aiming his shotgun at the baby fiends. His family and Christians followed him. Despite his darkening eyesight, Caesar spotted them from the edge of his vision. He raised his arm, hands shaking madly like an impatient patron, waving down a waitress at a restaurant. He called out to Brian, but only grunts, hiccups, and blood came out of his mouth. Rage and sadness fought for the expression on Brian's face. He was angry because Caesar was jeopardizing his family's safety with his actions. At the same time, he was traumatized by the violence. Eva's sluggish moans and the toddler's cries filled him with tremendous guilt and shame. A part of him wanted to shoot the baby fiends and rescue the Mendozas. The other part of him told him to survive and to sacrifice them to save his own family. He shook his head at Caesar and mouth, I'm sorry. Tired of fighting with Eva, the baby fiend started swinging their machetes at her shoulders. The blades easily tore through her flesh and clanged against her bones. Geysers of blood gushed out with each chop. All of her scapula, humerus, and clavicle bones were broken. She passed out from a combination of blood loss and shock, but her involuntary surrender didn't stop her attackers. They kept chopping. It took them another two minutes to hack off both of her arms. They tossed the amputated limbs at Caesar. He was already unconscious. He had passed out at the same moment as his wife. The men lifted Eva's body so the female maniac could drag the little boy out from underneath her. They couldn't rip him out of her arms, so they had to rip her arms off to get what they wanted. Their savagery knew no bounds. The female maniac ran out of the room with the crying toddler in her arms. The other men followed her, jumping and yeeping with glee. By then, Brian and the others had reached the other end of the corridor. They stopped at a three-way junction. The door in front of them led to the precinct's evidence storage room. He looked down the hallways to his left and right, as if he was about to cross a busy street. He went right. His wife was so close behind him that he could feel her breath on his neck. As the marshals reached the three-way junction, the door to the evidence storage room swung open. A baby fiend stood in the doorway with a look of pleasant surprise on his smiling face. Oh, 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 look what we got here, the white-haired man said, sounding like a deranged mall Santa. Kristen and her children froze. The man stepped into the hallway and said, What do you say, you and your girl, come with us? If you don't put up a fight and waste my damn time, we'll let your boy stay here and fend for himself. Come on, we're only going to fuck you in your... In a knee-jerk reaction, Brian ran up to him and squeezed the shotgun's trigger. The explosive bang from the gun echoed through the precinct. The left side of the baby fiend's head was blown off. Slivers of skull, ropes of brain tissue, dislodged teeth, and blood flew every which way. Stiff, the man's body fell to the floor. With the blast, Leslie gasped and teetered back. Harper cried louder, thrashing about in her mom's arms. Stop! Cameron cried, hunching over and pressing his palms against his aching ears. Brian wiped the blood off his face with the back of his hand and said, This way. Covered in the attic's blood, Kristen and her children stood in awed silence. They saw another man standing in the dark evidence storage room. He smiled and held the spine of a butcher's knife up to his lips, as if simultaneously shushing them with the blade and daring them to scream. And the family took the dare. They shrieked at the top of their lungs. Acute terror addled Christian's brain. She heard Brian's voice, but his words were all jumbled. This way sounded like that way. She ran down the hall to her left, dragging her kids behind her. What are you doing? Brian said. This way, this way, damn it. Leslie ran forward and speaking louder, but not quite yelling. She said, Christian, come here. You're going the wrong way, sweetheart. You're... We have to go, Brian interrupted, giving Leslie's shoulder a little tug. But, but her kids, they, they're going to... I know what they're going to do to them, and there's nothing we can do to stop it now. It's a dead end over there. You know what will happen to us if we follow her. I'm sorry, but we have to get out of here. For Cameron. For Harper. Leslie watched as Christian dragged her children into the women's restroom down the hall. It hurt her to think about them. Although they hadn't known each other for more than a few months, she had grown fond of them. She loved watching their children play together. Their happiness in the darkest period of their lives had instilled a sense of hope in her. 
She wondered if Christian's husband, Philip, could have saved him if he hadn't volunteered to join the scavenging party. She couldn't help but feel partly responsible. Brian could have gone, she thought. I could have gone. She knew Brian was right, though. In tears, she followed her husband. They snuck out of the building through the staff entrance. In the restroom, Christian turned the door's deadbolt. She scanned the room, eyes zigzagging in their sockets. There were four stalls to her left and some sinks to her right. No windows, no ventilation shafts, no exits. She hopped and gasped as the door rattled behind her. The baby fiends took turns kicking and tackling it. It sounded like it was going to give way at any second. Mommy, I'm scared, I'm scared, Ellie, her four-year-old daughter, cried. Voice cracking, Carson, her eight-year-old son, asked, Mommy, what do we do now? Christian was at a loss for words. She knew they had reached the end of the road. She had a backup plan, a plan she buried in the darkest recesses of her mind, a plan she never said out loud, a plan she didn't have the courage to disclose to her children. Being captured was not an option. Come with mommy, she said as she lifted Ellie from the floor. She carried her into the first stall and sat her down on the toilet. She said, wait here. Don't go. I'll be gone for a minute. I'm only going to take your brother into the next stall and talk to him. Everything's fine. We're fine. Mommy, no, please. I'm scared. I'll be right next to you, darling. I can hear you and you can hear us, okay? I'm not leaving this room. I won't go anywhere without you. I promise. Now don't you move a muscle. Don't go. Christian shut the door. She stepped out of the stall. She grabbed her son's hand and pulled him into the neighboring stall. The boy sat on the toilet, brow creased in confusion. Mom, what are you doing? What's happening? He asked. Christian knelt in front of him and said, I need you to close your eyes, honey. What? Close your eyes. But why? From the other side of the restroom door, a man shouted, Get out of here, you bitch! You got nowhere to run! The banging at the door intensified. Mommy! Ellie whined in the other stall. Christian choked down the lump in her throat, then said, We're running out of time. You have to trust me, honey. Please, close your eyes. But I'm scared, Carson said. I know, I know. You just have to be brave, like your dad said, remember? You can do this. Close your eyes and think about something that makes you happy. The boy closed his eyes, sending warm tears down his red cheeks. His lips wrinkled in an uneven frown. Christian took a pocket knife out of her back pocket and unfolded the four-inch blade. Her hand trembling, she pointed the tip of the knife at the center of his chest. Her throat tightened and her mouth dried up. She put her other hand on her son's eyes and said, I love you, baby. She thrust the knife into his chest. The blade cut through the tough cartilage connecting his ribs to his sternum before plunging into his heart. Carson could only release a yelp, Ow! before the sharp pain stole his voice. He crashed into the wall behind him and whimpered. A long spray of blood came out of the wound sprinkling on the Christian's face. She saw his chest rising and falling in quick succession. She felt his eyes moving under her fingers too. He was a fighter. She heard a crinkling noise as she twisted the blade. She couldn't tell if it was the cartilage tearing or the wounds in his heart widening, or both. The boy's body stiffened up while his bleeding accelerated. Christian pulled the knife out of his chest and forced herself up to her feet. Staring down her dead son, she put her hand over her mouth and sobbed. The kid's white t-shirt was soaked in blood. The blood drenched the crotch of his jeans, too. Some drops landed in the toilet water, red plumes curling through the liquid. She bent over kissed his forehead, then whispered, I'll see you soon, honey. As she shambled out of the stall, the restroom door burst open. A man fell into the room, face planting at Christian's feet. Christian ran to the first stall as more baby fiends rushed into the restroom. Mommy! Ellie cried on the toilet. I love you, baby! Christian yelled. Mommy, what? Since she didn't have time to aim for her heart, Christian thrust a knife into her daughter's neck. The blade skewered her windpipe and esophagus, the tip scraped her cervical vertebrae. Hands over her neck, the girl fell off the toilet. The side of her head bounced off the floor with a loud thud. She went into convulsions while blood spumed out of her mouth. The stall door was kicked open. It hit Christian's back. She fell to her knees and reached for the knife in her daughter's neck. She needed it so she could join them. 
but before she could even touch the handle, a man hooked his arms under her armpits and pulled her out of the stall. Fuck, the man said. The big bitch killed the little bitch. I'm so sorry, baby, Christian cried, staring down her dead daughter. Another guy said, she'll just have to make us a new one then. Then another one after that. Then another and another and another. Get her to the factory and don't damage the equipment this time. Kill me, God, kill me, Christian wept. Outside, Brian and his family made it to the end of the block. They crouched behind a truck abandoned over a busted fire hydrant to catch their breath. Looking back, they saw baby fiends lobbing Molotov cocktails at the police station from the park. The female survivors, now prisoners, were tied up and carried out of the building through the garage. The male survivors were either killed during the raid or left to burn to death, and there were still plenty of people trapped in the building. The screeching from the survivors competed with the roar of the raging fire. Harper mewled in Leslie's arms. Although she was wearing earmuffs, the baby could still hear the chaos. Leslie cupped her hand over her mouth, careful not to block her nose, and rocked her while walking away from the truck. She whispered, We have to go, Brian. She's getting fussy. Yeah, Brian replied. Saw for eyes fixed on the burning building. Misty-eyed, Cameron pulled on his mother's backpack and asked, Where are we going? She didn't respond. She was humming Harper, trying to get her to sleep. The boy slowed down to walk next to his father. He repeated the question. Where are we going? I'm not sure yet, buddy. We'll find somewhere safe, though. Just stay next to your mother and stay quiet. Same rules as before. Don't worry. I'll be right behind you. They walked down another street. There was a city service center behind the police station. It was abandoned like every other local government building. Cameron asked, Are Carson and Ellie going to be okay? That's enough talking, Cam. Go walk with your mother and stay quiet. Cameron pouted, saddened by the coldness in his father's voice. The boy jogged forward to catch up to his mom. Brian hated pushing his son away, but he couldn't take care of his family if he didn't keep them at arm's length. Out on those streets, survival required his undivided attention. He didn't want to talk about the massacre in the police station anyway. He blamed himself for all the deaths, coffins piling up on his shoulders. The family kept moving, staying low and sticking to the shadows. Chapter 6. Seek Shelter Most of the buildings in the city were abandoned. During the shelter-at-home order at the start of the craze, many residents were murdered in home invasions. Their houses were burned down or wrecked to the point of being uninhabitable. Clans of baby fiends raided apartment complexes and slaughtered those residents as well, but they kept some of those buildings as their headquarters, and survivors referred to their headquarters as their hives. Brian trailed behind his family, keeping a slab of sidewalk between him and them. He had been directing them through the shopping district. Baby fiends wandered the streets. Some of them belonged to clans, using pickup trucks and motorcycles to patrol their territory. Others were homeless, making every effort to survive as the addiction ate away at their minds. Their sustenance consisted of expired food and stray animals, blender babies and women. Food, drugs, sex. The family crept down another street. All the storefronts were bored as if the owners were preparing for a hurricane to ravage the city. The store interiors were visible through holes small and large in the plywood. All the shops, restaurants, convenience stores, hair salons, laundromats, banks, clothing stores had been looted. At one of the banks, an ATM was pried open and two others were missing. Cash had been useless for months, but people still sought it. People were addicted to money before they were addicted to blender babies. Brian spotted the orange glow of a fire flickering through the holes on a sheet of plywood, covering the storefront window of an electronics repair shop to his right. Survivors weren't known for camping out on their own in unsecured buildings, so he knew a baby fiend was inside the store. Maybe two or three sitting around a fire burning in a trash can. He pointed the shotgun at the store as they snuck past it. Les, cross here, he whispered. His voice was just loud enough for his wife to hear him. Leslie crouched in front of a truck on cinder blocks and examined her surroundings. The coast was clear, so she jogged across the street. Drowsy, Harper made some baby noises, oohs and ahs, 
while suckling on her pacifier. Cameron stayed close to his mother while constantly glancing back at his dad, as if he were afraid he was going to abandon them. They entered a residential neighborhood. Leslie tiptoed into an alley with Cameron right behind her. Brian's heart skipped a beat as he lost sight of them for two seconds. Not that way, he whispered. Hey, where are you? His voice faded to silence as he found Leslie squatting next to a dumpster. Harper was getting grouchy again, and Leslie knew exactly how to comfort her. She removed Harper's earmuffs and whispered a string of unintelligible baby talk into her ear. She didn't say anything specific, but Harper could feel the love in her voice. She smiled and giggled softly, and despite all the terrible things happening around her, Leslie didn't have to force herself to smile back. Harper's happiness was contagious. Even Cameron, watching from the sidelines, smiled with her. Brian said, We have to move. Taking a break from the baby talk, Leslie glanced up at him and asked, Where are we going? We can't walk around all night. We need a plan. We're safer when we're moving, but we still need a plan. If we get spotted, we need somewhere we can run to. Brian put his back up against the brick wall behind the dumpster. He eased over to the edge of the partition, then stuck his head out around the corner and looked up and down the street. The stink of decay, rotting bodies, rotting animals, rotting food, rotting buildings waved through the desolate streets. He had hoped to find shelter in a shopping mall or a plaza with other like-minded survivors, but there were none in sight. He assumed the other survivors in the area had ended up in the police station. It was supposed to be a fortress after all. He then considered taking his family to a hospital or another police station. He remembered hearing reports of the initial raids conducted by the baby fiends, though. He didn't expect to find many other clusters of survivors, either. After the first round of home invasions, many of those unaffected by the craze fled to smaller towns, deserts, and forests. Cut off from the world, it was impossible to know how far the craze had spread. Brian returned to his wife's side and said, Let's go to the supermarket. Which one? Alberto's market. Is... Isn't that where Daryl and the others went to find supplies? Why would we go there? They never came back. Exactly. Maybe they found a, a safe haven, or maybe they're... You think they abandoned us? Leslie interrupted. Daryl wasn't like that, and Philip wouldn't have left Kristen and his kids, and the others were... Or maybe they're still out there. Alberto's market was the first stop on their list. It's possible that they went there, cleared it out, packed up their supplies, then moved on to their next stop. If that's true, then it'll be a safe place for us to wait until morning. If it's not, then we can cross it off our list and find somewhere else to hide. If you have a better idea, I'm all ears. I got an idea, Cameron said, raising his hand as if he were in a classroom. Not now, Cam, Brian said. Cameron lowered his arm and sighed. Staring down at Leslie, Brian said, We need to be on the same page. What do you say? Leslie only had one idea. Hide in the dumpster until morning. It fell apart in her head, though. The dumpster's thin walls couldn't muffle Harper's cries, and it was easy to climb into a dumpster, but depending on the type of garbage inside, she could see it being difficult to get out. She didn't want to trap her family. She certainly didn't want Harper or Cameron to breathe in any of the garbage, either. She kissed Harper's forehead, put the earmuffs over her ears, then said, Let's go. Brian nodded at the alleyway gesturing his directions. That way. Leslie got to her feet. Holding Harper in one arm, she took Cameron's hand and led the way. Stop, Brian whispered. Get down, get down. Leslie and Cameron squatted behind a crashed black minivan. Its loosened front bumper was tangled in the trunk of the wrecked sedan in front of it. The sliding door's window was a spiderweb of cracks. The side view mirrors were broken off. One was on the ground next to the front passenger door. The other was missing. The driver's door was cracked open. Brian crouched his way to the front of the van. He craned his neck up to look over the sedan. Past a four-way intersection, in a parking lot, he could see Alberto's market. White light spilled out through the storefront windows. A generator? Brian wondered. Or maybe there's still power out here. The sliding doors were propped open with bricks, as if an invitation he didn't see any movement in the supermarket, but he knew it was a hive. Survivors didn't leave their doors open. He opened the minivan's driver door inch by inch so as not to make any noise. 
then checked inside. A partial bloody handprint was stamped on the passenger seat cushion. There was another on the dashboard. Water bottles were scattered throughout the floor. They were all sealed except for the one stuck under the brake pedal. That one was crushed with some water left inside of it. Rumpled blankets covered the third row of seats. From the driver's seat, he could see the suitcases crammed into the trunk. He returned to the back of the minivan and said, I need you two to wait in the car. You can't be serious, Leslie replied, eyes big with befuddlement. Cameron asked, You're leaving us? I'm going to check the supermarket, Brian said. They're not here, Leslie responded. You know that already. There's no point in going in there. You hear that? What? I don't hear anything. Exactly. It's too quiet out here. That means they aren't home either. If Daryl and the others were caught, we can save them. I don't want to be in this position, but Daryl was right. I'd rather be fighting by their side than on our own. And if Daryl and the others are gone, then maybe I can get some supplies. Or get an idea where to go next. I'll sneak around. If anyone's there, they won't see me. We can sneak too. That's what we've been doing this whole time. Brian said, If Harper makes a peep in there, they'll be all over us. I need to do this alone. You'll be safe in the van. Just make sure the door stays locked until I get back. Leslie wanted to ask, What if you don't come back? She didn't want to scare Cameron, though. She could see the resolve in her husband's eyes, too. She couldn't talk him out of it. Harper, tired but unable to sleep, whined and flailed her limbs. Leslie felt a spike of anxiety every time Harper cried. She recalled feeling the same way when Cameron was a baby, too. It's a normal part of parenthood, her doctor had told her. It was different with Harper, though. It was far stronger, laced with unadulterated fear and a dose of paranoia. She crooned to Harper while rocking her in her arms. She glanced back at Brian and whispered, Fine, but you better get back to us before I start worrying. If you don't, we're going to get in there and you are going to have to worry about us. Brian gave a half smile and nodded. He knew when she was bluffing. She wasn't going to risk her family on a suicide mission. Cameron grabbed his father's forearm and asked, What if it blows up? What are you talking about? The car. Brian huffed a one-syllable laugh. Ha. Then said, You'll be fine, kiddo. I checked it all out. You just stay close to your mother and listen to everything she says. Are you sure? I'm positive. Now you're going to stay with your mom, right? Cameron eyeballed the wreckage, then stared back at his dad for a few seconds before nodding. Brian helped him climb into the minivan through the driver's door. The boy went straight to the back seat, searching for toys for himself and his sister. Leslie followed him into the minivan. She stayed in the driver's seat. She reclined it so she could lay low. Come back to us, she said to Brian. I will. Get some rest. He closed the door for her. He waited until he heard the quiet thump of the door's lock. Then he slunk away. Chapter 7 Alberto's Market Brian crouched behind a dormant light pole in the parking lot next to an empty shopping cart receptacle. Across the wide lane in front of him, he could see the supermarket's entrance. A light hummed incessantly above the open sliding doors. The white light revealed the blood mopped on the floor across the doorway. It was a warning. The entrance appeared to be unguarded, though. Brian stuck his head out from behind the light pole's base and surveyed the area. A vandalized SUV, tires popped, windows broken, doors dent and wide open, was abandoned in front of a dented yellow sign that read, Curbside Pickup. A few meters away, a baby seat lay on its side in the middle of the lane in front of the supermarket, and next to that, there was a diaper bag. There were other abandoned vehicles scattered throughout the parking lot, too. They were all damaged like the SUV. One had been burnt to a crisp. The pavement was crisscrossed with dotted lines of dried blood. An inescapable stench. One of death, one of rot, one of violence, stained the air. There were no signs of survivors. Brian peered over his shoulder. Beyond the parking lot, he couldn't see the wrecked minivan past the intersection. Although he yearned to be next to them, he was relieved he couldn't see his family or hear his daughter's cries. Silence was a good thing. He was scared to move forward without them, but he knew he couldn't waste any time. 
He crept out from behind the light pole, shotgun in his hands with his finger on the trigger. Staying low, he crouched over to the supermarket's entrance. He stopped next to the doors as glass crackled under his boots. The sound was louder than the hum from the light. He hadn't noticed all the storefront windows were shattered until that very moment. He tensed up, shoulders high, teeth gritted, breath held, throat tight. He aimed his shotgun into the store, then at the parking lot, then back into the store. He was expecting a horde of baby fiends to pounce on him, but no one came. He let out his breath, slowly, noiselessly. Only some of the lights in the supermarket were on. The rest were either off or broken, leaving swaths of darkness between aisles of light. Many of the shelves at the center of the store had been tipped over. Brian moved silently through the doorway, tiptoeing around the shards of glass. Opting to stick to the shadows, he went to the registers first. He squatted in a checkout aisle. His hands were clammy, so he wiped them on his pants before readjusting his grip on his shotgun. He inched over to the end of the aisle then peeked out from behind an empty shelf. He didn't see or hear anyone else. In the corner to his right, a light illuminated the pharmacy counter. He glanced around, making sure no one was lurking nearby, then headed towards the light. The pharmacy security windows had been shattered. Over the counter, Brian could see all the shelves been knocked down and emptied. A person's leg stuck out from under a toppled freestanding shelf. His black dress pants had a greenish tint, discolored from the corpse's decomposed flesh, and a dark stain outlined his body on the floor. Brian cupped his hand over his mouth and nose upon catching a whiff of the decay. It smelled like rotten eggs mixed with every bodily excretion and fluid. He choked back a wretch and turned away from the pharmacy. In a half crotch, he walked along the right side of the supermarket, past an optometrist's office in the produce section. He stopped in the baby aisle, hoping to find some formula or diapers. Like the rest of the supermarket, the shelves had already been looted. At the back of the store, he could find the meat department. A soft buzzing noise came from behind the counter. He heard faint thuds and grunts, too. Curiosity demanded that he peek over the counter. So he did. Although the lights were off at the back of the store, he could see Philip Marshall's corpse sprawled across a counter at the back of the room. He had been stripped down to his birthday suit. Dissected down the middle, most of his torso had been hollowed out. A coil of bloody intestine hung from his body, though, dangling close to the floor. In the darkness, his crotch was a large black blotch surrounded by pale skin. He had been castrated. His organs and genitals were nowhere to be found. Jesus, Brian whimpered, his voice hardly audible. He didn't know the victim very well, but he still felt bad for him. He thought about the man's wife and children, who he was forced to abandon during the assault on the precinct. He couldn't help but wonder if the entire Marshall family had been wiped out, if he could have done anything to change their fates, if it was all his fault. He was about to turn the lead when he noticed the door next to the counter was cracked open. He heard a weak groan. The noise was coming from the employee area. His survival instincts and survivor's guilt played a game of -of tug-of-war for control of his body. He wanted to return to his family, but he felt compelled to find the others. They could help us if they're still alive, he told himself. Daryl can lead us to safety if he's still here. I'm not a leader, but he can save us if I can save him. He approached a set of double doors between the meat and seafood sections. A sign on the door read, Employees Only. He took one final glance around before easing one of the doors open. He found himself in a T-shaped hallway. Down the corridor to his left and right, doors led to storage rooms as well as the supermarket's other departments. The first door to his right, next to the employee entrance, opened up to the meat department. Through the gap, he spotted one of Philip's feet, tinged with purple on the counter. Frowning, He wrenched his gaze away and looked down the corridor in front of him. The noise was coming from down that hallway. He raised his shotgun and, moving stealthily, he followed the racket. It grew louder with each step, another thud, another grunt. Then there was a long, guttural groan. He noticed a door to a walk-in freezer to his right was slightly open. 
An orange extension cord snaked out of the freezer, leading to the neighboring room. Short, raspy breaths, which sounded like hiccups, seeped through the gap between the door and the frame. Laughter from several people escaped the freezer, too. Brian put his back against the wall and slid towards the door. He peeked through the gap, cold air caressing his face. His eyes grew large with horror. Every part of his body went rigid. He had to take his finger off the shotgun's trigger to stop himself from accidentally firing the weapon. Officers Daryl Andrews and Edgar Carpenter, nude and maimed, were being held captive in the freezer. Two baby fiends, a man with long brown hair and a scruffy beard, and another man with a shaven head and a grizzled goatee, propped up Edgar with their arms hooked under his armpits. Edgar's ankles had been slit. He couldn't feel his feet as they glided in the puddle of blood under him. His rib cage was deformed, broken bones jutting out in lumps. A rainbow of bruises, purple, blue, red, green, yellow, swirled across his rib cage. He only managed to draw shallow, infrequent breaths due to the fiery pain in his chest. A portly man stood in front of them. He had a head of greasy, matted brown hair. He was shirtless, wearing a ballistic vest under an apron. The apron was supposed to be white, but blood had dyed it entirely red. His hazel irises seemed to blend with his jaundiced sclera. He held a meat tenderizer in his right hand. Towards the center of the freezer, Daryl hung from meat hooks in his wrists, wedged between his radius and ulna bones. Two more meat hooks pierced his trapezius muscles. Like his partner, his ankles had been sliced. Only his big toes touched the blood on the floor under him. His face was blotted and bloody from a beating. A fourth baby fiend circled Daryl, looking him up and down. He rarely blinked, eyes big and zany behind his grimy glasses. He was a tall, lanky guy with a hairless head, a bald scalp, no eyebrows, nothing. Excessive shaving left nicks, some fresh, some scapped over, across his head. He was wearing a t-shirt. It had started off white, but it was now beige with dark brown spatter stains. His dress pants were loose and crumpled, frayed at the leg openings. His dress shoes didn't fare much better, falling apart at the seams. The guy in the apron asked, Want me to keep going, Doc? The hairless man stood in front of Daryl. He adjusted his glasses as if that would help him see through the greasy smudges. He had a stare down with the cop. Daryl didn't look away. The pain and loss of blood had rendered him lethargic, but he was still putting up a fight. He couldn't stop himself from blinking, though. The speckled man, known as Doc, in the hive, answered, I never told you to stop. The guy in the apron grinned and swung the meat tenderizer at Edgar's stomach, hitting him directly above his belly button. Edgar felt the tissue between his abdominal muscles, the lanina alba, split down the middle. A patch of petechiae spread across his abs while not a sickening pain bobbled around in his lower abdomen. He puked out some foamy saliva and bile, then gasped for air, fanning the flames of suffering in his chest with each strained breath. His head spun uncontrollably. Eyes locked on Daryl's. Doc pointed at the man in the apron and asked, Do you know what we call him? He's our meat man. He turns men into meat. Well, I suppose we're all meat already, right? I'm talking about food, nourishment. But food man, nourishment man, they don't roll off the tongue like meat man. Meat man swung the meat tenderizer at Edgar again, striking the left side of his ribcage. Some of his bones cracked and snapped. A white-hot flash of pain shot through his body, knocking the cop unconscious. His head fell limp, hanging forward as if in shame. Hey, you almost cracked me with that thing, the guy with the grizzled goatee complained. Grit your bitchin' or I'll crack your skull next time, Meat Man said. I'll make some head cheese out of you, you hear me? The guy with the goatee pulled his lips into his mouth and looked down at Edgar's shoulder. He knew better than to argue with Meat Man. Doc said, Do you want to know why they call me Doc? Yes? No? 
Half of Daryl's face spasmed as pain coursed through his body, but he didn't say a word. Taking his silence as a yes, Doc continued, Of course you do. I'm a self-taught surgeon, you see. I can tear a fetus out of a woman in under a minute. In this place, it's my hospital, as much as it is Meat Man's restaurant. As if on cue, Meat Man struck Edgar with the meat tenderizer a third time. Two of his ribs caved in, pushed into the left side of his chest in a large crater. Daryl flinched upon hearing his partner's bones crunching. Tears sprung to his eyes as he listened to Edgar's ghoulish moans in his whistly breaths. Brian heard the cop's ribs shatter too. The unnerving sound sent a shiver down his spine. He looked down at his shotgun, then back into the freezer. Do something, he was telling himself. Do something before it's too late. But he couldn't move. The shotgun gave him the upper hand, but deep down he knew he couldn't shoot them all before being overrun. He had no idea if the pellets in his shotgun shells were even capable of piercing Meat Man's ballistic vest. He wasn't willing to take the risk. You can make it stop, Doc said, staring back at Daryl. You can give him the easy way out. Cooperate, or the meat man will make meat out of your friend. Get what I'm putting down? Daryl didn't need him to spell it out. Although there were still stockpiles of non-perishables in some grocery stores, food banks, and warehouses throughout the city, the baby fiends had resorted to cannibalism for their sustenance. He broke eye contact for a second to glance at his partner and looked back at Doc right away. He could tell Edgar was close to death. I know why you came here, Doc said. It's always the same reason with you people. Supplies, supplies, supplies. Now, I want to know where you came from and where you were going to go next. Are there more of you? Daryl kept glaring at him. From the unfocused periphery of his vision, he could see his partner as he suffered. Trembling with rage, he shook his head in defiance. Doc leaned closer to him, took a whiff of his neck, then said, I can smell the horrors on you. Their pheromones, their vaginal fluids, their blood, their babies. I can taste them already. Where are they? Daryl remained silent. Doc sighed then said, And it's always the hard way with you people. Know this, officer, whoever you're protecting, you won't be around to protect them anymore. We'll find them eventually. We always do. With a snap of his fingers, the two baby fiends carried Edgar to a counter on the wall. On the counter, there were two electrical meat grinders. The machines were plugged into a power strip on the floor, which was connected to the orange extension cord leading out of the room. Unplug it, Brian told himself as he stared down at the cord behind his feet. Terror had turned his boots into anchors, though. Although he could have closed his eyes or turned away at any moment, he felt like he was stuck there, forced to watch the torture against his will. While his accomplices held the cop up, Meat Man grabbed Edgar's right arm and pulled it over the counter. Edgar was fading in and out of consciousness, totally unaware of what was happening. Meat Man fed the cop's hand through the hole in the meat grinder's hopper. Edgar's hand was forearm deep into the tube. Without any hesitation, Meat Man stepped on a pedal to activate the machine. Edgar's eyes flew open as his wrist snapped. Mouth agape, his vocal cords could only produce a long, harsh croak. His cries were drowned out by the buzzing from the machine, though. The bones in his forearms broke in three different places, one section after the other. A grinding noise came out of the machine as Edgar's fingers twisted over each other and every bone in his hand cracked. His pinky was severed and half of his ring finger was cut off. His muscles and skin tore and tangled into a mess of pulpy flesh. Blood spilled out of the holes on the grinder plate. Unable to handle the agony, Edgar's mind shut down. The baby fiends tightened their grips on him to stop him from falling to the floor and taking the machine down with him. Meat Man took his foot off the pedal. The meat grinder stopped buzzing, but the cop's blood kept burpling out through the grinder plate. Meat Man tugged on Edgar's arm. 
there was some more crackling. His mangled hand was stuck in the machine, though. Meat Man took a cleaver off the counter. He hacked away at the center of Edgar's forearm. Thanks to his broken bones, it only took him four chops to cut off his arm. Edgar was freed from the machine while his hand stayed in the meat grinder. Do you have something for me? Doc asked, his back to the addicts. The man with the long hair said, The piece of junk's busted, boss. That's why we have two. You didn't break both of them, did you, Meat Man? It ain't broken, Meat Man answered. It's jam, but it ain't broken, okay? I'll clean it out later. Then get me the finest sample of your meat now. You can still do your job, can't you? Yeah, yeah, I'll get you something. Meat Man grabbed Edgar's penis and scrolled him in his free hand. He lifted and pulled his genitals away from his body. Daryl knew what was coming. C Carpenter, I, I'm sorry, he said haltingly. These people, these cock-sucking monsters, they're, they're gonna pay. They... He shut his eyes and looked away as Meat Man sliced Edgar's scrotum open with the cleaver. He had started at the rear end of his ball sack. He sawed his way up, the blade gliding behind his testicles. Edgar convulsed in the baby fiend's arms. His head whirled and his droopy legs flopping around violently, but he didn't regain consciousness. He had lapsed into a coma. Partially severed, Edgar's scrotum hung from some thin skin connected to his penis. Meat Man held the mutilated sack in his cupped hand and continued his work. He sawed up into the base of the cop's flaccid dick. Within seconds, he had amputated all of his external genitals. He wiggled the bloody genitals in his hands like a set of balding balls. Go ahead. Keep your eyes closed, Doc said. Yes, yes. Now we can surprise you. Daryl wanted to put up a fight, but he was tired of the violence. Tired of losing friends. Tired of living. Dismayed. Brian continued watching everything from the door. His fight-or-flight response had malfunctioned, leaving him in a paralyzed state. In a red shower, blood squirted out of Edgar's butchered crotch. The drops plopping in the puddle of blood below him. More blood shot out of the stump at the end of his arm. Meat Man took the cop's genitals to the other electric meat grinder. He dumped the organs, scrolled them first, into the hole on the hopper at the top of the machine. Then he stepped on the pedal on the floor. The machine roared to life and ground the genitals. The tubular innards of his testicles, glazed in blood, poured out of the grinder plate holes and spirals. Some of his shredded skin hung out of the plate in curly spirals, too. The spongy tissue from his penis clogged some of the holes. Meat Man scooped up a fistful of the ground genitals in his hand, then walked over to their other prisoner. Surprise, surprise, officer, Doc said. He grabbed a hold of Daryl's head, one hand on his scalp and the other on his jaw. While keeping his eyes shut, Daryl gnashed his teeth to stop the cannibals from prying his mouth open. His lips opened, close, open, close, and open again under Doc's pressure. Holding the mince testes between his fingertips, Meat Man thrust the genitals at the cop's mouth. Some strands slipped between his swollen lips. Most of the stringy meat was smashed on his chin, like squash maggots. Meat Man made sure to smear Edgar's blood all over Daryl's lips. Chew, officer, Doc said. Come on, you need your protein. Daryl gagged, causing his mouth to open up a bit more. Quartering, Meat Man seized the opportunity and slapped the rest of the ground genitals into Daryl's mouth. A few nuggets of flesh splattered on the cop's cheeks and forehead. Daryl retched as the strands of meat wormed across his tongue. He wanted to vomit, but there was nothing left in his stomach to expel. Eat it, officer. Eat. Doc and Meat Man worked together, opening and closing Daryl's mouth to force him to chew his partner's genitals. The other baby fiends let Edgar's body fall to the floor before joining Doc and Meat Man in the middle of the room. Daryl could hear their chants over his own whining and chewing. Eat. 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 The shotgun swayed as Brian held it in one unsteady hand. With his free hand, he pulled the door open gingerly, millimeter by millimeter. He stuck the shotgun barrel through the gap and aimed it at the baby fiends. Shoot at their heads, he said to himself. 
Maybe you can kill them all with one shot. But at the back of his mind, the voice of doubt in his head was asking, What if you can't kill them all? What if you kill Daryl too? What if they kill you? He pulled the shotgun back upon hearing a thud in the store's shopping area. He squinted at the double doors down the hall and listened. He only heard the chanting in the freezer. Then, ten seconds later, there was another thud, a louder one in the shopping area. He heard a chorus of unintelligible voices, too. He glanced around, searching for an exit or a hiding place. Running short on time, he ducked into the walk-in freezer across the hall. He kept the door open a smidge, afraid of getting locked in. As he looked over his shoulder to inspect the room, he felt the strength leave his legs and his heart rate pick up speed. Frozen babies, sealed in saran wrap, were piled on the floor and atop the counters around the room. The babies came in all shapes and sizes. Some were fetuses, others were premature, a few could have passed as toddlers. He could see one of them had been chopped up, limbs and head severed, before being saran wrapped. The bodies were surrounded by stacks of meat affected with freezer burn, as well as other non-perishables. Considering the torture he had witnessed in the other freezer, Brian assumed the meat had come from other humans. He looked away and faced the door. He could see out into the hallway through the small gap, yet images of the dead babies behind him continued flashing in his mind, overriding his vision. These monsters are saving these babies for later, he thought. Jesus Christ, they're treating them like frozen microwave meals. The double doors down the hall swung open. A group of five baby fiends walked down the hall, chattering and roughhousing amongst themselves. A man in a threadbare, blood-stained football jersey and jeans marched in front of them. He was a lean and muscular guy, but he had the complexion of a corpse and the acne of a teenager. His long, thinning brown hair was patchy with bald spots. As he led the others into the freezer across the hall, Brian caught a glimpse of the name on the back of the man's jersey. Above the number 12, the name read Hoffman. Hoffman said, Doc, it's done. The station's burned to the ground as we speak. Any survivors? Doc asked. A few? Bring them here. The baby fiends fell quiet for a long period. Only Daryl's gagging and whining came out of the freezer. Hoffman said, The other guys... They're taking them to suit. His voice trailed off as the freezer door swung towards the door frame behind him. The extension cord stopped it from shutting all the way. Brian could hear bits and pieces of an argument. They were discussing the raid on the precinct. Doc's hive at the supermarket had formed a temporary alliance with the other hives in the neighborhood with the sole purpose of destroying the police station. They had agreed to split the survivors evenly amongst themselves. However, as the chaos unfolded, Hoffman and his crew were left with nothing. Doc yelled at the baby fiends, scolding them like a bunch of children. Slaps echoed through the empty corridors in the employee area, too. Then Darrow howled in pain. His cries were interrupted by a sneezing fit. Brian felt like he had been standing in the freezer for several hours, but only ten minutes had passed since Hoffman arrived with his crew. Don't look back. Don't look back. Don't look back, he kept telling himself. He heard the door across the hall open. As he stormed out of the other freezer, Doc said, Now let's go see if we can get our piece of the pie back. Brian caught another glimpse at Hoffman. His face was red from the slaps. Doc's fingers imprinted on his cheeks. Meat Man and the rest of the cannibals lagged behind him. They didn't seem to care about leaving Darrow unsupervised. He's probably dead already, Brian thought. He watched him return to the shopping area. He was a risk-averse person, but his heart couldn't handle being around the freezer babies. So he counted to 30, which wound up being closer to 15 seconds. Then he stepped out of the freezer and shut the door behind him. He released a shaky breath and aimed the shotgun at the double doors. A minute passed. He didn't hear another thud or voice. He told himself he should wait another minute before leaving the supermarket, but halfway through it, he heard a cough in the freezer to his left. He peeked over at the freezer, then back at the double doors down the hall. His legs trembled with a desire to run, but his conscience wouldn't let him abandon the cops. Fuck, he muttered. Keeping the gun pointed forward, Brian sidestepped towards the freezer. He pulled the door open, stopping it from closing with his foot, then listened for any stragglers as he hesitated for a moment. The baby fiends didn't return, so he stepped inside. 
he found Edgar lying face down in a pool of blood. Clinging to life, Daryl still hung from the meat hooks in the middle of the room. As he approached the survivor, Brian unintentionally cringed. It was a reflex, triggered by a subconscious dysmorphophobia. For a second, the cop didn't look human to him. Daryl's nose had been amputated. His swollen cheeks, lips, and forehead now protruded farther than the stub of cartilage left at the center of his face. D- Daryl? He whispered. Can you- Hear me? The cop lifted his head. Strings of bloody drool hanging from his lower lip. He cracked a thin smile. His eyes were swollen almost shut, but he could make out the man standing before him. You, he rasped. You need to... to leave. I'll... I'll... I can get you out of here, Brian said. No. What do you mean, no? I can care. Stop, the cop said gruffly. He groaned as he jerked away, chains rattling above him as the meat hooks yanked on his flesh. Brian took a step back, surprised by Daryl's resistance. I, I'm not going anywhere, the cop said brokenly. Look at me. I can't feel my, my feet. Or my hands. I can't walk. Can't crawl. If you try to... To... Fuck. It hurts. If you try to take these hooks off... I can't promise I won't scream. Uh, And if I scream... It will be over for the both of us. Brian's mouth opened and closed, but no words came out. He hated to admit it, but he knew the cop was right. Even if he managed to get him out of the supermarket, he didn't have the skills or supplies to keep him alive. Daryl said, I... I heard them talking about the precinct. Your family. Your boy. Your baby. They make it out okay? Brian answered with a nod. Good, Daryl said. And the others? They're all dead, Brian wanted to say, but the truth was he wasn't 100% sure what had happened to everyone else at the precinct. He had only witnessed a few deaths with his own eyes, after all. His thousand-yard stare told Daryl everything he needed to know, though. Go, the cop said. Find shelter. Get out of the city or, or go underground. Get your family out of this, this hellhole. Brian looked down at his shotgun, then back at Daryl. Daryl forced a feeble laugh, then said, I know what you're thinking. Put him out of his misery. Give him the easy way out. But I don't need your mercy. I need you to, to survive, protect your family, do what I couldn't do. I made the wrong move. I need you to make the right ones. The, that's all I want. Speaking at a leisurely pace so his voice wouldn't crack, Brian said, They'll torture you if I leave you like this. I saw what they did to you. I want to stop it, but I... I... He paused as he tasted a tear on his lip. He hadn't realized he was crying until that very moment. He wiped his face with the back of his hand, then said, I couldn't move. I just couldn't move. It was too late. The moment they caught us, the, that was it for us. If you kill me now, they'll know you were here, and they'll start hunting. I'll, I'll keep them busy for a while, okay? I'll, oh shit, I'll send them back to the precinct. Tell them there's a, 
A secret basement. I'll buy you some time. Now go. His rationale made sense to Brian, but it didn't make things easier on his conscience. He felt selfish and cowardly, a concoction of shame and regret brewing in the pit of his stomach. He knew he was running out of time, though. He dragged his feet to the door, his head turned to the right so he didn't have to see Edgar's corpse. On the counter next to the exit, he saw an ice pick. He picked it up, studied it, then tightened his grip on the handle. He looked back at Daryl, determination sparkling in his eyes. Kill. Kill them, the cop said, his voice cracking. Kill anyone. Everyone that gets in your way. Brian nodded at him. He pushed the door open, stuck his head into the hallway, then looked left and right several times, like an anxious kid about to cross a street by himself for the first time. Then he snuck out of the freezer. Daryl stared at the door. He listened to Brian's footsteps as they drifted away from the freezer, fading out at the end of the hall. He didn't hear any doors open, but a feeling of doom and gloom told him that he was gone. He finally felt comfortable letting his silent tears leak out. Staying in the shadows, Brian retraced his steps. He didn't see or hear any baby fiends in the supermarket. Out in the parking lot, he ran from one busted light pole to another, taking a short break at each one to check his surroundings. He made his way back to the minivan. As he knocked on the driver's door, Leslie gasped and leaned away from it. Harper flinched in her arms, startled by the noise, drinking formula from a bottle. Her drowsiness rapidly returned and overwhelmed her. Meanwhile, after hearing the knocking, Cameron jumped up from the row of seats at the back of the van. The kid appeared to have been hiding. Leslie opened the door and said, Are you trying to scare me to death? Where were... Shh, shh, I'm sorry, Brian interrupted in a whisper. It's just me. You hear me back there, Cam? It's just Dad. Open the passenger door. I'll go around. What happened? He shut the door, silencing her voice and crouched around to the other side of the minivan. By the time he reached the front passenger door, Leslie had already leaned over and unlocked it. He climbed into the vehicle, quietly closing and locking the door behind him. What happened? Leslie asked. Brian stared down at his shotgun, breathing heavily and looking shell-shocked. He was relieved to find his family how he had left them, scared but unharmed. But despite the locked doors and his loaded weapon, a sense of foreboding lingered within him. What happened? Leslie repeated, speaking slowly as if afraid of spooking him. Brian asked, Did you see anyone? I mean, um, anything happened while I was gone? You guys okay? I heard people running outside, Cameron said from the back, but Mom told me not to look, so I didn't. Atta boy, Leslie said. Harper started getting grumpy. She made some noise, but I got her under control. She was just hungry and sleepy. You know her. I don't think anyone heard us. No one's come close to the van. Those people Cameron heard, I saw them in the parking lot. They look like, like moving shadows from here. Did they come out of the supermarket? Do you know about them? Brian looked out the window to his right, then leaned back in his seat and rotated his neck left and right to peek out the other windows. He was searching for Doc, Meat Man, Hawkman, and the other baby fiends. He thought back to the cop's torture, and he couldn't stop his mind from imagining his family in the same situation. Brian, Leslie said firmly. We have to go, he responded. Cameron asked, Where are we going to go? Disregarding him, Leslie asked, What did you see in there? They... They're gone, Brian answered, voice faltering. There's nothing left for us here. Please don't make me tell you what was in there. Not in front of the kids. Leslie could tell he was genuinely rattled by his experience in the supermarket. The look on his face reminded her of the day the craze touched their lives. He had entered his brother's apartment in search of shelter, and he returned to his family in a state of devastation, depression, sick, haunted. Where are we going? Cameron asked, as he made his way to the center row of seats in the minivan. Avoiding eye contact, Brian said, We're going somewhere safe. Leslie said, where, Brian? I don't, I, we're wasting time talking about this right now. We need to get out of the city. We, 
We need to find shelter, okay? We need a plan. That is the plan. That's not a plan, Brian. It's a... a go. We can't just wander these streets with Harper forever. The longer we're out there, the riskier it gets. You know how she is. If we're lucky, she'll sleep for a few hours. But once she's awake, they'll hear her. It's too risky. It'd be a lot safer if we knew where we were going. Brian was getting antsy, but he agreed with her. So, he bit his lip and nodded. He glanced around, ensuring no one was trying to ambush them. Leslie said, So, if we're going to leave the city, maybe we can find somewhere with a community, like the precinct, right? Maybe we can look for a military base or something like that. Brian looked back at her, his eyes slitted in contemplation. One of her words echoed in his head. Community. He said, Donald. Donald, Leslie repeated. That guy from the precinct? Did you see him in there? No, no, he didn't follow them, remember? Before he left, he told me about an underground community. Yeah, he told all of us about it. It's all he yapped about. She rocked Harper and shushed her softly as the baby whined and jerk. Harper drifted back to sleep seconds later. Lowering his voice, but not exactly whispering, Brian said, Listen. He told me how to get inside. He gave me specifics. We can walk to Bolshir College. On campus, we go to... to Alcott Hall. In the maintenance levels, there are tunnels that will take us to an abandoned subway station. To a community of survivors. But what if he's wrong? What if no one's waiting for us down there? Even if he's wrong about that, he's not wrong about the school's history. Part of it was built on top of an old psychiatric hospital, right? The rest was built on top of old tunnels and sewers. I know that for a fact. He said those tunnels can take us to that subway station or a culvert heading out of town. Either way, unless you can think of a better plan, this is our best bet at escaping. Leslie stared down at their daughter, thinking long and hard about Brian's proposal. She didn't trust Donald. However, although she hadn't seen them for herself, she had heard local urban legends about the tunnels under the college. A tunnel leading straight to hell underground passages haunted by weeping ghosts, and so on. She figured there was some truth behind the stories. With a subtle dose of reluctance, she said, Okay, okay, let's go to Bosher College. Let's do this, Brian responded, nodding. He peeked over his shoulder and said, Stay close, Cam. Chapter 8. The Journey Cameron drew a short gasp and tottered back, legs close to giving out. Eyes huge with fright, his mouth stretched wide open in preparation of a shriek. But before he could make a sound, a hand covered his mouth and he tasted the sweat of its palm on his quivering lip. He glanced over his shoulder and saw his father, Grimface, standing behind him. Although Brian was pulling him away, Cameron brought his gaze back to the horrors in front of him. In an alley, sprawled face down across the ground, next to an overflowing dumpster, there was the new corpse of an obese man. Dead for days, the corpse had become bloated. His skin was tinted with shades of green and yellow, leaving only a few patches of pale flesh. Bloody foam mixed with green ooze had seeped out of his mouth, nostrils, and ear canals in a brownish froth, and it hardened over his swollen face like a mask. Feces was smeared between his ash cheeks, from his butt crack to his taint. Freshly craters covered his back, each one fringed with teeth marks. It looked like a pack of animals or a horde of baby fiends, or both, had tried to devour his body raw. Maggots wiggled around in the craters while a swarm of flies buzzed above the corpse. The foul stench of decomposition brought tears to Cameron's eyes and turned his stomach. Brian muscled the boy away from the alley, dragging him up the sidewalk. They quickly caught up to Leslie, who had been tiptoeing ahead of them. She wore a baby sling now, which she had been storing in her backpack. Harper slept in the sling, using her mother's breast as a pillow. Keeping his hand over Cameron's mouth, Brian leaned close to the boy's ear and whispered, Remember what I told you. Stay close to your mom and keep your eyes on her. If you see anything, hear anything, smell anything, or even feel anything, you tell me. You don't wander off. You don't scream. You don't. You just focus on us, okay? his face ashen and unsteady from his disgust, Cameron stared into his father's eyes. He looked like he wanted to say something, but Brian refused to take his hand off his mouth until he had an answer. 
So, Cameron nodded at him. Brian could see the boy was horrified. He wanted to explain the severity of the situation to him again, but he knew it wasn't the time or the place for that. He examined the residential street while continuing to lead Cameron forward. All the houses had been invaded and vandalized. Every front door was broken down. Every window was shattered. In one home, a pickup truck had been rammed through a garage door. In another house, a sedan had plowed through the front gate. The vehicle was left parked on the front lawn. On the street, another sedan was deserted atop a downed fire hydrant. Shoe prints and footprints, some muddy, some bloody, were stamped on the sidewalks and pavement. There were some dead bodies on the street. Most of them had been reduced to piles of bones. Only tatters of their soiled, discolored clothing remained, melded with the skeletons. There were no baby fiends or survivors in the area. Brian moved his hand from Cameron's mouth to the boy's shoulder, both to comfort him and to be ready to silence him again. To his utter surprise, Cameron stayed quiet and hung his head. The family stopped at an intersection. They looked both ways two times, then hustled across the street. As he crossed, Brian noticed the fallen utility poles down the street to his left. Although he had been in the neighborhood before, the destruction made it difficult for him to keep track of their location. As he walked between his parents, Cameron glanced back at his father and, with a nervous voice, he asked, Was that a person? Brian held an index finger up to his lips while continuing to monitor the neighborhood. Although he had already been whispering, Cameron lowered his voice a few more decibels and said, In the alley, Dad, was that a person? Yes, Brian answered. What happened to him? I don't know. Why was he... green? And what... I don't know, Cam. Just look straight ahead and keep walking. We can't talk about this right now. Again, Cameron lowered his head in disappointment and plodded forward. The family ended up in another commercial area. With the hive at the grocery store fresh on his mind, Brian led his family away from the superstores and clinics in the area. They stayed low, moving from one abandoned vehicle on the street to another. As they approached an intersection, a howl blew through the area. Leslie squatted next to an SUV and cupped a hand over Harper's left ear. The baby's other ear was already pressed against Leslie's chest. Harper didn't sleep well with the earmuffs while on the sling, so she wasn't wearing them. Brian grabbed Cameron's shoulder, pulled him back to the pickup truck behind the SUV, then pulled him down into a crouch. They waited and listened. A minute passed, then another. It was quiet. In a stage whisper, Leslie asked, What was that? Don't move, Brian said to Cameron. He held his hand up, palm facing Leslie. Leaning against the truck, he slid up to his feet and peeked over the hood. He didn't see anyone around the intersection, and he only heard the faint whoosh of the breeze. Was it a gust of wind, he wondered. No, it was louder than that. A dog? A person? Harper whined softly, interrupting his thoughts. He saw her starting to fuss in the baby sling. Harper slept comfortably on the sling all the time, but she would always wake up as soon as her parents stopped moving. She would cry whenever they would even begin to sit down while holding her as well. Brian knew they had to keep moving. He gave the area a second look-see, then gripped Cameron's shoulder and led him to the SUV. They reunited with Leslie and Harper, then continued moving. Harper quieted down after just a few steps. They made their way down the street, listening for any unusual sounds. During their travels, they stumbled upon two subway entrances. They were sealed with security grills and barricaded from the inside. The barricades were comprised of trash cans, signs, benches, vending machines, and chairs and desks from the employee sections. The makeshift barriers were so dense they couldn't see past them. Cameron drooled over the vending machines. He was dying for a bottle of Coke or a sleeve of Oreos, anything with sugar. He knew he couldn't ask for anything, though. He was only a boy, but reality was starting to sink in. He didn't fully understand the concepts of life and death. He didn't know why they were being hunted. He only knew that the world had changed and he had to listen to his parents to stay safe. Unable to find a way into the subway system, the Turner family moved forward. They came across more dead bodies in varying states of decomposition. Far down another street, they could see a pack of wild dogs gnawing on a headless corpse. 
And as they went down the block, they heard indistinct overlapping voices coming from tents in a small overgrown park. Worried about encountering a hive, the family took a detour. Brian recognized the area well, so he took the lead. Although he moved briskly, both hands on his shotgun, he made sure to keep his family close. They approached the gas station at the corner of a block. They took cover behind a gas pump. Hoses were strewn across the ground, some completely detached from the pumps. One of the hoses had been used as a noose to hang a man from a traffic light at the intersection. His head lollied to the side, neck stretched like an alpaca's. Hey, wait, a voice hissed as the turners prepared to move. Brian turned swiftly and aimed his shotgun at the gas station. He felt his muscles contract and his pulse quicken as he hesitated. At the same time, Leslie pulled Cameron away and covered Harper's ear with her other hand. She anticipated a violent shootout. Although she wasn't eager to abandon her husband, she was ready to flee to protect her kids. Like Brian, however, she hesitated. They stopped next to the neighboring gas pump. The gas station's front doors had two glass panels. The lower glass pane on one of the doors was broken, shards of glass scattered across the entrance. A palm hand, covered in scratches, emerged gradually from the man-made opening on the door. Then another hand came out. It touched the floor, glass crackling under its palm. A woman crawled out of the store. Outside of the door, she stood up on her knees and raised her hands overhead. She wore a dirty, weathered, puffy jacket, a pair of ragged jeans and boots. Her red hair, knotted with clumps of mud, was tied in a disheveled bun. Her green irises were noticeable from afar, as if glowing in the dark. Only one of her eyes was bloodshot. A raised diagonal scar stretched across the center of her starved face. Starting at her right cheek, going across the bridge of her nose, moving up between her eyebrows and ending at the left side of her forehead. It was lined with dirt. She had pitted acne scars on her cheeks as well. Don't shoot, she said quietly. Please, please don't. Please. I, I'm not like them. You have to believe me. Please believe me. As she shuffled forward an inch on her knees, Brian thrust the shotgun forward and said, Don't fucking move. The woman stopped and said, Okay, okay, just don't shoot. I, I don't want to die. I need help. That's all. I'm not one of them. I'm like... She stopped as she caught sight of Leslie and the kids. A small smile blossomed on her face, and tears of joy came to her eyes. She continued, I'm like you. My God, you... You're normal people, aren't you? I... I can see it in your eyes. You wouldn't shoot me if you were like those things. God, I never thought I'd see people like you again. The woman reminded Brian of his brother before the craze, the way she spoke, the way she looked. She looked more like a victim than a baby fiend. He felt bad for her, but sympathy didn't translate to trust. Leave us alone, Brian said. If you try to follow us, I'll kill you. From behind his mother, puppy-eyed and shivering, Cameron said, Dad? Move it. Brian, Leslie said. Move it, Brian repeated. The red-haired woman stuttered. No, no, wait. You can't go that way. Stay back. Don't make me do this. If you go that way, they'll kill you. The family stopped after taking only a few steps. Doubt was scrawled across Brian and Leslie's face. Cameron was holding on to Leslie's backpack, looking every which way. Harper was getting fussy, despite her mother's attempts to rock her. The redhead said, You don't trust me, right? I know you don't. You can't. You shouldn't. I... I get it. I'm like that too, but I'm... I'm desperate, okay? And I'm scared. And I'm hungry. And I'm... Lonely. My name is Amanda Welsh. I was, um, staying with my husband and nephew at a hotel. The, uh, the Wagon Wheel Hotel. We were raided a few days ago and we were separated. I've been on my own since then. I, I need to find them. Brian didn't know what to believe, but he pictured Amanda with a family much like his own. His finger rose from the trigger. We can help each other, the redhead continued. I came from that street, that, that street you were about to walk down. There's a hive over there. 
I swear I barely made it past them. I was so close I could hear them breathing. With that baby, they're going to catch you as soon as you enter their territory. I've been wandering this... this hell for days. I can tell you where to avoid if you tell me where you've been and where you're going. Brian stood in silence for ten seconds, then lowered the shotgun and said, We're coming from the police station, the one next to Crescent Park. We were raided a few hours ago. We stopped by Alberto's market before making our way here. There's a hive there, too. They're... active. Amanda staggered to her feet. The holes in her jeans exposed the bruises and scrapes on her knees, fragments of glass sparkling in some of the tiny cuts. She didn't seem to feel any pain, though. Have you seen my husband, my... my family, she asked. My husband's name is Garrett. He's bald and has a beard... He kept shaving his head after the the craze started, but he hasn't trimmed his beard at all. I keep telling him it's growing out of control, but... Sorry, I'm rambling. My nephew, his name's Sammy. He's, a, uh, He's 14, I think. Maybe 13, maybe 15. He has long black hair, short. 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five on a good day. Skinny. I'm talking scrawny. But he's fast and reliable. We haven't seen any other survivors, Brian answered. No one? Really? No one. Uh, are you sure, Garrett, he's... We haven't seen anyone, Brian interrupted bluntly. Amanda looked down at herself, her face twisting and jerking in a series of spasms. She held a trembling hand over her mouth and turned away from the family, as if ashamed of her grief. As he waited for her to recompose herself, Brian checked out the area. Although they were hidden by the gas pumps, he didn't feel comfortable having a conversation outside. They were pushing their luck. Wiping her face with her sleeve, Amanda asked, Where are you going? Boucher College, Brian said. I, I haven't been over there yet. They could be waiting for me there, Garrett and Sammy. There could be others too, right? Yeah, it's, it's perfect. Let me go with you, please. I can handle myself, I swear. I just... I don't want to be alone anymore. Brian and Leslie looked at each other, communicating with their eyes. Leslie's concerned gaze said something like, I can't keep Harper quiet forever. We have to start moving. Brian looked like he was about to do something he didn't want to do. His finger went back to the shotgun's trigger. He sighed as he caught a glimpse of his son peeking out from behind Leslie. He didn't want the boy to see him murder an unarmed, non-threatening person. Brian beckoned to Amanda and said, You can walk in front of us until we reach a quiet, safe place to continue our talk. Until then, you don't make any sudden movements or sounds, and you keep your hands where we can see them. Are we clear? Yes, thank you, Amanda said with a nod. She raised her hands as if surrendering to the police and sidestepped past the family, trying her best not to startle them. On her way, she smiled thinly as she snuck a look at Harper. Once she was past the gas pumps, she turned the face forward and strode ahead. Brian stayed close to her, aiming the shotgun at her upper back. With Cameron holding on to her backpack strap and Harper dozing off in her sling, Leslie followed him. Although she agreed with her husband's decision, she didn't want to see Amanda die, and she didn't want her children to witness their father commit an unnecessary murder. She couldn't escape the sinking feeling deep in her stomach. Trailing behind her husband, she took a moment to inspect the intersection. As she eyed the gas station, she couldn't help but wonder if there was anyone else in there. Chapter 9. The Break Boucher College was located at the edge of the city. The surrounding streets were lined with palm trees, slabs of sidewalk lifted by their roots. The neighboring shops and apartment buildings had been raided, destroyed, and gutted. Cars were abandoned in the school's parking lot. The baby fiends had rendered all of them inoperative by slashing their tires and drilling holes in their gas tanks. Buildings, no higher than four stories tall, were spread across the campus, each one housing a different department. Decomposing human remains, dismembered arms, legs, heads, unidentifiable hunks of flesh, as well as bones were scattered across the blood-stained walkways between the buildings. Clouds of flies buzzed above the corpses hidden in the jungly lawns. The reek of rot tainted every inch of the campus. 
The Turners and Amanda stopped at the campus bookstore. Amanda still had her hands up. Harper was suckling on a pacifier now, half awake. Through the storefront windows, they could see the shelves and refrigerators at the front of the shop, one stocked with snacks and beverages, were all empty. The textbooks and novels had gone untouched, though. The survivors approached the bulletin board near the school's entrance. As he stepped beside her, Brian grabbed the back of Amanda's jacket and jabbed the side of her abdomen with the shotgun's muzzle. It was a nonverbal warning. You move, and I'll blow you in half. He leaned forward and squinted at a map of the campus pinned to the bulletin board. It was old, damp, faded, torn at the edges, but legible. They have to be hiding somewhere around here, Amanda said. We should start in the cafeteria, right? They could be living off the food in the... We're going to Alcott Hall, Brian interrupted. Wh- why? We'll talk about it later. We need to get out of the open. Go. He moved his hand from the back of her jacket to her shoulder and steered her away from the bulletin board. The survivors walked past the campus security office, which was attached to the bookstore. They went around the library, then up a hill towards two four-story buildings connected by three bridges. Cameron watched as the tall blades of grass swayed next to them. It's just a win. It's just a win. It's just a win, he repeated to himself but he couldn't stop his imagination from conjuring images of a baby fiend stalking his family, creeping up on them on all fours. He sped up, moving with his body pressed against his mom's leg. They rushed past the connected buildings. Up another hill, they saw Alcott Hall, a three-story building with a red brick exterior. It was the oldest building on campus. This is it, Brian said. We have to get in there, fast. Why are we here? Amanda asked. We'll talk about it when we get inside. Come on. As she cast her eyes over the building, Amanda stuttered, What? What is this place? Fine. If you don't want to help, stay here and keep your mouth shut. You move a muscle or say one more word and I'll shoot. Brian, calm down, Leslie said. Brian ignored her. With one eye on their guests, he started searching for a way into the building. He approached the main entrance. Locked. He checked the windows next to the double doors. Locked and barricaded. He lunged across an overgrown lawn, making his way to the door at a corner of the building. The surrounding windows, tall and cracked, were barricaded with tables and vending machines. He was surprised to find the door was unlocked, but it wouldn't budge. It was blocked from the other side. He ensured that no one else was around before ramming the door with his shoulder. With each hit, the table on the other side screeched against the floor. Shit, they're going to hear him! Amanda said, looking frantically in every direction. No, no, it it can't end like this. I haven't had... Her voice softened and slurred, words chopped up into jumbled syllables. Bug-eyed, Cameron stared at the surrounding lawns, expecting a monster to leap out at them. He tugged on his mother's backpack, trying to get her attention. He wanted to scream, Mommy! But the word died in his dry throat. Meanwhile, Harper was squirming and whining, trying to spit out her pacifier while her mother held it in place. Brian, Leslie hissed, stop it. With the six hit, the door popped open. The gap was big enough to fit one person at a time. Brian aimed the shotgun at Amanda and said, you first. Go to the farthest corner of the room and wait there. No, Amanda answered. I can't do that. What if there's someone in there? Then I'll come in and save you. But what if there's more than one of them? Like two or three or, or four of them? I can see enough of the room from here to tell you this isn't a hive. As far as I can tell, you're the only danger here. We don't know you, we can't trust you, and that's just the way it is. So, you either work with us and go in now, or you stay out here and fend for yourself. We don't have all day, so make your damn choice already. Amanda recognized the gravity of the situation. Although hesitant, she accepted her role as an expendable member of the group, a guinea pig. As Brian held the door open, she squeezed through the gap. She found herself in a break room. Eyes darting left and right, she crossed her arms over her chest and moseyed over to the other side of the room. She stood in the corner next to a toppled coffee machine. She looked back at Brian, but he didn't move. He watched her unblinkingly through the window on the door. She touched her head little by little, convinced the baby fiend was standing next to her. She breathed a sigh of relief upon seeing the wall behind her. She looked back at Brian and shrugged. Hands, Brian said, 
his gentle voice barely reaching her through the gap. She huffed, then raised her hands. Brian sent Cameron into the room. Following his dad's instructions, he stayed close to the entrance and kept his eyes on Amanda. Leslie and Harper followed. Then Brian entered the break room. He closed the door, then pushed the heavy table back against it. He grabbed two chairs from the barricade in front of the windows and leaned them against the table for good measure. Then he examined every inch of the room. They were alone. Brian asked, How's Harper? She needs a diaper change, Leslie said. Help me get her out of this. Brian helped her get Harper out of the sling. They put a blanket on the floor, then laid her down on it. She started mewling. They took off her reusable cloth diaper and put it in a plastic bag so they could rinse it out later. Then they cleaned her with some wet wipes before putting another reusable diaper on her. Meanwhile, Cameron checked out the vending machine. His face brightened as he spied a pack of Twinkies on the floor. He tore it open and his smile melted away. The Twinkies, hard as rocks, were crushed in the middle. The creamy white filling in the center of the pastries had turned brown, too. He dropped the snack. It thudded on the floor. Are you going to kill me? Amanda asked meekly. What? Brian replied, face squinched up in surprise. Uh, are you going to, to kill me? Cameron glanced over at his father. Leslie's gaze cycled between Brian and Amanda. Even Harper stopped her baby talk to stare at her dad as if she understood the question. Brian said, no. Then why'd you bring me here? I didn't bring you anywhere. You followed us, remember? I asked to come with you so I could find my husband and nephew. So I could get help. I thought we were going to work together, but you're treating me like a hostage. I don't even know your names. Brian walked up to her and said, How many times do I have to tell you? You followed us. But you forced me in here at gunpoint. I didn't have a choice. I haven't had a choice since we left that gas station. My only options are... Do what you say or, or you'll shoot me. Just tell me the truth. Are you like them? Brian shook his head in disbelief. He had seen the baby fiend's acts of violence firsthand. He had been rough on Amanda, but his aggression was nothing compared to the act's brutality. Yet, when he looked at his son in that break room, he could see traces of fear and distrust in the boy's eyes. Cameron loved his father, but he was beginning to see him as a different man. Brian raised a hand, palm out, and said, We're not like them. As long as you don't put us in danger, I'm not going to hurt you. Eyes on the shotgun, Amanda asked, Then can I put my hands down now? You can, sure, but I'm not putting my gun down. Amanda nodded as she steadily lowered her arms. She looked behind Brian. Leslie had just finished preparing a bottle of formula using warm water from a thermos. She was side-eyeing Amanda, Curious? Cautious. Who are you? Amanda asked as she redirected her attention to Brian. What are we doing here? Brian said, I think you owe us some answers first. I told you everything already. I was staying at the Wagon Wheel Hotel. I was separated from my... Not about that. Tell me about your scars. My scars? Seriously? Amanda said offended. I knew an addict with scars like yours. He had sores all over his face whenever he went on his benders. Once an addict, always an addict, huh? Bryden didn't know how to respond. He had always believed in rehabilitation, especially when it came to his brother's drug issues. Most of the addicts he had encountered throughout his life were self-destructive rather than hostile towards others. The world had changed with the craze, though. Adrenochrome had turned people into bloodthirsty sadists. The facade known as the rule of law had crumbled, leaving only ruins of violence. Amanda said, I had really bad acne in high school. It's gotten worse recently. It doesn't help that I haven't had a bath in months. And the one across your face? Brian asked. I fell on a glass table face first when I was a kid. I was roughhousing with my older brother. Had to miss a few weeks of school after that. Brian walked over to his son. He kicked a pack of expired Twinkies away, as if he were worried his son was still going to try to eat them. He paced back and forth between Cameron and Leslie while watching their guests. He said, You said you were separated from your husband and son during a raid. Any idea? Nephew, Amanda corrected. Where they might have gone? Leslie was trying to read Amanda's body language while taking care of Harper. 
She could tell her husband was trying to catch her in a lie. Amanda said, I don't know where they went. I'm not even sure if they're together. We talked about going into the the boondocks if we ever had to leave that hotel. Garrett and me, we've seen houses out there before. Big, rural, isolated houses, you know. Maybe he's with Sammy in one of them right now. Maybe... Brian stopped pacing and looked at Leslie with a set of inquisitive eyes. His face, one half scrunched with uncertainty, said something along the lines of, What do you think? Good enough for you? Leslie responded with an almost imperceptible shake of her head. A part of her believed Amanda's story. Another part wondered if she was telling them someone else's stories. Snapping out of her trance, Amanda said, Now, who are you? Why are we here? Brian hesitated to tell her about the rumored community of survivors hiding in the subway system. On the one hand, there was a small possibility that Amanda's family was waiting for her in the underground city. On the other hand, he was worried about leading a potential baby fiend in disguise straight into a stronghold of survivors. My name is Brian, he said reluctantly. This is my wife Leslie, and our daughter Harper, and that's Cameron. Okay. Okay, Amanda answered. It's nice to, um, to actually meet all of you. So, what are we doing here? Have you heard about the subway system? I've lived here for years, yeah. I know about the subway. What does it have to do with this school? I don't know if this is true, but... Someone told me there was a group of survivors on the ground. A big group. A community. And that someone told me there was a way into the subway through this school through this building, and if we can't get into the subway, the tunnels will lead us out of the city. Well, that's what I was told, at least. The survivors fell silent for a long, tense moment. Only the sound of Harper sucking on her baby bottle drifted through the abandoned building. Amanda grunted to clear her throat, then said, I heard those rumors before. Some lady at the hotel told us something like that a couple of months ago. She didn't say anything about this school, No one believed her anyway. A joyless smile touched the corner of her lips. She said, Maybe Garrett and Sammy are waiting for me down there, huh? Yeah, maybe, Brian responded. Dad, I have to pee, Cameron said, holding his hands over his crotch. Go in the corner. But I'm scared. Brian ruffled his hair and said, Okay, okay, I'll watch your back. Come on. As he escorted Cameron to the opposite corner of the room, he said, Les, we'll start moving when she's finished. Let me know when you're ready. Leslie nodded at him, then went back to side-eyeing their guests while feeding Harper. Amanda's gaze was glued to the floor, as if she was seeing through it. There was something like hope or excitement sparkling in her eyes. Chapter 10 Into the Tunnels This has to be it, Brian said. He held a flashlight in one hand, which he had retrieved from Leslie's bag earlier, and his shotgun in the other. The survivors had entered a faculty area through a door in the break room. After traveling down a few halls, wandering into offices and closets, they found a door with a sign on it. Brian pointed the flashlight at it. Maintenance personnel only, the sign read. He tried the door handle. It didn't budge. They had been clearing rooms on the first floor for the past 15 minutes, so they knew the drill. Amanda and Leslie kept a lookout, staring down opposite ends of the hall. Meanwhile, under his father's instructions, Cameron watched Amanda, ready to scream if he noticed anything suspicious about her. Brian started tackling the door. Each bang echoed through the empty halls. The noise even escaped the building, dying out in whimpers outside. He rammed the door so much that he broke a sweat and ran out of breath. He felt a stabbing pain deep in his shoulder, too. So, he began to kick the door. Kick, tackle. Kick, tackle. Kick, tackle. After about three minutes, the door broke open. Rubbing his injured shoulder and craning his neck to check the hallway, Brian asked, Are we still clear? Yeah, Amanda answered without glancing back at him. Bouncing her daughter in her sling, Leslie said, I think we're fine. You startled Harper, though. That lady didn't move, Dad, Cameron chimed in. Brian double-checked and then triple-checked the hallway. He didn't notice anything unusual. Aside from Harper's drowsy cooing, the faculty area was dead silent. 
Amanda, Brian called out. As she turned to look at him, he gestured at the broken door with his shotgun and said, You first. Amanda had no choice but to follow his orders. She crossed the threshold into another dark hallway, walking carefully with her arms outstretched as if she were balancing herself on a tightrope. She stayed in the beam of light from Brian's flashlight. Leslie and Cameron, holding hands, followed very closely behind them. They checked every door to their left and right. They found a storeroom filled with maintenance tools. Nothing of use. In a locker room, blood-stained clothes and mismatched shoes were scattered across the floor. A locker was left slightly open in the corner of the room a putrid odor streaming through the gap. Blood painted a circular patch on the floor under the locker. Down another hallway, past a couple of vacant rooms, an unlocked door revealed a stairwell descending below the school. The darkness in the stairwell was oppressive, making it hard to breathe. The beam from the flashlight could only reach the landing below them. A clinking sound drifted up the stairwell from below. Watch your step, Brian said as he nodded at Amanda. Go on, I'm right behind you. Amanda grabbed the handrail. Cold as ice, it made her recoil. A chill ran up her arm and goosebumps crawled down her spine. After a deep breath, she lumbered down the stairs. Careful, Brian whispered. Although she didn't look back, Amanda could tell he was speaking to his family. Her eyelids twitched with jealousy. Brian stayed two steps behind her, shining the flashlight down at their feet. Leslie walked with one hand on her husband's shoulder and the other on Harper's head. Gripping his mom's waistband, Cameron stopped with both feet on each step before moving on to the next one, like a toddler learning how to use stairs for the first time. Every other minute, the clinking noise joined the sound of their footsteps. The flights of stairs led them down to two landings before they came across a door at the bottom of the stairwell. The door stood ajar, the dents on it, its loose handle and the bent door frame told a story of forced entry. Were they trying to get into the tunnels, Brian wondered, or out of them? He raised his shotgun and used its muzzle to push the door open. His flashlight illuminated another hallway. It was narrow, just wide enough to fit two people walking side by side. The walls were lined with old pipes, some rusted, some busted, some missing, exposed wires and air ducts. The metallic scent in the corridor was so strong he could taste it. It reminded him of blood. Every few seconds he heard a liquid plopping. It came from every angle, far and near. Again, the first thing that came to mind was blood. His eyes flicked over to the pipes upon hearing another clinking noise. Then a similar sound came from down the hall to his left, followed by a harsh groan. What? Was that a zombie? Cameron asked from behind his mother. It's just the pipes, Brian answered. He motioned to Amanda and whispered, Go ahead. Amanda complied. They walked cautiously down the corridor, plumes of dirt and dust rising from the floor with each step. All the light bulbs in the corridor had been smashed. Careful with the glass, Brian said over his shoulder to his family. They walked past a series of electrical panels. They appeared to have been sabotaged, broken covers, missing switches, Snip wires. They took a detour through a boiler room before returning to the corridor. The plopping sounds was getting louder. Brian was convinced the noise was going to lead them to the tunnels under the maintenance level. As they walked, Harper's eyes flew open and her limbs jerked in the sling. Her pacifier fell out of her mouth, but Leslie promptly shoved it back in before she could make a peep. She rocked her from side to side. Harper dozed off. Leslie slowed down and looked over her shoulder, unsure if Harper's sudden awakening was caused by her moral reflex or by a sound in the corridor. Her eyes couldn't penetrate the darkness behind them, though. She listened for someone else's footsteps, but only heard their own. Mom, Cameron whispered curiously as he grabbed her forearm. It's nothing, honey. It's nothing, she said. Let's hurry. We can't fall behind. They caught up to Brian and Amanda. After a few minutes of navigating those corridors, they chanced upon another broken door. The sign on the door read, Do not enter. Brian pushed the door open all the way. He shone his light down another flight of stairs. 
It led straight down to an open cast iron grated door. Fourteen steps, no landings. I, I don't know about this, Amanda said. We're almost there, Brian responded. We can't turn back now. But we can. This is the perfect time to turn back. For what? We're here. We can leave this city tonight. We don't know what's down there. It's fucking pitch black. It's cold and she said a bad word. Cameron squeaked out compulsively. It's creepy. I, I'm scared, okay? But what we do know is, is the way back, right? Right? We can come back during the day after we find some more flashlights and, and some more weapons and, and after you start to trust me. Trust? Brian said, brow raised. This is about trust? Leslie said, if she doesn't want to come with us, we can leave her. She can manage without us and we can do this without her. We just need to move before Harper gets cranky. If you don't trust me, how am I supposed to trust you, Amanda said. If you want to leave me here, fine, but I won't be your, your bait anymore. Brian agreed with Leslie, but he was afraid Amanda would lead a horde of baby fiends straight to them if they let her loose. Compromise was his best option. He held the flashlight out to her and said, Take it. I trust you. Amanda looked at the flashlight, then locked eyes with Brian. She looked as surprised as she was skeptical. Harper gave a little cry as if telling them it was time to move. Amanda accepted the flashlight. She pointed it down the stairs and began descending. She felt Brian's breath caressing her hair every step of the way. Through the door at the bottom of the steps, they wound up in a dark maze of tunnels with brick walls. A steady river of sewage branched out through the tunnels. Like icebergs, Carcasses infested with maggots and bones covered in rotting flesh floated in the waste. The plopping was louder and more frequent down there, drowning out Harper's whining. Which way? Amanda asked. Brian was trying to find his bearings. He knew his way around the city, but it was difficult to tell east from west while underground, especially after traveling through multiple hallways and several flights of stairs. Amanda asked, Left or right? Left or... Left, Brian interrupted. Are you sure? Brian pulled his lip into his mouth and glanced around before bringing his attention back to Amanda and saying, Yes. You don't look sure. You want to go right, hmm? You think you know the way? Amanda didn't want to take charge. She didn't even want to take responsibility for herself, so she backed off. Leslie sensed the frustration in her husband's voice. She was worried his stubbornness and desperation was going to lead them straight into the pits of hell. But like Amanda, she didn't want to take the lead. They went left, their feet splashing through the sewage. There were circular openings on the walls, drains, and ventilation shafts. The shafts were only large enough to fit one person at a time. Whooshing and hissing noises emerged from the openings, calling to them. They were tempted to investigate, but they were afraid of what was waiting for them at the end of those shafts. Traveling through the tunnels, they found collapsed tents and tattered tarps as well as shredded clothing and abandoned backpacks. They saw a wheelish shopping cart, too. A hive? Leslie asked. Brian aimed his shotgun at a tarp propped up by planks of wood and soggy cardboard boxes, watching for any lurking baby fiends. He said, No, I think this was like a homeless encampment from before the craze. Where did everybody go, Dad? Cameron asked. Thanks to the stench of decay wafting through the tunnels and the human remains floating in the sewage, Brian knew they were surrounded by dead bodies. He didn't want to overwhelm his son with more tragedy. They went home, Brian said. We should go. We have to be getting close now. The air tasted stale and the awful smell grew stronger with each step. A ray of silvery light, contaminated with dust particles, drew them to an intersection in the tunnel system. The light came from the gap on a partially open manhole. It offered them a breeze of fresh air, too, a respite from their journey. As they continued, a distant howl reached them. As if coordinated, they all turned their heads in tandem to look back down the tunnel behind them. They only heard the plopping again. A doggy? Cameron asked as he looked at his mother. She didn't have an answer for him. He noticed the fear in her big, bulging eyes, though. He squinted back into the darkness behind them. Was it a, a, a werewolf? He said. Voice vibrating with urgency, Brian said, Move it. They hurried down the passage. 
As they took a right at another intersection, Amanda said, This doesn't feel right. That last word came out of her mouth with enough intensity to echo through the tunnel. Hey, Brian hissed, keep your voice down. I think we took a wrong turn. We should stop, man. We have to. As Amanda stopped walking mid-sentence, Brian gripped her shoulder and pushed her forward. Through his bare teeth, he said, keep it down. They picked up the pace. Cameron was practically jogging to keep up with his mother. A coffin fit seized Harper. Leslie cupped her hand over the girl's mouth, trying to stop her from breathing in the dust in the air without suffocating her. Voice shaking, she said, Brian, get us out of here. Harper can't keep breathing this shit in. Brian was walking hurriedly, shoulder to shoulder with Amanda now. He felt his heart drumming away at his ribcage, each beat like the tick of a clock on a timer. He considered turning back, but every tunnel looked the same. He was starting to believe he had been leading his family in circles. The sewage sloshed as he came to a sudden halt. He yanked Amanda's shoulder, stopping her from moving forward as well. Leslie and Cameron stopped behind him, tired and confused. Harper's coughs had dwindled into whimpers. Restless, she fidgeted in the sling. Leslie gasped and teetered back as she looked over her husband's shoulder. Eyes unflinching, Brian raised his shotgun and aimed it straight ahead. A man stood there with his back to the survivors, hunched over and swinging his head as if searching for something in the sewage. The light from Amanda's flashlight revealed his mucky jeans, his black leather jacket, and the back of his shaved head. Put your hands up and turn around slowly, Brian ordered. The man stopped moving for a few seconds, then shot a glance over his shoulder. The light exposed the top half of his face, his crumpled forehead, his slight but bushy unibrow, his emotionless eyes. He turned around without raising his hands. Slowly, Brian yelled. The man's thick, unkempt beard, encrusted with dirt and blood, covered his neck. He cocked his head to the side as he stared at the survivors. A cocky smile broke on his face, partially hidden by his undergrown mustache. Brian said, get down on your knees and interlace your fingers behind your head. You a cop? The man asked in a deep, gravelly voice. Do what I say or I shoot. Former cop? I mean, don't matter if you're a cop now, does it? There ain't no laws these days. Can't arrest me for trespassing anymore, can you? But I can shoot you for standing in my way. Last warning, get down on your knees and put your hands behind your head and maybe I'll let you live. The man stared down at the sewage for a long moment, as if he were considering cooperating with him. Then he sneered at the survivors and shook his head. This ain't your jurisdiction anymore, pig, he said. You want control? Then you better stay in your little precincts, your little safe havens, your little bubbles. But you better hope they don't pop like the rest of them. Just saw one pop a few hours ago, actually. Brian stiffened up. He was part of the raid on the police station, he thought. They've been following us this whole time. The man continued. I don't have to listen to you fucking pigs anymore. This is a free country, freer than ever as a matter of fact. How it was always meant to be. Everyone for themselves, right? What's yours is yours, if you're strong enough to keep it. He stepped forward. Brian took two quick steps back while his family cowered behind him. Amanda stayed on the sidelines, eyes alternating between Brian and the mysterious man. Her arms trembled, causing the beam of light to bounce from wall to wall. Stop, Brian shouted. Don't make me do this. Leslie covered Cameron's eyes, blocked Harper's ears with her other hand as well as her chest and whispered, Shoot him. The stranger continued his approach, his smirk stretching into a full-blown grin. For every step he took, the Turners took a step back. Cameron was sniveling and shuddering all over. Shoot, Brian, Leslie said, panicked. Brian stopped retreating and shouldered his shotgun. He held his breath, gritted his teeth, and put his finger on the trigger. His family braced for the blast, waddling back while huddled together. But it didn't come. Brian narrowed his eyes as he got a better view of the stranger. Something clicked in his head. He lowered the shotgun slightly, ready to shoot at a moment's notice. Garrett? He said. The stranger stopped. Amanda looked at Brian with a puzzled expression while keeping the flashlight aimed at the mysterious man. Brian thrust the shotgun forward and, raising his voice, he asked, Are you Garrett? He glared at Amanda and said, Is that Garrett? 
Is that your husband? What the hell is this? What? 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 What are you talking about? She stammered. He's with you, isn't he? You planned this out. You set us up. No, 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 no. You brought me here. You had him follow us, didn't you? You weaseled your way into my family and you marked us. I knew you were a snake. You, you're fucking insane, man. You're just looking for a reason to, to get rid of me. You want to kill me. You've been wanting to squeeze that trigger since the moment I asked for your help. You're a psycho just like everyone else. That he is. The stranger said as he took another step forward. Shut up, Brian barked. The only difference between us is you haven't had a taste of that sweet adrenochrome. I'll blow your head off if you move again. I can see it in your eyes. You're a psycho, but your mind hasn't been set free. You're still living in the past, stuck in the old ways. I'll tell you what. You put that gun away and I'll take you to a blender. A real good one. The commercial type, you know. We'll blend that baby of yours and get you your first sip of Adreno. We'll split it, okay? There'll be plenty to go around anyway. As the stranger snickered, Leslie yelled, Shoot him! Brian aimed a shotgun at the stranger, but before he could pull the trigger, Amanda jumped in front of him with her arms outstretched. She lifted a shoulder in a half shrug and said, no hard feelings. She turned off the flashlight, leaving them in total darkness. Despite the betrayal, Brian couldn't convince himself to squeeze the trigger. He wasn't a psychopath. He only wanted to survive. He got ready to take a tackle from Amanda or the stranger. Instead, their splashing footsteps moved away from them. You took a wrong turn, he heard Amanda saying. The man said, it's a damn maze down here. What did you expect? This way, Garrett, over here, we can circle. Their voices fade away as they put some distance between themselves and the Turners. Brian had heard enough to confirm his theory, though. Amanda was a baby fiend, and the stranger in the tunnel was her partner, Garrett. He wondered if Sammy, Amanda's supposed nephew, was also wandering those lightless tunnels. Mommy! Daddy! Cameron cried, dragging out each syllable. Don't move, honey. Stay put. Leslie said over Harper's wailing. Brian, oh God, Brian, are you okay? I can't see you, Brian. Brian continued aiming the shotgun straight ahead, although he couldn't see a thing. His vision couldn't adjust to the darkness. Brian! Leslie yelled as she blindly smacked his shoulder. He ignored her, totally focused on the tunnel. Leslie hit him again, not with anger, but with desperation, and she shouted, Brian, Brian, what are you doing? What do we do? Daddy! Cameron brayed. Brian finally lowered the shotgun. He took a lighter out of his back pocket, flicked it open, then thumbed the spark wheel four times to ignite it. The flickering flame illuminated the family with a dull orange light. Except for Brian's, all of their faces were streaked with tears. They gathered around him, seeking guidance and protection. It's okay. It's okay, he said with a false air of confidence. We, we need to stay calm, okay? They're gone now. We're safe. What are we going to do? Leslie asked before shushing Harper tenderly. Between his sniffling, Cameron said, Ma, ma, mommy, I peed. His pants were drenched in urine. The piss joined the sewage soaking his socks and sneakers, too. Leslie pulled him in for a one-armed hug, trying to comfort him. Brian said, We have to keep moving. I don't wanna, Cameron complained. Leslie asked, Where can we go? We can't stay down here forever. We'll keep going west, Brian said. If we find the subway system or the culvert, great. We can stick to the plan. If we find an open manhole, fine. We can climb out of here and find somewhere to... to hide out and regroup. Either way, we can't stand around and do nothing with those bastards down here. They'll be coming back for us. I know it. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Get us out of here, please. I will. I promise. Chapter 11 Through the Darkness the Turners trudged through the sewage, each step synchronized, left, right, left, right. The wavering flame from Brian's lighter was the only source of light in the tunnel. Due to holding the shotgun with one hand, a dull ache attacked his wrist, bicep, and shoulder, so he couldn't keep the weapon steady. The family stopped at a junction and looked up. Brian strained his tired eyes, struggling to penetrate the darkness beyond the glow from his lighter. Since he couldn't see any moonlight, he assumed the manhole above, 
if there was one there, was sealed shut. He knew manhole covers were heavy, often surpassing 250 pounds, so he had no chance of opening one from below. What do you think? Leslie asked in a hushed voice. It's no good, Brian responded, matching her tone. Even if I could somehow climb up there and lift that lid, we have no idea if it's locked in place. We need to find a manhole cover that's already open, at least a little. What about the one we saw earlier? We saw light, remember? It's too dangerous to go back now. We don't know how many of them are down here or how long they've been following us. They could have used that manhole to get in here so they could be waiting for us to come out through there. We have to keep pushing forward. Although he believed in what he was saying, he was only telling her part of the truth. What he didn't want to tell her was he didn't know the way back. He was operating in survival mode, using instincts he didn't even know he had until the craze had begun. And his instincts were telling him to keep moving or face death. Leslie asked, But what if going back is the only way to get out of this place? What if they've already blocked all the exits? What if we're trapped? Brian said, One way or another, we're leaving these tunnels, even if we have to shoot or stab our way out. He looked at Cameron, who was cowering behind his mother, and he said, You hear me, Cam? Everything is going to be okay. I promise. He leaned forward and kissed his wife. He checked on Harper. She was fussy but half asleep. He kissed her forehead. Her face contoured into a frown of annoyance for a second before her drowsiness overtook her. He looked down at Cameron. He didn't have a free hand, so he wrapped one arm around him and pulled him in for a hug. Leslie and Cameron felt a spark of reassurance, but it wasn't enough to whisk away their fear of the darkness and the dangers lurking within the tunnels. With few options, they continued traveling through the labyrinth of passageways. The tunnels felt endless, each one a clone of the last. Same brick walls, same vaulted ceilings, same sewage. Wait, Brian whispered, coming to a sudden stop next to a drain on the wall. Harper cooed, Guga Wapa. Shh, Brian said. Leslie glared at him and said, If you want her to stay quiet, we have to keep moving. Shh, shh. Do you hear that? Leslie glanced around the tunnel, as if seeing the source of the noise would make it clearer. Over Harper's baby talk, she heard a liquid plopping and Cameron's congested breathing. Just as she opened her mouth to speak, an indecipherable whisper caressed her eardrums. A voice, she said, eyes growing wider and wider. Is it them? Amanda and that man? A voice? Brian repeated as he shot a concerned glance back at her. I heard footsteps. Leslie was struck with a bout of lightheadedness as a terrifying realization dawned on her. They were being surrounded. Their time was up. Her maternal instincts told her to protect her children by any means, but her legs locked up, heavy like anchors. Brian snapped the lighter closed, extinguishing the flame. In the blink of an eye, the darkness swallowed them. He pulled on Leslie's arm, turned around, then pushed her forward. Run, he shouted, his voice echoing through the passageways. He took Cameron's hand and ran forward, matching Leslie's pace. Harper awoke amidst the commotion, too bewildered to cry. The family charged through the darkness. I can't see where I'm going. I can't see a thing, Leslie yelled. She slowed down, hoping to recalibrate her balance, but Brian pushed her forward. She lurched through the tunnel, arms wrapped around Harper in case she tumbled. Cameron was stumbling behind them, struggling to keep up. Dad, you're hurting me, he cried. They crossed a junction in the tunnels. After a few steps, Brian seized Leslie's shoulder and stopped her from progressing. Over their heavy breathing, they heard sewage splashing ahead of them in the rhythm of running footsteps. They raced back to the junction and took a right. After a minute of running, they saw a sliver of moonlight. It slipped through a gap on a manhole above another intersection. They ran faster and faster and the light got brighter and brighter. They could taste the fresh air as they neared the finish line. Then, a small man leaped through a drain on the wall to their left. The baby fiend crashed into the family, knocking them back like bowling pins after a successful hit. Screaming, Leslie spun as she fell. The back of her head hit a brick wall, knocking her unconscious and splitting her scalp open. A stream of blood slithered down to the nape of her neck. Cameron landed on his hands and knees. The concrete ripped his jeans at the knees and stripped the skin off his kneecaps. Hysterical sobs racked his body, preventing him from rising to his feet. Brian fell on his ass in the sewage. Their attacker crashed to the floor in front of him, flopping in the river of filth like a fish out of water. 
His wife beater, once white, now yellow, was torn like a toga, displaying his emaciated battered rib cage. Each bone, bruised a different color, stuck out like the keys on a xylophone. His long black hair, soaked in the dirty water, shrouded his face. The baby fiend scrambled towards Leslie. He mounted her and pulled on the sling, trying to pry Harper out of it. Brian jumped up to his feet and aimed a shotgun at him, but visions of collateral damage flashed in his mind and stopped him from squeezing the trigger. Leslie and Harper were too close to avoid the blast. Stop, Brian shouted, voice laced with desperation. I'll shoot you. I'll blow your fucking head off. The guy ignored his bluffs. Leslie stirred awake, a searing pain throbbing through her head. She saw stars, and the darkness appeared to be moving like a black cloud. Experiencing a severe spell of vertigo, she felt like she was floating through space. As her vision improved, she noticed a human silhouette in front of her. Then she felt the sopping human hair touching her neck. She wrapped an arm around Harper, held her tight, and swung at the man with her other arm while kicking and screaming. Harper cried harder as the man yanked one of her arms. Fuck! Brian yelled. He ran forward, flipped the shotgun around, then rammed the butt of the weapon against the guy's head. From a cut on his scalp, blood trickled over his ear. The man fell off of Harper, moaning, not out of pain, but anger. He rolled through the sewage and sprang to his feet. He was fast but unsteady, as if trained in the arts of drunken boxing. As Brian turned the shotgun, the baby fiend took a switchblade out of his pocket. It had a broken spring, so the three-inch blade was already drawn. He bum-rushed Brian. He pushed the shotgun away before he could point it at him, then jumped and smashed his forehead against his face. Brian's bottom lip was gashed open, his gums and nose bled and his jaw popped. Disorientated, Brian slammed the side of the shotgun against the baby fiend's chest to push him back. He didn't have enough space to turn the weapon around and shoot him. Without hesitation, the baby fiend launched himself at him again. He headbutted the top of Brian's chest, hitting him right between his clavicles. As he gasped for air, the baby fiend thrust a knife at him. The blade poked a hole in him above his right hip. As it grazed his large intestine, Brian yeeped in pain and unthinkingly lifted his right leg, kneeing the baby fiend in the gut. Clutching at his stomach, the long-haired man doubled over and coughed. Brian slapped his hand over the cut on his lower abdomen. The stinging pain sent his mind into a frenzy. The blade didn't pierce his appendix or large intestine. He wasn't at risk for septus, but he still believed he was dying. It's over, it's over, it's over, his inner voice was yelling. But then his family's cries pulled him back to reality, snapping him out of his trance of self-pity. He struck the baby fiend's face with the butt of the shotgun, shattering his nose and cracking a cheekbone. He pushed him with all of his might, sending him reeling away. The guy's legs tangled and he plummeted it to the floor. He landed on his back in sewage. As if fueled by an unlimited supply of adrenaline, the baby fiend immediately started getting up. As he got halfway to his feet, Brian shot him. The deafening blast reverberated through the tunnel system and lit up the passageway with a yellowish flash for a second. The baby fiend's chest burst open, blood gushing out of the gaping wound like projectile vomit. Fragments of his pulverized ribs and sternum hit the surrounding walls and plopped in the sewage. Punctured by the pellets and shards of bone, his lungs collapsed and his heart was riddled with holes. The bottom half of his heart had been jellyfied, strings of gelatinous muscle trooping into his abdominal cavity. A few pellets broke his thoracic vertebrae in two places and severed his spinal cord in another. He toppled back, plunging into the sewage. His legs twitched while his head bobbed in the filthy water like a rubber duck in a bath. A painful ringing drilled into the survivor's ears, making their heads ache. Cameron was laying on his stomach with his hands over his ears, feet submerged in the polluted water. Leslie had rolled onto her side, turning her back to her husband and using her body to protect Harper. They sang a chorus of bellows and blubbers. Harper's cries were the shrillest, though. Surprised by the noise, Brian had dropped the shotgun. When he picked it up, dirty water mixed with chunky excrement spouted out of the barrel. He paid it no mind. He pumped the shotgun, dispensing the used shell. Dazed by a debilitating headache, he hobbled over to the down baby fiend. Don't, don't move, he said. He could hardly hear his voice over the thrumming in his ears. As he closed in on him, he noticed a sinkhole of flesh on his chest was filling up with blood. The baby fiend's long hair floated on the surface of the sewage, encircling his head. Despite the darkness, he could tell their attacker wasn't a man. He was a zit-faced teenager with patchy peach fuzz on his upper lip and cheeks. Brian felt the coldness of guilt chill his blood. 
He had acted in self-defense, but it was his first time hurting a kid. It didn't feel right. He believed he was staring at Amanda's nephew, Sammy. The long hair, scheme physique, short stature, it all checked out. He wondered how many other teenage baby fiends were roaming the streets. Are there any as young as Cameron, he thought. Like an elderly man without a cane, he doddered back to his family. Leslie screamed as he touched her back. As she wailed, Harper's face reddened and crumpled like a wrinkled tomato. It's me, Brian said. We have to go. Leslie's ears were still ringing, so she couldn't hear him. The nasty blow to the back of her head didn't help. She took a blind swing at him and tried to scoot away. Brian took a hold of her arm and said, Hey, it's me, Leslie, it's me. She stopped resisting him. She looked back at him, eyes as wide as humanly possible. She could scarcely make out his face through the darkness. Brian, she said, we have to go. He helped her up, woozy and nauseated. She leaned back against the wall to stop herself from collapsing. Despite the pain, she forced a smile and shushed Harper, trying to comfort her. Brian pulled his son up to his feet and checked on his injuries. Cameron's knees hurt, but nothing was broken. An arm around Leslie and eye on Cameron, Brian led his family forward. They limped towards the moonlight. At the intersection, up the shaft, there was a partially open manhole. A rusty ladder on the wall led up to the exit. I, I can't m make it, Leslie mumbled, sounding sick. Take Harper and Cam, go. She tried to unbuckle the sling, but Brian grabbed her wrist and pulled her arm away. He said, stop it. I'm not leaving you. M mommy I want to stay with you, Cameron whined. No one's staying. We're leaving together. Splashing footsteps and quiet voices came from every tunnel. Brian ushered his family down the passageway to their left. He attempted to lead them away from the noise, but the footsteps grew louder and voices clearer. This way, a woman said. Halfway down another tunnel, Leslie lost her balance and crashed into a wall. Brian gave her ten seconds to catch her breath. Then he hooked his arm around hers and pulled her forward. They reached another junction. The footsteps to their left told them to go right. As they barreled down the tunnel, a sudden flash of white light blinded them. Brian's first thought, Amanda. Stop, a man commanded. Don't take another step. Another man shouted, If you even blink, we'll pop your eyes out. Brian wasn't ready for a shootout. One arm around Leslie, his shotgun was aimed at the floor. Cameron peeked out from behind his father's leg. Harper spit up some milk on Leslie's chest, then went back to bawling. The first guy said, You better stop that baby from crying before you get us all killed. Wait a second, Brian said, squinting against the light. Donald? There was no response. Brian shushed Harper, then took a step forward. He had recognized the man's voice. Donald, he repeated. Donald Stevens? It's Brian from the precinct. Don't shoot! Again, the men didn't respond. The silence verified Brian's suspicion, though. He knew he was speaking to Donald. Cameron glanced over his shoulder upon hearing some footsteps in the distance. Dad, he said, as he pulled on his father's pant leg. Donald asked, They got into the police station? Brian said, Yes, you were right. We need help. Are you the ones who's been shooting up the place? They're following us. I... I killed. The word blocked Brian's throat, smothering his voice. He choked down the lump of anxiety in his throat to clear it. He said, I got one. There are others. A man, a woman, maybe more. The guy next to Donald said something, but his voice was indistinct. Donald said, Listen carefully, Brian. You cannot and will not follow us. Not like this. If you attempt to do so, we will gun you down. Leslie drew a shaky, frightened gasp. Harper was panting, exhausted from all her crying, while Cameron stared unblinkingly down the passageway behind them. The footsteps closed in on them. What? Brian shouted. Donald said, Keep your... We're here because of you! You told us to come here, you fucking bastard! Keep your voice down, damn it! What about my daughter, my son? Brian said, lowering his voice not to respect Donald's wishes, but because he was fighting tears. You're going to leave us out here to die? For what? What the hell did we do to deserve this? 
It's not personal. If you follow us, they'll follow us. We might be able to shoot them, but if we don't kill them, they'll be back and they'll overrun us. I'm sorry, but it has to be this way. Get out of here. Daddy, I see something, Cameron blurted out. Eyes on the light, Brian said, Help Leslie. Take Harper and Cam. I can hold them off. I'll do whatever it... Brian! Leslie interrupted. At the last second, Brian heard a barrage of footsteps behind him. In one swift movement, he spun around and squeezed the shotgun's trigger. Instead of a blast, there was a click. No ammo. Before he knew it, the gun was flying away from him, and he was plummeting to the floor after a brutal tackle. He landed in the sewage, waves of dirty water rippling every which way. Garrett mounted him, knees under his armpits. He gripped his neck to choke him and pin him down. With his other hand, a fist like a brick, rough and rugged, he swung away at Brian's face. It took three punches to remind Brian that he was capable of fighting back. While thrashing under him, he swung at the sides of Garrett's torso. The baby fiend absorbed the punches without flinching. After Garrett's sixth punch, the bridge of Brian's nose cracked open like pavement after an earthquake. Blood spewed from the wound, splattering on his cheeks and forehead. Meanwhile, Amanda threw her body against Leslie's, slamming her against the wall. Leslie pushed back, but she was still dizzy from her head injury, so she was easily overpowered. Amanda pressed her forearm against Leslie's neck to hold her against the wall, using just enough pressure to obstruct her breathing, but not quite enough to crush her windpipe. With the dull thud of each punch playing behind her, Amanda said, I don't want to kill you. No, 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 sirree, you're too valuable. Too rare. You'd be perfect for a factory, you see. But we don't got time to take you now. We'll be back for you, though. No matter where you go, we'll find you. For now, let's trade, yeah? Give me the baby, and I'll let you keep the boy. What do... Cameron chomped hard on her thigh. His teeth ripped through her jeans, his canines piercing her skin. Ow! she yelped. Taking her arm off Leslie's neck, she turned and backhand Cameron. One of his baby teeth, a canine, fell from his mouth as he staggered back. Leslie wheezed, her breath coming in short, whistly gasp. Back against the wall, she slid down to the floor. Face wet with tears, Cameron jumped at Amanda again. He missed his bite, getting a mouthful of the stale air instead. She kicked him in the chest. Cameron grimaced and fell into the sewage ass first, heaving for air. Amanda took a pocket knife out of her jacket pocket and opened it, drawing a puny two-inch blade. She looked at the boy and said, Try that again and I'll rip your fucking head off, brat. Run! Leslie shouted as she rolled onto her knees and elbows. She made sure to keep her weight off of Harper while using her body to protect her. Voice breaking, she cried, B Baby, go! Run, Cam! M -m mommy no! Cameron whimpered. Amanda pulled on Leslie's shoulder, but she couldn't force her up or flip her over. So she plunged the knife into Leslie's thigh. As her victim screeched, Amanda leaned close to her ear and said, Don't make me do this. I really don't want to kill you. No, no way. The world is running out of good women like you and me. She wiggled the knife, widening the wound, then tore it out. A squirt of blood shot out, and Leslie screamed louder. Amanda said, Oh, you, you don't take me seriously because you think you're better than me, huh? Okay, I'll show you I mean business. You see what your boy, that little bitch, did to me? I'm going to cut you up. One stab for every tooth in his mouth. Now, thrusting the blade at Leslie's thigh and pausing with each word, she said, Give me the baby. Haunted by his mother's cries, Cameron glanced at his father, who was still being pummeled, and yelled, Help! Then he looked at the light down the tunnel and repeated, Help! Brian's swollen face was a mask of blood. Contributing to the blood bubbling from his nose, he bled from a cut on his cheekbone and another in his inner cheek. He felt Garrett's long, jagged yellow fingernails digging into his neck. Realizing he couldn't hurt him with his fists, he started searching for a weapon. There was an ice pick in his waistband, but he couldn't reach it over the baby fiend's legs. So he groped around in the sewage, grabbing fistfuls of feces and balls of sodden tissue. He chucked a wet, decayed rat at Garrett. It flew over the guy's shoulder. With his other hand, he touched something hard in the sewage. 
He wrapped his fingers around and swung it at the baby fiend. There was a loud thwack. Garrett fell off of him, holding his palm against the right side of his forehead. Blood leaked out from a gash above his eyebrow. He got up shakily, fell backward on the floor, then picked himself up again. Brian wobbled to his feet, swaying and spitting blood. He felt like he was standing in a spinning tunnel in an amusement park, walls turning like a clock around him. He cringed as he looked down at his left hand. Although his vision had been invaded by a red haze due to the blood in his eyes, he could see he was holding a human bone, a discolored humerus. The idea of using someone else's remains as a weapon sickened him, but it worked, and that was good enough for him. Contaminated water and crap clogged his ears, so his hearing was muffled. Over his family screaming, he heard Donald's voice. He only caught one word coming out of the man's mouth. Way. This way, Brian thought. Come this way, go that way. He couldn't think straight. As he blinked the blood out of his eyes, he noticed a knife in Amanda's hand. She had just stabbed Leslie's thigh for the eighth time, yet Leslie refused to roll over and give up Harper. No, Brian yelled as he stumbled towards them. Growling, Garrett rushed towards him. Brian swung the bone, landing a solid blow to the guy's shoulder, but it didn't slow his momentum. Garrett crashed into him, slamming the top of his head against Brian's chest like a head-butting goat. Brian fell back. The back of his head hit the curved edge of a shaft on the wall. He dropped the bone and crumbled to the floor. His scalp tingled, his vision tripled, and his head gyrated limply. Time slowed to a crawl. He saw Garrett preparing to stomp on his face, raising his knee as high as physically possible. Then a gunshot rang out. Brian saw Garrett lurching away before he slipped out of consciousness. He awoke a few seconds later. The white light was brighter, washing over his vision. No, he heard his wife yell. Stop! Garrett, hurry, Amanda said. Harper unleashed a tired but hoarse squawk. Over some splashing footsteps, Donald shouted, I don't have a clear shot. Get out! Mid-sentence, Brian's eyes rolled back, and he blacked out once more. Chapter 12. The Way Back Brian awoke to a warm sensation rushing through his left ear canal. Head down and cocked to the side, chin against his chest, sewage water spilling out of his left ear. His hearing faded in. Leslie's dreadful shrieks, throaty, grating, pained, ignited a burst of pins and needles within him. She sounded breathless, losing strength with each sob. He leaned forward, away from the wall behind him, and glanced around. The tunnel was darker where he was sitting. He heard a distinct whooshing sound through the shaft on the wall above him. He blinked until he went from seeing triple to double. He saw Donald crouching next to Leslie. The man had trimmed his beard and hair since leaving the precinct. Cameron was kneeling beside his mother, sniveling as he applied pressure to her stabbed thigh with both hands. A man stood next to Donald, holding a flashlight in one hand and a handgun in the other. Reaching down to his shoulders, a mop of long black hair escaped his baseball cap. The man pointed his flashlight in Brian's direction, keeping a lookout. He lowered his gun a little upon noticing Brian. He said, He's awake. Brian pushed himself up to his feet. He moved from side to side as if standing in a speeding train. He could hardly hear through his right ear, so he stuck his finger in it. He felt a sharp pain deep inside. When he took his finger out, his hearing improved, but his fingertip was covered in chunky shit. With heavy, unsteady steps, he approached the other survivors. Daddy, Cameron cried, staying by his mother's side. Donald walked up to Brian and said, Sit down. What? What happened? Brian stuttered. You were knocked out. Your head got banged up. It ain't pretty. Sit. Who... Who are you? Brian asked as he turned his attention to the man with the flashlight. Are you one of... one of them? His name's Ben, Donald explained. He's with me. He's good people, okay? I was, uh... Uh, my fucking head. I... I was knocked out. How long's it been? You know, it's hard keeping track of time these days. Especially down here. Probably fifteen or twenty minutes. Close to the thirty, Ben chimed in. Donald tapped Brian's chest and said, Listen, you need to sit down. There's something you have to... Brian stopped listening as his eyes homed in on Leslie. She was curled up in a ball, her feet submerged in the sewage. He spied the baby sling on the floor under her, its straps severed. 
Harper was nowhere in sight. Eyes bugging out, he looked down the tunnel behind his family, then over his shoulder as if he was expecting to find his daughter taking a stroll by herself. Where's Harper? he asked. He tried to elbow his way past Donald, but the guy grabbed his arm and pushed him back. They grappled for a moment before Brian yielded, unable to overpower him. Where's Harper? he repeated, voice tightening. I'm sorry, Leslie rasped. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was all she could say. But Brian had seen and heard enough to piece everything together. His daughter had been kidnapped. He said, no. 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 Donald clasped a hand over his shoulder and said, you need to calm your ass down. You and your wife were most likely concussed. We need to get you to a nurse and... You let them do this. You let them get away with this. With her. Why did you tell me to come here? You were going to leave us to die. Why? Why, you fucking... Listen to me, damn it. Donald snapped as he gave Brian's shoulder a good shake. You're only alive because of us. We could have left you here as a distraction and snuck off when they showed up. But I decided to help you. I shot that cycle before you could stomp your face in. And now I'm risking everything. My safety. Ben's, the whole colonies, by staying here with you. So stop wasting our damn time. We can take you to safety, but you need to work with us. And, Ben said, before pausing and taking a big gulp of air and adding, You need to forget about the girl. Brian's head swung to and fro, as if every word out of Ben's mouth were a jab from a boxer. He shambled back, his bloodied face filled with shock and awe. No, my baby. My baby, Leslie whimpered. She was already grieving for Harper. She had cried and screamed herself into a state of lethargy. The bleeding from her thigh only made things worse. For the briefest moment, Brian considered cutting their losses and taking up Donald on his offer. Then memories of Harper shuffled through his mind. The day of her birth. Her first cry. Her first toothless smile. Her first giggle. He uttered a noisy, trembly groan as he crashed into the wall behind him, eyes tearing up. He slapped the side of his head three times as if trying to knock some sense into himself. I can't leave her. I can't. I can't, he whispered to himself. Donald approached him and laid a gentle, comforting hand on his shoulder. He said, I'm sorry. I really am. I wish I would have acted earlier, but I was thinking about the others. I was right, Brian. There are hundreds of people in the subway system. I couldn't jeopardize their safety for... For the four of you without knowing how many of those baby fiends were down here. How many of them knew you were down here. You get what I'm saying? You... Could have... Shot them, Brian said haltingly. You could have just... Walked up to them and shot them. It was risky. We had no idea if they were armed... If they were using you to lure us into an ambush, if... Jesus, man, when I told you to come here, I told you to come with your family. I didn't tell you to bring a pack of them with you. Although anger continued to fester within him, Brian understood Donald's decision. He began to blame himself for trusting Amanda in the first place. Donald said, look, I know this isn't easy. I know this isn't what you want to hear, but there's nothing we can do about the girl. We can patch you and your wife up we can feed you, all of you. We can make sure your son never has to see anything like this again. But if we're going to go, we need to go now. Brian looked at Leslie and Cameron. Harper was the smallest member of their family, but her absence left the biggest hole in their lives. I have to get her back, he said. What? Donald responded, one eye narrowed. You're not listening. You could be concussed. You're in no condition to go out there. They're taking her to a... a blender. They'll need time to prepare her too. And if they don't... if they don't... use her now, they'll freeze her for later, like the babies at Alberto's Market. Alberto's Market? That'll take some time. You said I was out for 20 to 30 minutes. They couldn't have gone far. I can still save her. Donald saw the fierce resolve in Brian's eyes. And a gnawing ache for vengeance. He admired his love for his family. Brian said, Take Leslie and Cam to safety. I'll get Harper and... No, Leslie interrupted. I'll bring her back here. I'll make sure we're not fall next time. I'm not going to ask you to wait in these tunnels all day, but I'll call out to you when I get here. Stay close, please. I'm coming with you, Brian, Leslie said. 
I have to come with you. She needs me. As she stood up, her stabbed leg gave out and she fell against a shaft in the wall. A jet of warm blood ran down her leg. Cameron saw big drops of blood jumping out of the stab wounds. He bolted into action and put his hands over her thigh, following the directions Donald had given him earlier while Brian was unconscious. I need to move fast, Les, Brian said. I'm sorry, but I need to do this alone. She's my daughter. I know, I know, but I'm the only one who can do this. We only have a little bit of time. I'm her only chance. I'll bring her back to you, I swear. She, she needs me, Leslie said defeatedly. I'll go with you, Dad, Cameron said. The kid tried to put on a brave face, but he was obviously scared shitless. His cheeks blushed, his lips quivered, and he appeared to have pissed himself. Again. Brian said, you have to take care of Mom, and Mom's going to take care of you. You don't want to leave Mom all alone, right? You're really going to do this? Donald asked. I am. You make sure they get to safety and they get patched up. Donald puckered his lips and nodded, then said, Okay, okay, I'm not going to stop you. You should know I shot the guy, the one who attacked you. He's not bleeding out, but he's bleeding enough. He took a spare flashlight out of his pocket and handed it to Brian. He said, He left a trail of blood straight down this tunnel. He took that first left down there. I was going to follow him and put him down, but I didn't want to leave your family unattended. Didn't think it would be wise to shoot at them while they were holding your kid either. Follow the blood and you'll find your girl. As Brian approached his family, he felt a twinge from the cut above his hip, head pounding from the beating he had forgotten about the stabbing. He put his hand over the cut and played it off so as not to worry his family. He crouched and hugged them. Cameron cried into his shoulder while Leslie bawled into his chest and apologized repeatedly. They felt like they were saying their final goodbyes. Brian faked a smile to create a semblance of confidence and said, I'll be back with Harper. I promise. We'll all be together again soon. Wait for us. Take care of each other. I'm so sorry, Leslie said. Shh, don't say that. It's not your fault. I need her back. She'll be hungry soon. So hungry. We'll be back soon. He kissed her, then planned a kiss on Cameron's forehead. He patted his son's hair before walking away. One last thing, Brian, Donald spoke up. He drew the revolver from the holster on his belt, spun it around so that he was holding it by its barrel, and held it out in front of him. He said, five rounds left. Make them count. Thank you, Brian said as he accepted the gun. Good luck. Brian took one final glance at his family before jogging off. On his way down the tunnel, he heard Leslie's whines as Donald helped her up. As he took a left at the junction, he heard Cameron's soft, frightened voice say, Daddy, I love you. Chapter 13 Manhole to Hell Suds of foamy, bloody saliva flying out from between his clamped teeth with each exhale, Brian climbed a ladder up a shaft. Although dim, the light pouring through the opening above triggered a splitting headache. He felt blood oozing out of the cut on his lower abdomen with each rail he climbed, too. At the top, he dragged himself out of an open manhole. Winded, he crawled away from the opening. The sun was just beginning to rise, murky rays of orange light shining between the skyline. Between his sewage-encrusted hands, he spied a smattering of blood on the pavement. It glistened in the faint sunlight, crimson, almost black. Fresh, he thought. He glanced around the empty street. There was a row of houses to his right and a park to his left. There were no signs of life. A clang, like the sound of a metal trash can lid hitting the ground reverberated through the street. He scampered behind a sedan abandoned on the side of the road. He squatted next to it, back against the driver's door, and took the revolver out of his waistband. Aiming the gun at the sky, he listened for any approaching baby fiends, but only heard the whooshing of the wind and leaves crinkling in the park across the road. While inspecting the street, his eyes landed on the sedan's side-view mirror. In his reflection, he noticed his teeth were now crooked, knocked out of place during the brawl in the tunnel. One of his incisors was chipped. He wondered if he had swallowed a piece of enamel without knowing it. Columns of blood streaked his face like the red stripes on the American flag. As a head rush hit him, Brian realized he was holding his breath. 
He let out a long, steady exhale and lowered his gun. He looked down at himself. The revolver vibrated with his trembling arm. Fear opened the door to doubt, but the first thought of his daughter quickly expelled those emotions from his mind. He cast his gaze down at the pavement and noticed another fresh bloodstain. Struck by a shaft of sunshine, it was more vibrant than the spot next to the manhole. In a half crouch, he followed the trail of blood down a sidewalk. He stayed low, hiding between the abandoned cars parked on the side of the road to his left and the fences in front of the houses to his right. He stopped at an intersection. Blood was splattered across several of the crosswalk's white stripes. He couldn't tell if it was fresh, but he didn't see any other trails, so he decided to follow it. It led him down another block. Halfway down the street, he came across a wrecked van. The sliding door's window had been completely demolished. Bloodied shards of glass littered the sidewalk next to the van. The sliding door was painted red, as if a waterfall of blood had spilled across it. Facing the possibility of losing the baby fiend's trail, the urge to blurt his daughter's name came on strong. He couldn't afford to attract any attention, though. He wanted to find Garrett and Amanda to rescue his daughter, but he didn't want the other baby fiends in the area to find him. Don't be stupid, Brian murmured to himself. He continued down the sidewalk. Through a leafy, sloshing tree branch obstructing the sidewalk, he could see another intersection. He crawled beneath the branch, then returned to a half-crouch. After a few steps, a clank, like a piece of kitchenware falling in a sink, came from his right. He dove to the ground, Google-eyed with his hands over his head, as if a shootout had just erupted. Chest against the floor, he felt his heart kick into high gear. It ran so fast that he felt like a jackhammer was boring into the slab of sidewalk beneath him. He waited and listened. More whooshing wind. More crinkling leaves. He rose to his feet and, head swiveling, he checked out the area. He peeked over the sedan parked to his left. The houses across the street were quiet. He looked straight ahead. The wreckage of a head-on collision involving a pickup truck and a hatchback blocked the intersection. He stopped turning his head as he faced the house to his right. His eyes nearly popped out of his skull. A bearded, shaggy-haired man stood at an open window on the first floor of the house. He was shirtless, revealing his bony torso. Due to his sickly gray parlor, the blood smeared on his lips and neck and chest stood out. He appeared to be standing in the home's kitchen. He stared dumbly at Brian, mouth slightly ajar. Brian aimed his revolver at him. He was ready to shoot, finger on the trigger, but the baby fiend didn't react to the weapon. He just kept staring at him, unafraid, uninterested. Brian couldn't tell how many baby fiends were in that house or in any of the others. Refusing to expose his position, he sidestepped away while keeping the gun pointed at the baby fiend. As Brian walked in front of the neighboring house, the attic stuck his head out of the window. He didn't pursue him, though. Brian continued slinking away while occasionally glancing over his shoulder, staying alert for any signs of an ambush. After losing sight of the baby fiend, he turned around and hustled down the street. There was plenty of blood at the intersection due to the head-on collision. There were no bodies around, though. Brian couldn't tell if any of the blood had come from Garrett. It all looked the same now. Beyond the wreckage, he saw two men walking his way in the distance. One of them was holding a baseball bat. Brian looked to his left, then over his shoulder, and then to his right. He felt like he was running through a maze of identical streets and houses. Staying on the sidewalk, he hurried down the street to his right. Buck naked, a guy stepped out of the house and yawned. He had thick, frizzy, graying hair on his scalp, on his jaw, on his crotch. He held a blood-stained can of beer in one hand and a woman's decapitated head in the other. His genitals, flaccid and unscathed, were drenched in dark blood. Walking sideways like a scorpion, Brian aimed his revolver at him. He heard Donald's voice in his head. Five rounds left. The nude man scoffed and said, Do it, chump. From the corner of his eye, Brian saw the other baby fiends reach the wreckage down the street. They were following him at a leisurely pace, as if unworried about losing track of him. Brian barreled down the sidewalk. Someone blew a two-finger whistle behind him. At the next intersection, he saw men walking towards him down the streets to his left and right. He ran straight forward. After passing five houses, he found himself at another intersection. 
The street to his right was blocked by a barricade made up of an overturned city bus, which appeared to have been toasted by a fire. Totaled sedans, damaged bicycles stacked on top of each other, and heaps of garbage. Down the street ahead of him and to his left, he saw more baby fiends heading towards him. He ran diagonally across the intersection and entered the parking lot of a shopping plaza. The baby fiends converged on him. While jogging, he swung his revolver around, hoping to fend them off with the weapon. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. He counted eleven baby fiends closing in on him. Five rounds. Donald's words played in his head once more. Heavily outnumbered, shooting his way out wasn't an option. He zigged and zagged his way through the parking lot, trying to find a way back to the street, but the addicts blocked his path each time. They cackled, they whistled, they lunged at him while swinging pipes and baseball bats, but they didn't attack him. Brian slowed his jog to a brisk walk as a terrifying revelation hit him. They weren't just closing in on him. They were hurting him. They wanted him to go to the shopping plaza. It was too late for him to turn back. He had reached the plaza's main entrance. Although the building was still standing, the burger joint out front had been torched. Brian walked past it. He recognized the plaza. It was an outdoor outlet mall at the outskirts of town. The walkways were lined with stores and stalls, selling everything from designer brands to hot dogs. All the stores had been trashed and looted. Baby fiends took shelter in some of the shops, turning clothing racks and shelves into forts. He passed a section of the plaza that had been razzed to the ground. Although the fire wasn't recent, the reek of smoke lingered in the air. Skeletal remains stuck out of the charred debris and piles of ashes. Every now and then he did a 360 and watched out for any surprises. The baby fiend stalked him to the shopping center. Brian ended up in the plaza's food court, his face hardened and his body locked up. Fuck me, he whispered. Chapter 14 His Lordship At the center of the food court, rectangular lunch tables were stacked atop each other like a pyramid, five tables high. At the top of the pyramid, a peculiar man sat on a peculiar chair. The man. He was only wearing a pair of navy pants and black boots. His utility belt resembled a police officer's, but his holster was empty. Instead, he had modified the belt with three sheaths, one for a skinning knife, another for a dagger with a tanned blade, and the last one was for a large bowie knife. Compared to most of the other baby fiends, he looked surprisingly fit. He had a pasty complexion, Blue veins protruding across his skin like rivers running down a snowy mountain. Scars, thin and wide, faded and dark, raised and indented, molted his chest and arms. Shiny burned scars of all shapes and sizes covered his abdomen. Stitched to his scalp was a steel wire. He wore a woman's amputated breasts on his head like a crown. The grain decomposing tit jiggled with his slightest movement. Blood ringed the breast at the base. On the right side of his head, parts of his pierced scalp were infected, red and swollen and oozing a green pus. On the other side of his head, a thick yellow goop slid out from under the severed tit and wire like egg yolk. The chair. It was an amalgamation of human remains, planks of wood and steel pipes and nails and rope fused together to form a seat. Human legs were used for the chair's legs, and human arms for the armrests. Dainty hands, palms up, stuck out of the ends of the armrests. On the left armrest, he kept a can of vanilla Coke, using a hand as a cup holder. On the other armrest, he held the severed arm's hand as if he were on a date with someone. Although the baby fiends chatted amongst themselves all around him, Brian focused on the man atop the pyramid. He had never been so scared in his life. The man on the human chair cleared his throat, silencing the other baby fiends in an instant. Then, in a rather soothing voice, he said, Welcome to my lair. This is a safe place for men like you and me. I'd advise you to put that gun away, slowly, if you want to keep it that way. Brian looked down at his right hand. He had forgotten he was holding a revolver. He glanced around. The baby fiend surrounded him from every corner, blocking every possible exit. On top of the buildings enclosing the food court, 
men were perched like gargoyles along the edge of the roofs. To the left and right of the pyramid of tables, there were cages. They were taken from a veterinarian's office across the street. In the cage to Brian's left, there was a middle-aged brunette woman with bruises all over her curvy but malnourished body. There were bald spots across her head. A young, half-starved blonde woman was stuffed into the other cage. She could have passed for a teenager. The prisoners were naked and unconscious. Thick tufts of hair sprouted from their crotches and armpits. They almost didn't fit inside of the cages, arms and legs pressed up against the chain-link doors. The peculiar man on the chair said, I have no intentions of harming you. If we wanted to kill you, we would have done it as soon as you climbed out of that manhole. Brian swallowed hard, smothering a gasp. They've been watching me this whole time, he thought. Are Amanda and Garrett with them? Is Harper here? He dragged his gaze across the food court once more, searching for the kidnappers. I am allowing you to keep that gun on you as a gesture of goodwill, the peculiar man continued. We could take it from you by force, and we'd take your hand with it while we're at it. Brian didn't have much of a choice. He raised his empty hand up in surrender, then tucked the revolver into his waistband. I appreciate your cooperation, the peculiar man said. Allow me to introduce myself. I am the Lord of Flesh. I am king of this world, ruler of this lair, eater of all horrors. You may address me as your lordship or king or sire. Now, what would you like me to call you, my esteemed guest? Brian couldn't remember his own name. There was only one question on his mind. What kind of sick game is this psycho playing? The blonde woman awoke with a throaty gasp. Her eyes bulged out as she noticed Brian. She pushed her face up against the cage door and screamed, Help, please, please, I'm begging you, I, I'm begging, don't leave me here. Her voice was so hoarse that it hurt Brian just to listen to her. He felt her agony, physical and emotional, her sheer desperation and her unadulterated fear. Although he had never seen her before, he felt like he knew her. She reminded him of all the other survivors he had encountered since the craze began. Silence her, the Lord of Flesh ordered. A man stomped over to the cage with a stun baton in hand. With the press of a switch, the tip of the weapon sparked and crackled. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the woman cried, sliding to the back of the cage. F Forgive me, your lordship, please, I'm... The man thrust the baton through the cage door and shocked her. He held it down against her flat chest. She convulsed, making the cage rattle loudly. She fell unconscious after 15 seconds. The silence returned. The other woman didn't awaken during the commotion. The Lord of Flesh said, Where was I? Oh, yes, you, our esteemed guest. What shall I call you? Brian, the visitor answered. He was surprised to hear the truth coming out of his own mouth. At heart, he knew he was only cooperating because he didn't want to end up like the women. Welcome to our hive, Brian, the Lord of Flesh said. As I was saying, you're in a safe place now. All men are welcome here, even the traitors. So long as they renounce their old ways and accept our beliefs. And what are our beliefs, you ask? Simple. All men are created equal. And all women are whores. Sacks of flesh for our pleasure and our consumption, brainless dolls for us to play with and take apart, slaves to our whim and incubators of our seed. We, you and I, and him, and him, and him are everything. They are nothing. Sickened by the psychopath's speech, Brian couldn't find the words to respond. The Lord of Flies, however, mistook his dread and disgust for all in adoration. I see you're admiring my throne, he said as he stood up. He took a walk around it, as if showing it off. He explained, It's modular, 
designed for easy upgrades, had to be this way. The human body is resilient, but it can't fight decomposition forever. We snip a piece here, cut something there, and then we're ready to replace any rotting pieces. You can't see that seat from down there, but look at this backrest. Looks comfortable, doesn't it? Although we use different pieces, I can assure you the seat has the same premium cushioning. So, so comfy. Brian could see the backrest now. It was made from a woman's torso. When he mentioned cushioning, the Lord of Flesh was referring to the torso's breasts. From below, Brian could see the curves of an ass on the seat. It was made from several female pelvises sewn together. The Lord of Flesh said, Don't be scared. We only use the finest female anatomy from my throne. You are perfectly safe. Remember, you are welcome here. In fact, why don't you come up and give this seat a whirl? Best seat in the house, I can guarantee you that. N no, thank you, Brian stuttered. The Lord of Flesh glared at him, eyes getting sharper by the second. The man with the stun baton took a step towards their guest. Brian looked at him, then at the blonde woman in the cage, and then up at the Lord of Flesh. No, thank you, your lordship, he said. The Lord of Flesh continued to scowl at him for five seconds before cracking a smile and saying, Maybe next time, then. So, what is the purpose of your visit today, Brian? I'm passing through. I was told you came out of a sewer. Where are you coming from? Out of town. Out of town, the Lord of Flesh repeated as he walked behind the chair. He leaned over its backrest, his elbows on the torso's shoulder, and his chin hovering over the stump of its neck. He said, You're going to need to be more specific than that. Where did you come from, and what were you doing underground? I was, um, I'm sorry, sire, but I can't remember exactly where I came from. I've been traveling from city to city for a while, I spent last night in a sewer because I thought it was safer than settling down on someone else's, um, property. I was wrong. I was attacked and robbed down there. They almost killed me. Hmm. That explains all of that yummy, yummy blood on your face, the Lord of Flesh said, smirking. Aside from your, let's call it, machismo, what did they take from you? Excuse me? You said you were robbed. What did those dirty robbers take from you? Brian took a peek down at himself. He didn't want to get caught in a lie, so he didn't want to tell him that he had lost something currently in his possession. He looked back at the peculiar man and said, A backpack. It had all of my food and maps and medicine and mementos in it. There was a period of tense silence. The Lord of Flesh was analyzing Brian's answers and body language, searching for any telltale signs of lying, inconsistent stories, a lack of eye contact, facial tics. He returned to the front of his throne, but he didn't sit. He asked, When was your last dose? Of what? Brian responded. That sweet, tangy adreno, of course. I'm sorry, your lordship, but I'm not like that. I'm only trying to survive. Is that so? Now that's a nice change of pace. We welcome men from all walks of life here, but it gets tiring dealing with the fiends at times. There's nothing worse than an adreno freak when those withdrawals hit. I won't pretend like I don't partake in the blending and the chugging, but I can hold my baby juice. The blonde woman awoke, moaning and squirming. The Lord of Flesh said, but I digress. Tell me, Brian, where do you plan on going now, or would you like to stay with us? We have plenty of room. I could always use more level-headed men like yourself by my side. Brian said, I can't stay, sire. I need my backpack. They took everything from me. I need to take it back. I need revenge. Revenge! 
Oh, I like you more and more every time you open your mouth. How did you know I have an affinity for vengeance? I can't get enough of it. Even before this whole craze started, I was spearheading the crusade against mankind's greatest determinant. Women. They had shunned and abused men like us for ages. It was time for us to return that abuse tenfold. No, a hundredfold. Fold. Yeah, a man behind Brian hollered. Someone on a roof whistled. The Lord of Flesh resumed his speech. An eye for an eye is getting even. You want revenge? If she takes an eye, you gouge both of hers out. If she takes a tooth, you tear her fucking jaw out. And you do the same to her mother and her daughter and her sisters. You decimate her female lineage the response must be greater far far greater than the offense that is true vengeance the spectators erupted in applause the lord of flesh dropped onto his throne and soaked it in thinking about his wife and daughter brian was revolted but with the minutes ticking away he knew he didn't have time to argue with him the blonde woman was curled into a ball now sobbing into her hands as the cheering subsided the Lord of Flesh said, True vengeance requires raw anger. If you're going to get revenge, my friend, you better reach inside yourself, deep inside, and find that bestial rage within, the anger, the true nature of man that you were unwittingly brainwashed to bury as a child. I can help you find your true self. I can lead you to enlightenment. I appreciate the offer, Brian said, hesitant. But I can't stay, your lordship. What? You think I'm incapable of teaching you? Of illuminating your mind? Can't you feel my fury? No. Let me tell you a story then. When I was... Sire, I have to... Do not interrupt me, the lord of flesh barked. Brian staggered back, caught off guard by the man's monstrous voice. He looked around. The other spectators were snarling at him. Breathing heavily, the lord of flesh said, when I was a child, my mother, Satan rape her soul, tried to beat me into submitting to the matrix of the matriarch. She wanted to control every moment of my life. She used abuse of every kind to try to smother the, the warrior within me. She started with slaps and jabs, moved on to belts and sandals. Then she started stabbing me with forks and screwdrivers. It wasn't long before knives came into play. She burned my hands on the stove on multiple occasions, scalded me with boiling water, and branded me with a clothing iron. She tried to strangle me a few times with her hands, with a pillowcase, with a wire hanger. But in the end, she couldn't stop me from finding that animalistic anger inside of my heart, that will to dominate, that need to devour. I killed that woman, beat her until all the bones in my hands were broken, until her face turned to to lasagna and I took a fork the same fork she used to prick me with when I was a baby and I used it to take little bites out of her this crusade began when I killed her and it won't end until I exterminate every woman on this planet a feeling of reverence spread through the audience Brian's repugnance turned into fear for his family he saw a silver lining though although it made him feel dirty he figured he could use the lord of flesh's misogyny to his advantage he said, it's not that I don't want to stay, your lordship. I believe in your message, but I need my backpack. It is very important to me. Maybe you can help me. I'm hunting a woman. Is that so? The Lord of Flesh responded, eyes lighting up. She tricked me in the tunnels. She made me believe she was one of the good ones. Later that night, her male accomplice arrived and they robbed me. Let me guess. She used her body to manipulate you? Yes. Brian lied, hanging his head in fox shame to put on an act. Of course. It's the oldest trick in the book. Don't worry. You'll learn from your mistakes. We'll teach you the way. After you return from your hunt, you said you require my assistance. What do you need? Men? Weapons? Brian could have used the reinforcements and extra firepower, but he didn't want to lead a pack of misogynist baby fiends straight to his baby girl or slow himself down with more supplies. 
He was hoping to use stealth to help him rescue his daughter and escape undetected. He said, I need directions. Your people saw me through the manhole. Maybe they saw my robbers, too. Perhaps, the Lord of Flesh responded as he leaned back in his throne. What did the whore look like? She told us. Us. Brian bit his tongue before he could finish saying that word. Fortunately for him, to the Lord of Flesh and the rest of the audience, it sounded like he was collecting his thoughts. She told me her name was Amanda, he said. She has red hair, green eyes, and a scar down the center of her face. He ran his finger diagonally from the left side of his forehead to his right cheek, tracing the shape of Amanda's scar with a gesture. The Lord of Flesh made a tiss sound, then said, Say no more. I know this woman you speak of. I know the pathetic excuse of a man she calls her husband, too. He lifted his arm and pointed to his right. He said, I hear they're scavengers. They like to work alone, but they occasionally join up with the other groups in the city for hunts and raids. They often stay in a hive a few blocks that way. I believe it's in an apartment complex on Montevina Street. It's an orange building, an ugly, ugly thing. There's a palm tree out on the street in front of it. Go beyond it, and you're in their territory. The street name rang a bell in Brian's mind. I've been there before, haven't I? He asked himself. A wave of hope washed over him. I think I can find it, he said. Thank you, your lordship. I'll, um, I guess I'll be on my way. As Brian turned away, the Lord of Flesh said, Not so fast. Brian looked back at him. The man on the throne said, I helped you. Now it's your turn to help me. With what? I'm going to play a game. I need another player. This would be the perfect opportunity for us to bond and for you to prove your allegiance to me. What do you say? Brian picked up on the wicked undertones of the man's message. He only had three realistic options. Play along, try to talk his way out of it, or die trying to escape. Fearing his daughter was running out of time, he decided to cooperate. Okay, he said. Chapter 15. Pick a Pepper. A raspy, nasty croak ripped through the plaza. The blonde woman stood on her tiptoes, her back against the pyramid of lunch tables. Her long, pointy tongue stuck out of her gaping mouth. Her hands were tied behind her back with a cord from an electronic store. The knot was so tight it cut the circulation to her hands. A noose was tied around her neck. The coarse rope scraped away to her skin, turning her throat bright red. Above her, a man stood next to the Lord of Flesh's throne, holding the other end of the noose. He occasionally tugged on the rope, lifting the woman's feet from the ground for a second, or two, or three, each time. And whenever her toes rose from the ground, she felt the noose tighten around her neck. The brunette woman remained in her cage, knocked out cold. Brian fought hard to keep his revulsion from showing. He was aware of the deathless evil of humanity but this was beyond his worst expectations. The Lord of Flesh stood between him and the blonde woman. He held a canister of pepper spray in his hand. His followers surrounded the area in front of the tables like a group of teenagers watching a fight in school. We call this pick a pepper, the Lord of Flesh said. You could think of it like a game of pin the tail on the donkey. The rules are simple. He approached the blonde woman. Her feet slid as she thrashed against the tables behind her. He pushed the canister of pepper spray between her moist thighs. She felt it gliding up to her crotch. Knowing what was coming next, she squeezed her thighs together to stop the canister before it touched her vulva. Don't play hard to get now, he said. What? You'd open your legs for chads and alphas, but not me? Am I not good enough for you, princess? You think I don't have enough money to afford a whore like you, hmm? Maybe that last part's true, but I have the power to take cunts like yourself. The blonde woman stared at Brian, eyes circling between slitted and wide. She tried to say help twice, but it sounded more like a two-syllable laugh. Huh, huh. You think this is funny? The Lord of Flesh asked. 
We'll see if you'll still be laughing once the game start. He thrust the canister upward, slamming it against her crotch. He rubbed it against her vulva, trying to open her up. She twisted and turned while keeping her legs together. The man next to the throne yanked on the noose, lifting the woman a few inches into the air. She gagged, and after ten seconds of strangulation, she stopped resisting. Her legs inadvertently opened up. As she descended back to her tiptoes, the Lord of Flesh continued rubbing the canister against her vulva. He parred her labia with it, but he couldn't force the canister in. It was too thick and she was too dry. She was weak and dizzy. Maybe you're not as fresh as we thought, the Lord of Flesh said. Looks like we'll need some lube. Bring me my special clippers. Brian saw some movement behind the front row of spectators. A mere minute later, a short man emerged from the crowd with a nail clipper. He handed the tool to the Lord of Flesh, then retreated back to the crowd. The Lord of Flesh put the pepper spray in his pocket. He needed both hands for his next trick. With his free hand, he groped her crotch until he felt a small nub, her clitoris. After fiddling around for a short while, he retracted the clitoral hood. Then he flicked her clit around like a joystick. She awoke, although she remained drowsy from the lack of oxygen. The Lord of Flesh took one step to the side to give Brian the perfect view. He slid the nail clippers over the woman's clitoris. Brian's mouth cracked open, but he slammed it shut a second later. No, he wanted to yell, but he could see everyone was eager to pounce on him if he showed any sympathy for the victim. The Lord of Flesh squeezed the nail clippers lever gently, pinching her clitoris with the blades. A throbbing pain seized her pelvis and jolted her fully awake, but it was too late. Applying more pressure on the lever, the Lord of Flesh clipped her clitoris. The severed nub fell to the ground between them. The woman spasmed against the tables. The back of her head thudded against one of the table's legs several times while horrendous croaking noises escaped her mouth. The sound of her suffering unnerved Brian. A feeling of uselessness tormented him. He fidgeted as he watched her, unable to look away out of fear of being targeted by the clan. Blood fountained from the woman's mutilated genitalia. The Lord of Flesh held the canister of pepper spray under the stream. He soaked his hands, too. As the flow of blood slowed to a trickle, he crouched, picked up the severed clitoris, then flung it into the crowd behind him. Five guys jumped for it, one of them caught in his mouth like a dog catching a treat. Fucking hell, Brian thought. The Lord of Flesh wagged the nail clipper at him and said, Amazing what you can accomplish when you improvise. Remember this when you're on your hunt. He tossed the tool into the crowd, then said, When you're angry, everything is a weapon. The same thought went through Brian's head, slower this time. Fucking hell. The woman faded out of consciousness. The man atop the tables lowered her a bit more, relieving some of the pressure on her neck. They weren't trying to kill her after all. Not yet. Using his bloody hand, the Lord of Flesh fondled her crotch and fingered her pussy. He even curled his middle and ring fingers inside of her. Once he had lubricated her with her own blood, he slid the canister into her vagina. He pushed it upward while twisting it, as if screwing a hook into a ceiling. Although she remained unconscious, the woman groaned sluggishly. Tears seeped out from between her sealed eyelids. It was as if her mind was off, but her body knew she was being violated. The canister disappeared inside of her. The Lord of Flesh kept pushing it up, though. When he took his fingers out of her vagina, the canister stayed in place. There we go, he said. For a whore who can't get wet on her own, you sure are tight. I think this one might be a real virgin, gentlemen. The audience grew rowdy, jeering and hissing and barking. The Lord of Flesh said, That's right. Virginity doesn't change a thing because there is no such thing as a pure, innocent woman. No such thing. He walked back to Brian and said, Back to our game, yes? As I was saying, the rules are simple. We'll be blindfolded. You'll have a blade. I will too. We're going to take turns stabbing her. The goal is to pierce the canister inside of her spoiled, putrid cunt. First one to pierce it wins. But don't worry, friend, you won't be punished for losing. We're only bonding this time, remember? So, let us bond. I don't 
know if I can do this, your lordship, Brian said faintly. Of course you can. You're a man, aren't you? I'm sorry. I just, I feel like, like maybe we're moving too fast. I thought you were going to teach me to find my true self first. Nonsense. If anything, we're not moving fast enough. You didn't forget about your hunt, did you? Your trail will go cold and your prey will get away soon. I know you don't want that. The Lord of Flesh drew the dagger from one of the seeps on his utility belt. He spun it around and, gripping the six-inch tanto blade between his index and middle fingers, he held it out in front of Brian. Brian didn't see Amanda or Garrett as his prey. He didn't care if they got away as long as he got his daughter back unharmed. In the end, however, he agreed with the Lord of Flesh's way of thinking. Time was of the essence. He took the dagger. The Lord of Flesh drew the bowie knife from another seat. It had an eight-inch blade. I'll go first, he said. He whistled, calling one of his followers to him. A scrawny, bald guy, his rugged face dappled with cigarette burns, came out of the crowd with two strips of cloth. One was white and the other was black. He used the white one to blindfold the Lord of Flesh. Brian spotted the tiny holes on the cloth, though. The leader could clearly see through it. The peculiar man sought to keep an advantage at all times. The Lord of Flesh walked towards the pyramid of tables with his arms outstretched in front of him, feeling the air, acting like he couldn't see. He stopped at arm's length away from the blonde woman. She was semi-conscious, unsure if she was stuck in a nightmare or suffering in hell. Snuffling, she lifted her head slowly and looked at him. Through the gaps on his blindfold, she caught a glimpse of his yellow-tinged eyes. They made eye contact. The Lord of Flesh grinned. He flipped the knife so he was holding it in the ice pit grip. Then he swung it down at her upper chest. The blade snapped her left clavicle and sliced into her trapezes muscle. Her mouth flew open and her strangled vocal cords emitted a weak groan. Standing on the balls of her feet, her legs swayed. Blood raced down her left arm and breast. Her broken bone crunched as he pulled the knife out. The Lord of Flesh lifted the blindfold up to his forehead and said, Oops, looks like I was off by hair. Too bad for me, he chuckled along with his audience. Then he walked over to Brian, patted his back and said, Your turn. Show us what you can do. The scrawny underling tied the black blindfold over Brian's eyes. The Lord of Flesh pushed him forward. Through the cloth, Brian could see silhouettes, faint outlines of objects and people. For Harper, he told himself with a deep breath. Do it for Harper. Afraid of tripping, he took some uncertain steps forward. Then he let the woman's whimpers guide him. They got louder as he closed in on her. He stopped as he felt her choked breathing on his face. He held the dagger near his hip, the blade pointing away from him. He angled the knife to his right, then thrust it forward. He missed her on purpose. It's okay to miss him pin the tail on the donkey, he had rationalized. It'll be okay if I miss in this game too. Oh, uh, oops, he stuttered with a nervous smile. Try again, the Lord of Flesh said. In fact, since this is your first time playing, you keep trying until you land a nice stab. We can wait. Oh, thank you, sire. Brian pointed the blade at the blonde woman. As if trying to communicate telepathically with her, he repeated one phrase in his head. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He closed his eyes despite the blindfold and thrust the knife forward. He felt some resistance as the blade pierced her flesh. Her cries sharpened for a few seconds before weakening. Around them, the audience cheered and applauded, screaming and laughing and hopping and clapping. Brian pulled the knife out of her and stepped back. He lifted one side of the blindfold enough to peek out with one eye. He saw the horizontal stab wound at the top of her right thigh. The wound wasn't very wide or deep but it bled quite a bit. Two squiggly parallel threads of blood ran down to her kneecap from the cut. Blood from the gash on her collarbone dripped from her nipple as well. The look on Brian's face said something like, What am I doing? Not bad, not bad, the Lord of Flesh said as he grabbed his shoulder and pulled him back. He stepped in front of him and said, I say you were a lot closer to our pepper than I was, so you won that round fair and square. Let me give it another whirl. He lowered his blindfold over his eyes. 
then adjusted it so he could see through the holes. He turned the knife in his hand to hold it in the ice pick grip again. With the blade pointing at a downward angle, it was clear he had no intention of trying to pierce the canister in her vagina. He raised the knife over his shoulder, then moved his arm around like the claw of a crane game. He stopped moving, stalled for five seconds to amplify the suspense, then brought the blade down. He stabbed her right breast with enough force to break a rib, crack another, and prick her lung. The blade cut straight through her nipple, splitting it in two. As she gasped freely, unable to draw a satisfying breath, the Lord of Flesh worked the knife like a lever. The wound stretched, the intercoastal muscles between her ribs crinkling like crushed paper. As it clacked between a pair of bones, the blade cracked another rib. Her breast was cut open vertically. The Lord of Flesh lifted his blindfold and said, Missed again. I must be getting rusty. Oh, well. I'm sure I'll get it next time. He walked behind Brian, leaned close to his ear and said, Unless you pick the pepper first. Your turn. Aghast, Brian gazed into the gorge of mutilated flesh on her chest. He saw something moving inside of her. Her heart? A lung? He thought. From behind him, the Lord of Flesh lowered the blindfold over Brian's eyes before pushing him towards the prisoner. Despite the cloth, Brian saw the woman's feet at the lowest periphery of his vision. Drops of blood had landed on some of her long, talon-like toenails, painting them red. He stepped closer to her and prepared the dagger, holding it with both hands in front of his crotch. Kill me, the woman whispered, voice so low it was inaudible to others. Kill, kill me. She yearned for an end to her agony. Brian wanted to end the game just as badly as she did but he feared he would be punished if he killed her outright. I have to make it look real, he told himself. He thrust the dagger at her crotch as hard as possible. The skin on his arm crawled as he felt her pubic hair brush up against his hands. To his utter disappointment, the blade only broke her pubic bone. He yanked it out of her. The Lord of Flesh said, Close but no cigar. Much better than your first try, though. I can see you're serious about winning. I better step up my... Brian screamed as he thrust the dagger into her again. The blade shattered another part of her pubic bone before cutting into the top of her bladder. Urine surged into her abdomen, flowing around her intestines. The woman grimaced, mouth agape in a soundless scream. He stabbed her a third time, then a fourth, then a fifth. With that final stab, he skewered her bladder, sliced into her vagina, and pierced the canister. A hissing noise slightly deadened by her flesh, came from her crotch. A blend of blood and pepper spray with a dribble of urine spilled from her vagina. Her legs gave out. The noose stopped her from falling to the ground face first. Her eyes rolled back while her lower body swung from side to side. Blood frothed on her lips. She felt like her pelvis was burning from within. Her cries came out as a mix of burping and calling sounds. Kill me, she was trying to say. Brian realized the stab wounds, all eight, weren't enough to kill her. She was suffering immensely. Her vulva had swelled and reddened, hanging between her thighs like a prolapse. Hoping to put an end to her misery, Brian plunged the dagger into her neck four times in rapid succession. With the fourth stab, he grunted and leaned close to her, driving the blade into her cervical vertebrae. Her body slumped against his. She involuntarily nuzzled his neck, speaking so softly that only they could hear his voice. Brian whispered, I'm so sorry. The woman passed away in his arms. Tugging on the rope, the man atop the pyramid of tables pulled her body away from Brian. He lifted her body a foot off the ground. The noose tightened around her neck, squeezing more blood out of her like juice from an orange. She was already dead, but they wanted to be 100% certain. Brian turned around, dagger in hand. Everyone was staring at him in silence, as if waiting for their leader's approval to either applaud or attack. The Lord of Flesh seemed more curious than angry, his inquisitive eyes locked on Brian's. Brian said, I'm sorry, your lordship. I lost control of myself. That woman, she... She reminded me of an ex-girlfriend. She cheated on me. Not just once. I didn't find out until I caught her with the last guy. I was so angry then, but... I didn't do anything about it. I let her walk all over me. And I always regretted it. I guess it all came out of me now.
He wanted to cross his fingers so badly, hoping they wouldn't see through his lies. The silence was deafening. The wind had stopped blowing and the blonde woman's corpse stopped twitching. It was as if everyone was holding their breath. The Lord of Flesh smiled and said, You really are angry. I'm going to mold you into a supreme gentleman. Yes, I am. Welcome to our brotherhood. The audience cheered. Despite the butchered corpse hanging under the throne of human remains, they were all smiles and giggles. Brian held in his sigh of relief and forced a half-hearted smile to keep up appearances. The Lord of Flesh approached him, slung an arm over his shoulders, then pointed the woman in the other cage and said, We'll keep her warm for you. When you return from your hunt, we'll fill up with candy, hang her from a tree, then we'll bash her like a pinata to celebrate your success. I can't wait. Brian said, trying to sound natural. I'll come back as soon as possible. Please do, the Lord of Flesh replied. He whistled, calling the bald guy with the burnt face to him. Then he said, this one is under my protection. Tell everyone. The man nodded rapidly before running off. The Lord of Flesh said, go now, brother. Leave from where you came. You'll find your way. Oh, and don't forget to bring that cunt's head back with you. I could use another fleshlight. As he walked away, Brian bowed, not out of respect, but out of nervousness, and said, Thank you, your lordship. I'll make you proud. I know you will. Brian hurried away from him. On his way out of the food court, some of the other members patted his back and congratulated him. He ignored them and retraced his steps through the plaza. Chapter 16. Montevina Street. Help! A woman shrieked her husky voice cracking with despair. God, please, stop! She was in the back of a patrol car parked in the middle of a basketball court at the rear of a school. The windows were cracked open. She clawed at one of them, fingernails screeching on the glass. The cage partition separating the front and back seats rattled as her legs struck it repeatedly. She was flailing under a man, putting up the fight of her life. Beaming from ear to ear, the guy was thrusting into her from behind. He clutched a fistful of her hair in one hand and her shoulder in the other. Another baby fiend sat atop the patrol car, using the broken emergency lights on the roof as a chair. He was nibbling on a severed finger. Revolver in hand, Brian stood on the sidewalk behind the school. The fence, which once enclosed the basketball court and the rest of the playground, had been run over. He watched the attack in total shock. His inner voice was telling him to do something, to redeem himself for the murder at the food court but his body refused to move. The baby fiend on top of the patrol car stared back at Brian, eyes glazed over with disinterest. Word of Brian's newfound affiliation with the Lord of Flesh had spread swiftly through the neighborhood. Upon spotting the newest member of the Brotherhood, the rapist in the car took his hand off the victim's shoulder and flashed a thumbs up at him before continuing to rape her. Brian still had five rounds in his revolver. The baby fiends appeared to be unarmed, too. The odds were in his favor, but he couldn't convince himself to intervene. Doubt weaseled its way into his mind and crammed his head with terrifying possibilities. They could have guns, but I just can't see them from here. There could be more of them around hiding in the school. The Lord of Flesh could be watching. He shut his eyes and shook his head. He concentrated on Harper. She was his priority. He walked away, shame weighing heavy on his shoulders. No, no, please, no, the woman pleaded, her voice shriller than before. Help me, help, oh, oh, it hurts, he, he's hurting me, God help me. Dewey-eyed, Brian started jogging to get away from her voice. He had to put two blocks between himself and the school before her cries waned. I'm sorry, he whispered to himself. He continued to run through the neighborhood, checking every street sign in his path. Although the sidewalks were uneven, the streets were webbed with cracks and all the vegetation was overgrown. He recognized the area. It was coming back to him slowly, as if he was visiting his hometown for the first time in years. The houses and apartment buildings had been plundered and vandalized. Someone had tried to park a school bus in the living room of a house. In another, baby fiends used their victim's blood to tag a garage door with graffiti. In big bubbly letters, the message read, Adreno for all. He saw baby fiends in some of the houses. They saw him too, but they disregarded him. 
Brian stumbled upon a downed palm tree. He recalled the Lord of Flesh's warning. Go beyond it, and you're in their territory. Past the tree to his right, there was an apartment building with a green and white exterior. Next door, there was an orange three-story apartment complex. His heart took a nosedive as he read the sign on the side of the building. Sunny Vista. Tommy? Brian said in disbelief. His memories came back in fragments. The pieces melted together in distorted portraits of his brother. To protect himself from the trauma, he had subconsciously buried the memory of his last encounter with Tommy on the day of the outbreak. On the verge of tears, he pressed his palm over his ear as he heard the buzzing of a blender and the crunching of baby bones at the back of his head. He paced next to the fallen palm tree while glancing over at the Sunny Vista apartment complex. He wondered if the Lord of Flesh had somehow known about his relationship to Tommy, if he had been set up and sent straight into an ambush, if he had misheard him and traveled there because it was familiar, if his brother was even alive. He thought about retracing his steps and searching for Garrett's trail of blood. The idea of starting all over and possibly losing track of his daughter made him sick, though. Then, a baby's faint, distant whimper derailed his thoughts. He stopped pacing and gazed at the Sunny Vista apartments. His gut told him that he had heard Harper's plea for help, and she was waiting for him in the apartment complex. A gust of courage blew through him, whisking his fears away. His heart rate went into overdrive as a surge of energy rushed through his veins. He vaulted over the fallen tree trunk and rushed through the apartment building. Afraid of barreling straight into a pack of baby fiends, he gravitated towards the gate next to the building. It had been left wide open. It led to a narrow passage between the side of the apartment complex and a brick partition separating the properties. Brian lunged through the garbage in the passage, trash bags rustling around his legs with each step. He had to push some weather-beaten furniture, mattresses, bed frames, dressers, desks, dining tables, and chairs out of the way. It all appeared to have been removed from the apartments. A coppery, musty scent, infused with the stink of human waste, hung over the area. He slowed down near the end of the passage, trying to minimize the noise. He hugged the apartment building's wall, prepared his revolver, then poked his head out and peeked around the corner. Behind the apartment complex, there was a pool and a barbecue area. Contaminated with blood, lots and lots of blood, and bacteria, the pool water had turned a deep red. The pool liner was cracked too. Dead bodies as well as dismembered limbs and butchered organs floated in the water. The sound of generators, rumbling, hissing, whining, emerged from the passageway on the other side of the building. Two men stood in front of the barbecue grill next to the pool. They were both bald, but one of them was naked and the other one only wore a pair of jeans and an apron without a shirt. A washed-out message on the apron read, Kiss the chef. Smears of blood on the garment made the word kiss look more like kill, though. He was the hive chef. Feathers of grayish smoke rose from the grill. A cooler sat next to them, the lid half open. Brian tiptoed towards them, revolver pointed at the new man's upper back. He stopped about three meters away from them as he got a better view of the grill between them. His stomach nodded with disgust and his face with rage. The headless, limbless corpse of an infant was being charbroiled on the grill, belly down. Most of the torso had blackened already, but there was a long scar next to the spine. The body had been dissected prior to the cookout. It's her. It's her. It's her. Brian thought his tears stood in his eyes and his finger tap danced against the revolver's trigger. It's Harper. Uh, uh. Are you sure we got all the, uh, adreno out of it? The nude man asked, arms crossed over his chest with his hands on his shoulders, while shivering as if he had a severe fever. The chef pressed down the torso with a spatula, setting off a sizzling sound and sending more smoke skyward. He pulled the spatula back towards him, then said, Stop worrying so much. You saw us drain him and take his brain and kidneys out before we started, didn't you? Now that's where that sweet essence comes from. This, he pointed the spatula at the corpse, then said, This right here, it's breakfast, nothing else. But, but I ain't hungry, the new man squeaked out. You have to eat or you'll nod off again. You can't be sleeping when you're looking after our stash. You shouldn't even be out here. I, I needed some adrenal, that's all. I want my hit, man. Well, you have to wait your turn like the rest of us. 
I want my hit. Brian drew his revolver back. He felt selfish, but he found some relief after hearing the men refer to the corpse on the grill as a boy. A feeling of hope came back to him. I can still save her, he told himself. His arms steadied as he walked backwards away from the grill, keeping the gun on the cannibals. He approached the doorless doorway at the rear of the apartment complex. Through the door, he could see straight down a hallway to the building's first entrance. There was no one around, so he crossed the threshold. Chapter 17 Home of Nightmares The interior of the first floor of the Sunny Vista apartment complex had been renovated through acts of demolition. Most of the walls between the doors had been torn down, leaving the frames and pipes exposed. Some of the walls had smaller holes, like pass-through windows in a restaurant. Only one apartment in the laundry room were left intact. Although they had access to electricity, only daylight illuminated the corridors and rooms. The baby fiends were trying to conserve energy. In a half-crouch, Brian slung down the hallway. He took cover behind pillars of leftover drywall around the door frames and some of the wall studs. Staying vigilant, he looked through the doorless doorways and, if the apartment had a door, he checked inside through the holes in the walls. He kept telling himself the same thing over and over. Harper's here, Tommy's not. Harper's here, Tommy's not. Most of the homes were littered with trash, filthy sleeping bags and tattered mattresses set up between the garbage. Backpacks, purses, duffel bags and suitcases filled another apartment, piled up like mounds of trash in a dump. The baby fiends appeared to be hoarding their victims' belongings. Halfway down the hall, the sizzling at the grill outside faded to a soft hiss. The smell, however, only worsened with each step forward. It was ingrained in every floorboard, every carpet, and every support beam in the building. But it didn't make him sick anymore. The stench was all too familiar to him now. Decomposition. It was as if the entire planet were rotting. He didn't see any people. As he closed in on the stairs near the apartment complex's entrance, he heard the familiar hum of a freezer behind him. He stopped and looked back. The number next to the door read 103. The apartment's walls hadn't been touched. The door was scuffed but functioning. Brian glanced at the building's entrance, then at the back door. The coast was clear. He planned his ear against the apartment's door. The hum was louder. He turned the knob and eased it open, immediately thrusting his revolver through the gap. He sighed and lowered his weapon slightly, as if in defeat. Like the other homes, the walls separating the rooms had been destroyed, turning the one-bedroom apartment into something more like a studio. Refrigerators of different brands and models hugged the outermost walls. Freezer chests and coolers were scattered across the room. Bundles of twisted cords from the appliances, held together with cable ties, snaked out of the apartment through holes in the walls. To stop the appliance from overheating, the air conditioning was turned down to its coldest setting and fans were set up across the apartment to help circulate the cool air. Brian had flashbacks to his experience at Alberto's Market. Although he already knew what he was going to find inside of those freezers, he felt compelled to check all of them. What if they put her in one of them, he asked himself. Every second wasted was the difference between life and death for his daughter. He raced to the first refrigerator to his left. He threw the fridge door open, then the freezer door. His face cramped with anger and sadness. The refrigerator compartment was empty. The freezer, on the other hand, was loaded with frozen babies swathed in saran wrap. The frost accumulating on the plastic wrap told him that the babies had been dead and freezing for a long time. They were stockpiling the babies ensuring they would have enough to last for the coming months. Yet he searched for Harper anyway. He had to be sure she wasn't being frozen. Weaving and bobbing his head, he looked through shelves full of frozen babies. He found a baby girl on the bottom shelf. He felt a pang in his chest, as if his heart had actually broken. He dug his shaky hand into his hair as he crouched all the way down to get a better look at her. The frozen infant was Harper's size, with the same hair color and the same chubby cheeks but then he noticed her eyes and mouth through the frost on her face. This baby had blue eyes and two teeth sticking out from her lower gums. Harper had brown eyes and no teeth. The pain and tightness in Brian's chest dissipated. He wanted to say two phrases at once, thank God and I'm sorry, but he couldn't force a single word out. He moved on to the next refrigerator. He pulled the door open 
then shrank back in terror. Severed baby limbs and chunks of flesh with skin clinging to them were packed together and sealed with saran wrap like chicken legs and thighs in a grocery store. He squeezed his eyes shut and shook his head. He refused to believe his daughter's remains were in that freezer. He sped up his search, opening every refrigerator door. The fridge compartments were all empty, while the freezers revealed more glimpses at the bottomless depravity of the new world. He discovered more bodies, chopped up limbs, decapitated heads, and even tiny organs stored in freezer bags like fruit. In the corner of the room, he opened the freezer drawer at the bottom of a refrigerator and found a baby boy frozen in the fetal position. He wasn't covered in any type of plastic wrap. Powdered with frost, his skin had turned pale blue. Black blotches covered his arms and legs, from his fingertips to his shoulders, toes to his hips. Brian knew the boy was dead. He had never seen him before either, but his paternal instincts activated and told him to check on him. He tucked the revolver into his waistband, then lifted the body from the freezer. He felt the baby's hard, cold skin through his sleeves as he cradled him in his arms. The memory of his first time holding Cameron came to mind, and tears came to his eyes. Who are you? A steady, calm male voice asked from behind him. Brian's boots became rooted to the floorboards. He couldn't reach his revolver or ice pick without dropping the baby. He waited for someone to attack him. Instead, he only heard the loud hum of the surrounding refrigerators. He furrowed his brow and turned around slowly. A man in a yellow blood-smeared hazmat suit, hood down, stood in the doorway. His hair was dirty and uneven, longer in some places than others, but it looked like he tried to trim it regularly. He wore greasy eyeglasses with a crooked frame and blue latex gloves. He raised a hand, palm out, in a peaceful gesture and said, Put it down, please. Brian looked down at the frozen baby in his arms, then back at the man. The guy was more concerned about the product than Brian's intrusion. Brian held the baby closer to his chest and sidestepped away from the corner, searching for an upper hand. Hey, hey, relax, the man at the doorway said. I'm not going to hurt you. Brian stopped near one of the freezer chests in the middle of the room. Keeping his hand up, the man in the hazmat suit took a step forward. The door shut behind him. I know you're not one of us, he said. It's all right. It's cool. We can talk about this, okay? My name is Jesse. Well, it's actually Jesus, but just call me Jesse. What's your name, huh? Where are you coming from? Brian said, My name is... I can't remember my name. I don't know where I came from. He was only trying to buy time. Jesse said, Okay, all right. We'll figure it out later. I know a lot about the brain. I can help you get your memories back. I'm the harvester around here. I've been studying human organs, anatomy, you know, for years. And yeah, I harvest their essence too. If you need a hit, maybe we can work something out. But you have to give me the baby first. Brian looked him over. The man was unarmed. Brian didn't want to use his revolver out of fear of alerting the entire hive of his presence in the building. As far as he knew, only Jesse was aware of him after all. He had to get close to him to neutralize him and he had to do it as quickly and quietly as possible. His gaze dropped to the frozen baby. His arms began to tremble, as if the infant had suddenly turned into an adult in his arms. Sorry, he whispered. Feeling Brian's reluctance, Jesse said, Be cool. We have enough of dream. Brian hurled the baby at him, then drew his ice pick and vaulted over the freezer. Jesse didn't see him coming. He lunged forward and caught the baby, nearly tripping over himself. Before he could find his footing, Brian tackled him, slamming him against a refrigerator near the front door. The refrigerator door popped open behind Jesse as he bounced off it. The baby fell out of his arms, hitting the floor with a loud bang and sending vibrations across the floorboards. Brian struck Jesse's chest with his elbow and pushed him back against the refrigerator. Then he swung the ice pick at his neck. The spike pierced a muscle at the front of his neck and cut into his voice box, missing his major blood vessels but slicing into his vocal cords. As Brian pulled the shank out, blood dribbled out of the small hole in Jesse's neck in a continuous stream. Jesse released a low-pitched, strained cry. His pupils expanded with a genuine fear, an innate fear of death. He was a psychopath, but he wasn't a fighter like the others. Brian thrust the ice pick at him again. 
Jesse leaned back against the refrigerator and stretched his neck up to avoid the spike. He tried to slap the ice pick away. Instead, the spike went straight through the center of his palm, snapped his middle metacarpal bone in half, and came out through the back of his hand. His cries amplified. Brian tugged on the ice pick's handle. It was jammed between pieces of bone and sliced muscles. He rammed Jesse's chest with his shoulder, pinning him against the refrigerator, then pulled on the handle again. The shank slid out. Brian wasted no time. He thrust the ice pick upward, hoping to penetrate his skull through his jaw and pierce his brain. He sought an instant kill, but he wasn't strong enough. Entering his throat at the top of his neck, the spike cut through the muscle attaching his tongue to his hyoid bone. Jesse's tongue hung out of his mouth as he panted. Blood ran down his tongue and dripped from the tip, drizzling onto the frozen baby below them. Brian placed more pressure on the ice pick. He wanted to drive it all the way in to see if it would kill him. In a last-ditch effort to save himself, Jesse swung his head forward, slamming his face against Brian's. His glasses snapped in two at the bridge. The pieces fell to the floor. Rocked by the headbutt, Brian teetered back and pulled the ice pick out of him. Then he thrust the spike forward without aiming, grazing Jesse's ear. Jesse lurched forward, wrapping his arms around him, lifting him a few inches and then slamming him on the floor while landing on top of him. The back of Brian's head bounced off a floorboard and the air was knocked out of him. The ice pick slipped out of his hand and rolled away. Brian wheezed and writhed. His vision circled between focused and blurred, matching the rhythm of his pulse. He felt hot blood pouring out of the cut on his hip, and the bang against the floorboard aggravated the lump at the back of his scalp from his previous head injury. He was seeing stars and feeling nauseated, as if he was on a zero-gravity flight. He felt a tug at his pants. He lifted his head and saw Jesse straddling his legs, coughing up spritz of blood and trying to pull the revolver out of his waistband. On his back, Brian wiggled out from under him, then kicked his chest and launched him back. The harvester landed on his ass in front of a refrigerator, grasping at his chest with one hand and at his neck with the other. Brian grabbed his revolver's grip, but then thought twice. He knew the other baby fiends in the building would swarm him if he fired the gun. He rolled onto his hands and knees and searched for the ice pick or another weapon, but to no avail. He spotted Jesse on his knees, trying to open the front door. He was running out of time. Brian heard one of the Lord of Flesh's messages in his head. When you're angry, everything is a weapon. And Brian was furious, frustrated, and desperate. He scurried forward and grabbed the frozen baby from the floor. Holding it by its legs, he swung the corpse. The baby's head collided with the side of Jesse's with a thunk, like two melons hitting each other. Jesse toppled over. In a fit of rage, Brian swung the baby at his head again, and again, and again. The bridge of his nose was split open and blood bubbled from his nostrils. His teeth gashed his inflated lips with each hit. Like eye black on a football player, wide horizontal cuts on his cheekbones issued thick streams of dark blood. Drops of cold blood came out of the baby boy's mouth, nose, eyes, and ears. His malleable skull was smashed into tiny pieces. His head was starting to sway and ripple like jelly. Then, their faces broke with a sickening series of cracks. Jesse's face collapsed into his skull, skin swirling as if it were going down a toilet. Although it was difficult to see through the pool of blood and nuggets of brain, his forehead had taken his left cheek's place, and his left cheek had drooped into his mouth. Meanwhile, the baby's frozen face shattered like a glass mask. Chunks of his head flew in every direction. Appalled, Brian dropped the baby and fell back. He crawled backwards until he crashed into a refrigerator behind him. Then he slapped his hands over his mouth and stared with wide, astonished eyes at the fight's aftermath. The infant had landed face up, what was left of it, next to Jesse. Plumes of vapor rose from his open skull. What did you do? Brian yelled at himself. What the hell did you do? Guilt and shame poisoned him. A hot flash swept through him, and his stomach turned over. He puked into his hands. It was mostly bile and stomach juices. He retched a few more times, but there was nothing left for him to puke out. He wiped his hands on his pants, then drew his revolver and aimed it at the front door. The cracks of their skulls breaking continued to echo in his head. He was sure the cannibals at the barbecue grill had heard the ruckus. He was ready for them to barge in, but no one came. He grabbed the neighboring refrigerator's handle and pulled himself up to his feet. Rubber leg, he wobbled over to the corpses. He had to hide his tracks to keep the element of surprise. Ashamed, 
He looked up at the ceiling and swept the fragments of the baby's broken face under a refrigerator with his foot. Refusing to look at the dead infant, he carried him in his arms and brought him back to the freezer drawer in the corner of the room. He sat him gently down as if afraid he'd somehow wake up. I'm sorry, he sobbed as he pushed the drawer closed with his knees. After wiping the tears from his face, he dumped Jesse's body in a freezer chest. Due to his size, the door didn't close all the way. Brian hoped it would go unnoticed until he saved Harper and escaped from the building. He cracked the front door open and peeked out into the hallway. The apartment complex's entrance was clear. He opened the door a bit, stuck his head out along with his revolver, and looked down the other side of the hall. He didn't see any movement at the pool. He exited the room and closed the door behind him. He was still shaking from the fight in the storage room. He went over to the stairs, ready to head up and continue his search. But then a stifled whine stopped him at the bottom of the steps. He raised his revolver and glanced around. The refrigerators? He thought as he looked back at the storage room. The baby? He heard again. He turned his attention to the entrance. It was coming from the laundry room across the hall from the superintendent's office. His curiosity got the best of him. He inhaled deeply and steadied his arm, bracing himself for another nightmarish room. Then he opened the door. He drew a little gasp of dismay. His arm dropped, revolver aimed at the floor. God, he whispered. The laundry machines had been removed from the room. Cages lined the walls, their doors secured with chains and padlocks. In each cage, a female victim, as young as 15 and as old as 40, was strapped to a gynecological bed. Their legs were arched like capital M's. There were nine victims in the room. One of them was dead, and one of the cages was vacant. Brian shambled through the makeshift prison. The women were blindfolded, and their mouths were stuffed with ball gags. But through the flimsy eye mask and the gags, he could see their eyes had been gouged and their teeth had been extracted. A young woman appeared to be missing her eyes and tongue entirely, although she was still given a blindfold and a gag. The victims were all at different stages of pregnancy. The oldest woman looked like she was ready to give birth. Surrounded by stretch marks and operation scars, her belly button protruded from her big round abdomen. One of the younger women was barely developing a baby bump. The dead woman's abdomen was torn open during a bot C-section. Her baby was missing. There was a turkey baster on the floor, tubes coated with a crusty white residue. The concrete floor was discolored with white splatter stains. Brian put two and two together. He knew what they were doing to those victims. He realized Lori Sadler, the old woman from the precinct, was correct. The baby fiends had been abducting females and using them as baby-making machines. He was standing in one of the rumored baby factories. Upon feeling his presence in the room, some of the women started groaning and wrestling with their restraints. Their words weren't clear at all, but Brian understood them. He was well-versed in the sounds of misery and hopelessness. He recalled the blonde woman's message at the Lord of Flesh's lair. These women weren't looking for freedom. They didn't want to be a part of a society that despised them. They saw an end to their suffering. There's nothing I can do, Brian said, tears running down his rosy, beaten cheeks. The women cried harder. Kill me, one of the victims managed to mumble through her gag. As he shuffled back to the door, Brian said, I don't have enough bullets, enough time, enough, enough. I just can't do this right now. I'm sorry, but I need to save my daughter first. Some of the victims went from weeping to whimpering upon hearing his explanation. Brian continued, I'll come back for you if I can. I'll end this. He exited the room and shut the door behind him straight away, trying to block out the cries. Sniffling, he lumbered to the stairs across the hall. He took a moment to recompose himself. Then he pointed his revolver up the stairs and started moving up. Chapter 18 The Second Floor Brian stopped at the top of the stairs. Unlike the first floor, the apartment walls on the second story hadn't been demolished. Rumbly snoring came from an apartment to his left and suppressed voices emerged from down the hall to his right. He didn't trust anyone in the building, but he figured an unconscious person wasn't as much of a threat as a conscious person, so he followed the voices. Halfway down the hall, a floorboard creaked under his foot. The voices died out. He pointed his revolver at the last door to his right. 
The plaque next to the door read 208. He held his breath. He didn't know why. He just did. A bead of sweat crawled down his cheek, irritating the cut on his cheekbone. After about 20 seconds, the voices continued. Brian let out his pent-up breath. He needed a minute to psych himself up. He approached the door to his left, apartment 207. He opened the door and peered inside. At first glance, it looked like the home had been converted into a storage room. He caught a glimpse of a sledgehammer and a fire axe. The room was empty, so he stepped inside. He closed the door behind him, leaned back against it, and whispered, Get it together. As he looked around the apartment's living room, his eyes began to widen little by little. He wasn't standing in a regular storage room. He stood in an armory. Spread across the old furniture, sofas, tables, the entertainment center, and leaning against the walls, there were weapons all over the place. Some appeared to have been homemade. Hammers, screwdrivers, and wrenches. Knives, axes, and hatchets. A power drill. A chainsaw. Hockey sticks. An aluminum baseball bat. A wooden baseball bat with rusty, crooked nails sticking out of it. Homemade spears made from broomsticks with blades attached to the ends of the handles. Molotov cocktails, pipe bombs, a shotgun. As he walked around the room and scanned the arsenal, Brian thought back to the assault on the precinct. He feared those weapons were going to be used in another raid. He heard some thuds outside the apartment. He went to the door, inched it open, and looked outside. The hallway was vacant, but the door leading to apartment 208 was open now. He crept across the hall, put his back against the wall, then sidestepped over to apartment 208. He stopped next to the door frame. He could still hear the snoring from the other end of the corridor. Across the hall, the door to apartment 209 was closed. He couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching him through the peephole, though. Don't, a woman said. Hey, stop it. The voice came from apartment 208. Forehead creased. Brian leaned closer to the door frame and eavesdropped. The woman continued. Seriously, don't go out there. I was just saying, you know. What's taking him so damn long? He should have been here by now. I know he's late, a man answered coldly. Your nagging and bitching isn't going to change that. So you either get out of my way and let me go find him so we can get this shit over with, or you shut your mouth and you wait. Vernon told us to stay here. Then sit and stay, bitch, the man snapped. Jeez, Gare, what the fuck? I'm hearing you, okay? I'm not telling you to go out there. I was just saying. What's your problem? I got shot. I got fucking shot and all that bastard Vernon gave me was this fucking rag. What the hell am I supposed to do with this, huh? That motherfucker wants to see me dead. I saw it in his eyes. That little snake. He wanted to, to take her to the big balls and act like, like he found her. Like he busted his ass and he got shot for her. Fuck that. She's not going anywhere without me. Tremors had shaken his voice mid-rant. His breathing was loud and ragged. It took him a minute to calm himself. Brian recognized their voices, Amanda and Garrett. He believed Garrett was referencing Harper during his tirade. He listened for his daughter's voice, but he didn't hear her crying or giggling or cooing. He got very antsy very fast, hands shaking, legs rocking, face contracting. You're right, Amanda said, the sound of her pacing footsteps escaping the apartment. The fuckers over the first chance they get. When he gets here, we... We got to make sure we get what's ours. We caught her. We brought her here in one piece. We deserve the biggest hit. They're just letting us use their blender. We can't let them share her with everyone. They don't deserve it. No, no, not her. She's too good for them. If they try to play us, we walk. And if they try to stop us or take her from us, you better be ready to fight. Oh, I'm ready. I don't care if it's Vernon or Jesse or Tommy. I'll, I'll. I'll tear his throat open with my teeth. I'll bite his face off. I'll... Her voice petered out as Brian's focus shifted. Tommy, he thought. Is it really you? He mustered enough courage to peek around the corner. Amanda was walking back and forth, rambling about all the terrible things she was willing to do to the others. Looking fatigued but alert, Garrett sat slumped forward on a sofa. He pressed a gray, blood-soaked rag against the gunshot wound on his hip. Harper lay on the cushion next to him. There was a strip of duct tape over her mouth. Face streaked with dried tears, she appeared irritated, exhausted, and scared. 
She had trouble breathing through her nose on account of the mucus filling her nostrils. Drained of her vigor and unable to breathe comfortably, she stopped fighting her kidnappers. She was moving, though, swinging her leg up and down as if trying to kick something. Harper's condition sent Brian into a vengeful frenzy. Without thinking, he pointed the revolver at Garrett. The sound of footsteps and quiet voices came from the staircase down the hall. Brian looked into the apartment. He didn't have time to plan his next move. In a split second, his survival instincts took over, told him to hold off until his odds were better, and led him away from the apartment. With wide, quiet lunges, he sprinted it back into the armory, but held the door open an inch so he could monitor the hallway. He listened to the approaching footsteps. They sounded like sledgehammers hitting wood to him. Then, in what felt like slow motion, he saw two men walk past the door. Small but vicious, Vernon Verney Desmond stood 5'4 and weighed less than 100 pounds. A born strategist, he used his intelligence and eloquence to overcome his lack of brawn. He had managed to talk his way into a position of power within the Sunny Vista Hive when the craze began to spread. His black hair was tied in a ponytail, and he kept his goatee trimmed. He was wearing a dark green shirt, loose-fitting camouflage pants and boots. There was a compact pistol in the holster attached to his utility belt. His light brown eyes gleamed with a type of feral deviance. He was an addict like the others, but he knew how to control his urges. Tommy walked beside him. He looked like he had aged 19 years and 9 months. All of his hair had fallen out. His skin was pallid and waxy. His jaundiced eyes had sunk into his hollow face. He wore an old, worn-out, stab-resistant ballistic vest over a long-sleeved navy shirt and a pair of matching pants. It was his uniform from his old job at a power plant, excluding the ballistic vest. The clothes hung loosely on his skeletal frame. Like Vernon, there was a pistol in the holster clipped to his belt. A seed hunting knife hung from his other hip. They're in here, Vernon said as he led Tommy to apartment 208. Brian had a hard time believing his eyes, but he couldn't lie to himself. Despite all the changes in his appearance, he recognized his brother as soon as he saw him. He could tell Tommy was the leader of the hive. Thank you for waiting, Tommy said as he crossed the threshold into apartment 208. Vernon stood in the doorway behind him, his back to the hallway. I see you brought something for us, Tommy said. Brian opened the door just enough to squeeze through. Feet gliding across the floorboards, he quietly closed in on the room. He aimed his revolver at Vernon's back. Conversation in the apartment was clearer from the hallway. We brought something for you, Tom, Amanda was saying. Not for that rat behind you, not for your buddies downstairs. We want a fair split, okay? Like, um, like 33% for me, 33 for Gare, 33 for you, even Steven. I guess that leaves 1% for me, Vernon joked with a sly smile. You get 1% over my dead fucking body. Oh, well, I'm sure we can arrange that. Try something and we'll rearrange your face, you little pussy. Who do you think? Settle down, you two, Tommy said. We're all here as friends. So, let's be friendly about this. You say you brought something for me? You mind if I examine the product? I do, Garrett spoke up, sounding sluggish. You're not touching her until we've got a deal. I don't need to touch her to perform an examination. I'm only asking for a closer look. I need to check for defects and other abnormalities. Amanda said, You could see her from there. We already checked her out, too. No defects or, uh, or growths. She can't talk. She has no teeth, but she laughs and cries. She's probably like four or five months old. She's healthy, perfectly healthy. She's ready for a good blending. Brian clenched his jaw and took another step toward the apartment. He felt his pulse in his fingers as he tightened the grip on the revolver. He aimed the handgun at the back of Vernon's head. The talk of blending his daughter infuriated him. Four or five months, Tommy said. You're saying she was born after the craze started. Where did you find her? Garrett said, that's not important. But it is. We have a truce with the other hives in the city. If you stole her from them, then you kicked the hornet's nest. So I need to know if you're leading a whole swarm of hornets straight to us. And if they are coming, they're not. 
I need to know if you're worth protecting or if I should hand you over to them. You haven't been very friendly since you arrived, coming here demanding to use my blenders, disrespecting me and wasting my time. So I'll ask you one more time, where did you find her? There was a moment of heavy silence. Like Amanda and Garrett, Brian noticed a shift in Tommy's tone. The leader had gone from calm and peaceable to impatient and aggressive. He wasn't the brother Brian remembered. Amanda said, We saw a family wandering the streets after the raid at that precinct. I, uh, I acted like I was one of them, one of the good ones, you know, and I tricked them into letting me join them. We went to that old college together, and when the chance came up, we took that baby and ran. This baby girl, she came from a healthy, normal family. I can promise you that. And no one else knew about this except us, Garrett added. A couple of fiends tried to follow us on our way here, but she never belonged to them. She's ours, Tom, but I know how this works. You've got the blenders, you've got the electricity, so you need your share. Just make it even and give us the adreno we deserve, too. And get me some damn painkillers, will ya? Fucking hell. The silence returned. Brian started doing the math. There were four baby fiends in the apartment and five rounds in his revolver. As long as he didn't miss more than one shot, he had enough ammunition to injure everyone in the room. But the snoring down the hall reminded him of the other cannibals in the building. He wasn't an experienced gunslinger either. He was worried a stray bullet would hit his daughter during the chaos. I need to get Harper away from them, he thought. And I need more weapons. Tommy said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll blend her for you. We'll split her adreno 50-50. Amanda stammered, but, but, but we want 30. 50, Tommy interrupted before pausing for dramatic effect and adding, 50. You did half the work, we'll do the other half. You're not going to find any other blenders out there. You won't find a better harvester than Jesse either. I'm offering you a fair deal, but I'll make it sweeter. While you wait, I'll give you something better than painkillers. A hit of adreno for each of you, Bernie. Vernon took two small squeeze bottles out of a pocket on his utility belt. Like bottles of honey, they had drip tips. They were filled with blood. Do we have a deal? Tommy asked. Amanda salivated at the sight of the blood. She crouched in front of Garrett, hands on his thighs. He couldn't stop himself from smacking his lips either. They whispered amongst themselves. It took them ten seconds to come to a decision. Amanda stood up, turned to face Tommy and Vernon and said, It's a deal. Tommy beckoned to his right-hand man. Vernon tossed a bottle at Amanda and the other at Garrett. Then he stepped into the apartment. Brian could hear Amanda and Garrett squeezing and sucking at their bottles. Then he heard a whimper from Harper. He was relieved to hear her voice, but disappointed in his own inability to rescue her. He retreated back to the armory and, again, kept the door open an inch to look out into the hallway. He listened to the faint voices coming out of apartment 208, but he couldn't make out any words. A minute later, Tommy and Vernon exited the apartment. They walked past the armory. Vernon was carrying Harper in his arms. They had removed the tape from her mouth. She was fidgeting and breathing noisily. The sight of her rekindled Brian's hope and determination. He stuck his head out and followed them with his eyes. He saw them head up the stairs to the third floor. He waited to see if Amanda and Garrett were going to follow the others. The couple stayed in apartment 208. Brian retreated back into the armory and closed the door, then turned around and ran his eyes over the weapons. He started arming himself. Chapter 19 Everything is a Weapon Brian exited the armory. Tired of being headbutted by the cannibals, he wore an American football helmet for protection. His fingers were firmly wrapped around the grip of a wooden baseball bat. Rusty, crooked nails stuck out of the bat's splintered, cracked barrel. A revolver, a hammer, and a Molotov cocktail were tucked into his waistband. A pump-action shotgun was slung across his back. One of the homemade spears ran parallel to his spine, held against his back by the shotgun's sling. He was geared up and all set to fight for his daughter's life, but he wanted to ensure the odds were in his favor. He had to strike and thin out their numbers while he had the element of surprise. He went to apartment 208. The front door was open, allowing moans of pleasure to escape the room. He cocked the baseball back back as he entered the apartment. The living room was empty. 
Over the bar, he could see the kitchen was vacant, too. He went down a hall, following the moans and slurps. On his way, he checked the other rooms. The bathroom, storage closet, and bedroom were empty. He stopped in the doorway to the master bedroom at the end of the hall. Most of the furniture was gone. There was an entertainment center with no entertainment. A nightstand stood in the corner of the room with a dead, cordless alarm clock on top of it. Next to it, there was a deflated air mattress on the floor. Garrett sat at the head of the bed, his back to the wall. Filating him, Amanda was on her hands and knees in front of him. They were naked, their clothes sprawled atop the trash on the floor. Their squeeze bottles lay next to the air mattress, crushed and emptied, not a single drop left. Without a care in the world, Amanda was flashing her shit-encrusted anus to Brian. A thick white discharge, like curled yogurt, filled the folds of her vulva, too. Blood welled out of the gunshot wound on Garrett's hip, but he didn't seem to feel any pain. Their pupils were abnormally dilated, irises reduced to thin rings. Their skin had reddened, webs of thick veins jutting out from every inch of their bodies. They were soaked in sweat from head to toe, looking like they had just climbed out of a pool. Garrett glanced at Brian. They did a double take. He had his hands on the back of Amanda's head, controlling the pace of her bobbing. She didn't resist him. Brian felt like a deer caught in a pair of headlights, like someone who had walked in on his parents having sex. Garrett beckoned to him and asked, You trying to get in on this? Yeah? We can get a gangbang going. She can handle, he hissed, pulling Amanda's hair and shook her head, then said, Watch the teeth, woman. He forced her head down deeper, causing her to gag on his cock. He held her head down and blocked her throat with his dick until she started panicking and slapping his thighs. After ten seconds, he pulled her head up, but he didn't let her take his cock out of her mouth. He looked back at Brian and said, She ain't the best at it, but she can handle a couple of cocks at a time. She's a... Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, that's better. He moaned and bit his lower lip while moving Amanda's head faster. He said, She's a durable one, you feel me? Amanda didn't seem to mind Garrett's aggressive, demeaning behavior. Although she felt his presence in the room, she didn't try to hide her filthy ass from their visitor. You don't even recognize me, Brian said. And he was right. Despite the football helmet, Garrett had a clear view of Brian's face. Yet he couldn't recognize the man he had assaulted only a few hours earlier. He mistook Brian as a member of the Sunny Vista Hive. Come on, bud, he said. Let's make a blender, baby. Brian lost control of himself and stormed into the bedroom. Startled, Garrett raised his hands and cocked his head back. Amanda kept sucking his cock, utterly unaware of her surroundings. Brian swung the bat at the side of her head. The weapon made contact with her skull with a light thud and a white crackle. With the blow, she unintentionally bit down on the shaft of Garrett's penis before falling unconscious on top of his legs. His dick stayed in her mouth as she ground her teeth against it, blood spewing out around the gnawed organ. Garrick screamed and tried to pull his dick out of her, but his frantic movements only made her teeth sink deeper into his shrinking cock. Meanwhile, some nails in the baseball bat were lodged in Amanda's scalp. Two of the nails cracked her skull but didn't quite penetrate the bone all the way through. Brian pulled on the bat and, with a tug, blood spurred out from the widening puncture wounds. The blood darkened her red hair before trickling down to her ear, cheek, and forehead. Get off me, Garrett shouted. He threw haymakers at the side of Amanda's head, as if trying to break her jaw to free his cock. After a few lefts and rights, his penis slithered out of her mouth, but it was only after it withered down to a flaccid state. She left a deep, jagged, bleeding bite mark around the shaft of his penis. She rolled off him. Unwilling to lose his weapon, Brian stomped on the side of her face, pinning her head to the air mattress. Exerting all of his power, he yanked the bat out of her. Her scalp tore open with a shredding sound, a large flap of skin hanging away from her skull. Pieces of bone were visible between strings of flesh and patches of mushy tissue. Amanda released a long, ghastly groan. Back against the wall, howling in pain with his hands over his crotch, Garrett slid up into a squatting position. His legs were close to giving out, rocking violently from side to side. Brian struck his face with the baseball bat, ejecting a handful of yellow teeth from his mouth and slashing his jaw and cheek. His jaw broke with an audible crack. Garrett plummeted back to his ass and rolled left and right, one hand over his crotch and the other over his mouth. 
His screaming transformed into distorted croaking. Brian raised the bat overhead, but his resolve wavered. Their cries took him out of it. He wasn't a cold-blooded killer like the cannibals. Then, he thought about his daughter and remembered his wife's bellows of agony in the tunnels. The baby fiends were more than willing to hurt him and his family. He had no option but to continue fighting fire with fire. Violence begot violence. Shut up and die already! He swung the bat down at him, landing a direct hit on the center of his face. Blood sprayed from his broken nose like lava from a volcanic eruption. A nail pierced his septum and another speared his upper lip. His cheekbone shattered too. His eyes rolled up, showing only his bloodshot sclera, but he was still conscious. Brian wrenched the baseball bat free from his face. Beaten to a bloody pulp, it looked like Garrett's nose only had one nostril. Brian raised the bat overhead, blood dripping from the nails plopping on his helmet. Before he could swing it down, Amanda tackled him from behind. They crashed into the wall. She jumped and chomped at his neck, but got a mouthful of air instead. Brian held the baseball bat horizontally by its handle and barrel, the nails digging into his palm. Unable to swing it at close range, he used it to push her back. She kept lunging at him, trying to bite his neck. She spit a mouthful of blood from Garrett's penis at his face. It entered his mouth, causing him to retch. He pushed her back with the bat, then swept her leg out from under her. She fell to the floor next to the air mattress. As if chopping wood with an axe, Brian swung the bat down her, but she rolled away and dodged it at the last moment. The bat hit the floor so hard that it snapped in half. Brian stared at the handle in his hand, stunned. Help! Amanda cried out. She dragged herself towards the door. Garrett was wiggling about on the air mattress, moving more and more as his strength returned. He tried to call out for help too, but his voice was unintelligible. Brian stumbled behind Amanda wrestling with his shotgun strap until he could get his spear loose. As Amanda grabbed the doorway and pulled herself up to her feet, he thrust the spear into the crook of her knee. The blade skewered her leg, the tip sticking out through her fractured kneecap. She spun around and collapsed, sprawled across the doorway. Brian stepped on her thigh and pulled the spear out of her, then thrust it at her neck. But he missed and poked a hole in her left breast instead. He retrieved the spear once more, just as he was about to stab her a third time, Garrett pushed him into the corner of the room. The spear fell to the floor. Brian got a peek of his attacker's chewed cock. Covered in blood, it looked like a red slug hanging from a bush. Although he was aiming for his neck, Garrett clamped his teeth, the remaining ones, on Brian's shoulder. He bit through his shirt and broke his skin. In a panic, Brian punched the guy's dick and then kneed his shot hip. Garrett released his grip on his shoulder to ball. Brian leapt into the air and headbutted Garrett one, two, three, four times. The cannibal's upper teeth spilled out of his mouth like coins from an old slot machine after winning a small prize. To Brian's surprise, Garrett stayed on his feet. It was as if the adreno was actually blocking out some of the pain. Help! Amanda screamed as she crawled into the hallway. He's fucking killing us! Believing he had lost his stealth advantage, Brian made a grab for the revolver in his waistband. Upon spying the gun, Garrett lunged for it as well. The thought of losing the revolver sent Brian's mind into a tailspin. He felt a burst of hysterical strength. He pushed Garrett back and slammed him into the drywall above the deflated air mattress, leaving a torso-sized crater behind. Brian pulled him away from the wall, then ran back towards it and propelled him through the hole. Garrett's body broke through the wall into the neighboring apartment, but Brian refused to let him go. Keeping his arms wrapped around him, he pulled him back into the bedroom. Plasterboard dust caked Garrett's head and back. As Garrett began to fight back, pushing and twisting and jerking, the men stumbled into the hallway. Amanda had made it halfway down the corridor, coughing and groaning between her cries for help. They tripped over her, but they didn't let go of each other. They quickly got back to their feet and continued grappling. They ended up in the living room. Garrett chomped at his neck, but due to his lack of teeth, his gums only massaged Brian's throat. Brian spun him around, then hurled him at a window. The glass exploded and Garrett fell out of the building. It was a 15-foot fall. He landed on the pavement next to the pool, head first before the rest of his body hit the ground like a rag doll. As if it were on a hinge, Garrett's neck flew open in a giant gash. His skull cracked open like an egg. His blood stained the shards of glass surrounding his body. The man at the barbecue grill looked at him, then up at the window, then back at him. Their mouths hung open, dumbfounded. Holy shit, the naked man said. That, that's the guy, right? The, the guy with the baby? 
He came with that bitch, remember? Yeah, the chef said. Fuck, man, did he jump? Don't know. He hit the ground pretty damn hard. Maybe he was tripping out and fell. Or maybe that cunt pushed him out to keep that blender baby for herself. We can take it then, huh? The naked man explained. If they were fighting over it, if, if she's up there alone, we can take that blender baby and split it between us. Fuck her, right? The chef puckered his lips and looked back at the window. Amanda was sobbing in the apartment, but her cries were too soft to reach the barbecue grill. With a cunning smile, he said, I guess you're right. We're going to have to go up there and check it out anyway. Can't have that bitch running around here causing a ruckus. If she happens to be dead and fucked when we're finished with her, boo-hoo. What's ours is ours. What's hers is ours, eh? There was no honor among thieves or cannibals. Back in the apartment's living room, Brian stepped over Amanda and said, Don't move. He hustled back into the master bedroom. Garrett's dislodged teeth crunched under his boots as he went to grab the spear. When he returned to the living room, Amanda was already gone. He followed a trail of her blood out of the home. She was in the main hallway about halfway to the neighboring apartment. Help! She whined. Brian ran up from behind her and thrust the spear into her. The blade entered her torso, through her lower ribs, and punctured her liver. The cannibals from the cookout made it to the top of the stairs just as Brian pulled the spear out of Amanda. Blood shot out of the wound on her back in geysers. She rolled on her side, went into spasms, and moaned. The chef said, Who are? Brian lobbed the spear at them. Big-eyed, they threw themselves at opposite walls. The spear soared past them. While they were shocked by the sudden attack, Brian drew his revolver. The naked man shielded his face with his hands, palms out, and shouted, No, no, please! Brian shot at him twice in quick succession. The first bullet went straight through his hand, directly through the center of his palm, and then entered his skull through the left side of his forehead and stopped in his brain. The second bullet struck the hollow of his throat. Blood spouted from his neck and forehead, as well as his left eye and left ear as he collapsed. The chef hit the floor in great haste. He scrambled behind the dead cannibal and used the corpse as a meat shield. He flinched and screamed as Brian shot at him three times. One bullet hit his left shoulder, a through-and-through through shot. Blood drenched the strap of his apron. The second round whizzed past him and struck a floorboard behind him. The final bullet hit the naked man's gut. Despite his lack of ammunition, Brian squeezed the trigger three more times after the last bullet left the barrel. Click, click, click. The chef continued to cower behind his dead peer. Brian looked down at Amanda. She was bleeding out flailing in her death throes. He wanted to expedite her death, though. He turned the revolver and held it by its barrel, then hammered away at the side of her head with the handgun's grip. The clack and thud of each blow echoed throughout the building. He hit her until the grip dented her skull and lacerated her swollen cheek. Her legs shook wildly, and a bloody foam came out of her mouth. She was alive but on the brink of death. There was no coming back from her injuries. Holding the revolver over his shoulder, blood dripping from its grip, Brian walked towards the chef. The guy rolled onto his back and squirmed away, wailing. Brian was prepared to pistol whip him to death. He stopped next to the dead cannibal upon hearing footsteps on the floors above and below. Then a curly-haired guy, drowsy-eyed and yawning, waddled out of the apartment at the other end of the hall. He was holding a pocket knife, the blade already drawn. Nap time was over. Stab time was on. Get him, the chef shouted from the floor. Kill that fucker. Brian ran back to apartment 208. He needed to buy time. He didn't bother to close the door because he knew it wasn't going to be able to stop the cannibals from breaking into the apartment. Only violence could deter them. He wanted to save his shotgun shells for as long as possible, figuring he'd need it to help him escape safely with Harper. He took the Molotov cocktail out of his waistband and a lighter out of his pocket, then lit the wick. He heard a stampede of footsteps in the hallway. He pitched the Molotov cocktail at the doorway. It exploded in a ball of flames. A flash of intense heat slapped Brian's face, causing him to totter back. Flames shot up from the threshold like a wall of fire. The door frame, door, and surrounding walls were set ablaze. The fire spilled out into the hallway, too. He's cornered himself, the chef yelled in the hallway. Keep an eye on him. We need weapons and backup. Brian ran to the broken window in the living room. He stuck his head out and looked down at the ground below. He considered jumping out and sneaking back into the building to get the drop on the cannibals, but the sight of Garrett's corpse made him second-guess himself. 
I won't be able to get her out of here if I twist my ankle or break my foot, he thought. He coughed into his elbow as smoke from the blaze irritated his lungs. He ran down the hall in the apartment, both to get away from the fire and to search for another way out. In the master bedroom, his eyes were drawn to the massive hole in the wall. He climbed to the hole into the neighboring apartment. The home had been renovated into one giant kitchen. All the walls had been torn down, leaving only the frames of the old rooms exposed. The windows were boarded up, and the kitchen was lit by white fluorescent lights. Counters hugged the walls, and kitchen islands stretched across the room, creating several aisles. Blenders, knife blocks, cutting boards, empty squeeze bottles, and plastic funnels covered the countertops. Enormous refrigerators stood in every corner. Cords from the appliances were taped to the floor, leading to power strips all over the apartment. As he strolled down an aisle, Brian heard a man shout, Get a fire extinguisher! The voice came from the hallway. The sound of people shuffling about arose from the armory. There were more footsteps upstairs. Brian had a plan. Wait until the cannibals entered the other apartment to search for him then sneak out and get the high ground. But he was distracted, anguished, by a commercial blender on a counter to his left. A dead baby boy was stuffed in the glass pitcher. He was thawing, skin beaded with condensation. The infant's head was severely swollen, almost as big as its thin torso. Thick, bulging veins squiggled across his scalp and forehead. His head was pressed against the blender's blades while his tiny feet were close to sticking out from the top of the pitcher. Next to the blender, there was a lid, a funnel, and five squeeze bottles. The cannibals were waiting for the perfect opportunity to blend him. Over here! We can get him through here! A man shouted in the hallway. Brian could still hear the crackling of the fire in the apartment next door. The footsteps in the hallway got louder as the cannibals approached. They didn't know he was in the extended kitchen, but they were heading towards him anyway. There was no time to think. Brian heaved the blender off the counter just as the front door swung open. The chef and the curly-haired guy barged in but slid to a stop right away, caught off guard by Brian's presence in the kitchen. Matching expressions of apprehension dawned on their faces as they spied the baby in the blender. Brian pointed the appliance at them, put a finger on his start button and said, Come near me and I'll spill all this kid's blood on the floor, I swear. What the fuck are you thinking? The little voice at the back of his head was shouting. This isn't you. But it was too late to turn back. Whoa, whoa, chill, the curly-haired guy exclaimed. Back off! The cannibals were armed. The curly-haired man was now wielding two knives, a chef's knife and a cleaver. The chef held a hatchet in his right hand. His other arm hung limply at his side, covered in blood from the gunshot wound on his shoulder. Put it down. Back off, Brian repeated, pausing between each word. You're in our hive, pal. We ain't taking orders from you. I'll do it, man. Don't. Push me. I, I don't think he's bluffing, the curly-haired guy said. The chef said, he ain't going to do it. He can't do it. Isn't that right? You can shoot up the place, but you're no killer. You ain't never had a hit of the adreno, have you? Maybe we can fix that. Put it down and we'll... Brian pressed the start button. The blender whirled to life. The blades chopped away at the baby's head, twisting his skull like the cap on a bottle. His shredded brain made squishy noises while his bones crunched. A vortex of blood flew out of the pitcher, splashing on the counters and floor. The curly-haired cannibal ran towards Brian. He wasn't interested in attacking him, though. He was sticking his tongue out, trying to catch the baby's blood like a kid trying to catch snowflakes in his mouth. The blender jammed with a thud and a pop. A detached ear, flaps of skin, and bits of brain floated in the remaining blood in the pitcher. Brian hurled the blood at him. As he got closer, lapping at the air like a dog, he swung the pitcher at the cannibal. The glass jar exploded against the side of his head. The shard split his ear in half horizontally, cut his temple open, sliced his cheek, and pierced his eye. He dropped his knives and fell to his knees. The dead baby, missing the top half of his head, fell next to him. Pieces of the baby's brain splattered on the floor, too. Brian pressed the blender's start button again. Freed from the tangles of brain and skin, the blade spun. He grabbed a fistful of the cannibal's hair in one hand and thrust the base of the blender at his face with the other. The blade severed his upper lip and nose. His left eye was cut in half, but it stayed in the socket. His cheeks were carved open, leaving him with an ear-to-ear -ear smile like a puppet. One of the blades entered his mouth, cutting his palate, breaking some of his teeth, and slashing his tongue. His temporal mandibular joints, the joints connecting his jaw to his skull, 
popped. Only some muscles and ligaments kept his jaw attached to his head. The chef charged at him and chopped the left side of his rib cage with the hatchet. It cracked the rib and cut into the muscle between a pair of bones. It didn't penetrate his chest cavity, though. Screaming, Brian swung the blender at him. He missed and the appliance broke as it hit the wall above a counter. Meanwhile, the curly-haired guy fell face first on the floor. Brian jumped back and dodged the chef's second swing at him. He swung his shotgun out from behind him. The chef pushed it up as Brian squeezed the trigger. The blast blew a hole into the ceiling. The gunshot rang in their ears. It was so bad, it made their heads ache instantaneously. Despite the pain and disorientation, the chef lunged and swung the hatchet at Brian once more. As he stepped back to dodge the attack, Brian slipped on the blood and fell on his ass. As he scooted back with the cannibal rushing towards him with the hatchet overhead, he pumped two quick shotgun blasts into him at close range. The powerful blast lifted the cannibal off his feet and sent him flying back. He landed next to the other baby fiend. Breathing raggedly, Brian jumped to his feet and aimed the shotgun at the down cannibals. The chef wasn't moving. His chest had collapsed into itself, shards of his ribs and sternum mixed together with his heart and lungs. The hole in his abdomen revealed his perforated, bleeding intestines. The curly-haired man was still convulsing, still kicking. Brian raised his knee to his waist, then stomped on the back of the cannibal's head. His jaw tore off and slid across the floor like a wet bar of soap in a bathtub. It only stopped after hitting a counter. A gargling noise came out of his throat while blood puddled around his head. He stopped moving. Brian glanced around, devastated by the mayhem. He heard quiet voices and footsteps on the other floors as well as the fire raging in the apartment next door. As his adrenaline fizzled out, lances of pain coursed through his chest with each breath. He put his hand over the gash on his ribcage and groaned. Brain fried by the violence, he couldn't think straight. He didn't know how to stop the bleeding. Although the pain bothered him, he didn't care very much about saving himself. He was operating on autopilot, solely interested in rescuing his daughter and willing to kill anyone who stood in his way. He held the shotgun with both hands and strolled to the apartment's front door. Chapter 20 The Third Floor The hallway was clear. The fire had spread across the hall and consumed the door to apartment 209. Wisp of smoke crawled across the ceiling. Most of the smoke exited the building through the broken window in the living room, though. Brian aimed the shotgun at Amanda's corpse as he stepped over it, as if expecting it to reanimate. He pointed the weapon at the naked cannibal as he passed his dead body, too. He stiffened up upon hearing a set of footsteps ascending the stairs. A man in a baseball cap with a long, shabby beard entered Brian's sight. The guy wasn't in a hurry. He didn't look angry or feral and he wasn't armed, but Brian wasn't going to give him a chance to threaten him. As far as he knew, everyone was a hostile in the hive. He shot him before he could reach the top of the stairs. The guy could only grunt as the blast cratered the right side of his chest. He crashed into the wall and tumbled down the stairs. Brian ran to the top of the steps and aimed his shotgun down the staircase, ready to shoot him again. The man lay face down on the landing below, twitching every now and then. Brian watched him for ten seconds waiting for him to give him a reason to shoot him again, then headed up to the stairs. As he reached the landing above, gunshots rang out. A bullet clipped his shoulder. As he stumbled, another bullet hit his football helmet at an angle ricocheting off it. If it weren't for his helmet, the bullet would have struck the top of his forehead. As he fell to the floor, he saw the shooter. Arms sticking out from the handrail's iron balusters, Vernon fired his little gun, a pea shooter, down at Brian without aiming. Bullets struck the floor and walls around his target, Brian shot back at him. He tried to shoot him twice, but he was out of shells after the first blast. Some pellets ricocheted off the iron balusters, but most penetrated the center of Vernon's abdomen. The pistol fell out of his hands, falling to the second floor. He fell back and crossed his arms over his stomach, sobbing and panting. Blood soaked through his green shirt and stained his forearms. Brian felt a cold, buzzing sensation run through him. Nerves tingling and muscles contracting. The near-death experience reminded him of his mortality. He got to his feet, legs shaking, and flipped the shotgun so he could hold it by its barrel like a baseball bat. He clambered up the stairs, fighting an uphill battle to stay on his feet. In the third floor's main hallway, he found Vernon crawling towards an apartment on one hand and two knees. He kept his other arm glued to his abdomen, trying to stop the bleeding and subdue the pain. He left a trail of blood and tears behind him. He's coming! he yelled. 
Brian ran up to him and swung the shotgun at his side, breaking a rib and aggravating his gunshot wound. Vernon rolled onto his back, out of breath. Please, he croaked out. Brian swung the shotgun down at his neck. The butt of the weapon crushed his windpipe. His head tilted back and his tongue shot out of his mouth as he choked. Brian hit his neck again, silencing him. Then he hit him three more times, each blow crunchier than the last. His neck was flattened. Blood dripped from the corners of the cannibal's mouth. Brian noticed the door to his right was open. The number next to it read 306. A low, mumbling voice filtered through the gap. Then a huffled, babyish whine followed. Harper. He crept into the room. Like the home directly below, the apartment had been renovated into an extended kitchen, a blender room. Tommy stood at the other side of the room, talking under his breath. On the counter next to him, there was a pistol and a collection of blades. Harper's clothes and a dirty cloth diaper lay next to the weapons. As he moved forward, Brian saw the commercial blender in front of his brother. The shotgun nearly slipped out of his hands as he became lightheaded. Barely awake, Harper was stuffed in the blender. The lid masked her whimpers while the blades at the base poked her legs. Tommy had his finger on the start button. A terrifying sense of deja vu twisted Brian's mind, bringing on a splitting headache. The helmet made him feel claustrophobic. He took it off and tried to speak, but only a choked sound came out. Tommy heard him. With his free hand, he snatched the pistol off the counter and pointed it at Brian without even taking his finger off the start button. One after another, his face shifted through a range of emotions. Anger, confusion, surprise, happiness, fear, shame. He lowered the gun a little. Brian, he said. Brian dropped the helmet, then the shotgun. He tried to say something again, but the lump in his throat blocked his voice. Tommy said, You, you're bleeding. Take the lid off, Brian responded timidly. She can't breathe. Take it off, please. Tommy looked at the blender, then back at his brother. With the pistol, he flicked the lid off. Brian shed a tear and sighed shakily as he heard Harper's clear cry. Tommy's eyes watered too. He smiled and said, She's yours, isn't she? That's why you're here. For a second I thought we were being raided. I was going to... His voice died away and his lips sank. A grim realization had set in. He stared at the baby in the blender and said, I was going to blend her. If this was going to be my last day on this planet, I needed one last hit. God, I was going to blend my, my, your niece. Tommy's smile returned, but it was unsteady this time. My niece, he said. Her name is Harper. Harper, huh? Pretty name for a pretty girl. Tears doubled Tommy's vision. Then a blink sent the tears rolling down his scarred cheeks. He continued, You know, as soon as we brought her here, as soon as I got a good look at her, I had this feeling that I was going to do something I was going to regret if I went through with, with this. I didn't know she was family, but I felt something, like a, a gut feeling. I don't know. Like a connection? Yeah. That's one way to put it. Now that I've seen you again, I can see the resemblance. She has your hair. Mom's hair, remember? Maybe she'll look like her grandma when she grows up. And her eyes and nose. They're like Leslie's. Same shape, right? Yeah. I can see it now. I bet she looks a lot like Cam, too. <laughs> How? Um. How's he doing? He asked that last question as if the world hadn't changed with the craze. Brian could see his brother was troubled, fighting an internal war against his inner demons. He wasn't interested in making small talk with him, though. He said, Tommy, I need you to step away from the blender. I, I, I can't. Just take your finger off the button, carefully, and step back. It'll be okay, I promise. You don't get it. You never did. I want to stop, but I can't. I'm not in control of myself. Not when I'm 
this close to their their essence. I can I can I can smell it in her, Brian. I can already taste it on the tip of my tongue, and it tastes so so stop it. So so good. When it comes to adreno, each hit is better than the last. You don't need more to to overcome tolerance. You want more because it's so damn good. It's a hunger you can't satisfy. A hunger you feel deep in your stomach and your brain. Tommy, please, Brian said, reaching out to him with his left hand. I'm begging you. I should have never taken that first hit. Alfie, fucking Alfie. He gave me that first sample. He said it was like syrup, like lean, you know. He was probably a fucking fed. The, the CIA caused this. This was all about population control. It was a get away from her, Brian demanded. He was tired of his voice, tired of the conspiracies, tired of the excuses. A sense of unease hung over the deathly silent room. Tommy, a man called out from the hallway. It's Floyd. Shit, man. Bernie's dead out here. He's dead, Tommy. You in there, man, huh? You still breathing? The brothers looked back at the doorway. Brian took the hammer out of his waistband. It was his last weapon. He sidestepped towards Tommy. Give me a sign, boss, Floyd yelled. Come on, don't leave me hanging out here. He got a gun. He had a ammo. I can shoot him if you give me the green light. Let me handle this, Tommy answered. Shit, you have me worried. He's in there with you, isn't he? Don't worry. Fox is out rounding up more of the boys. We're going to get you out of there, boss. I have everything under control, damn it. Stay back. The floorboards in the hallway creaked and groaned, the pauses between each noise growing longer and longer. Tommy looked at his brother and, lowering his voice so Floyd wouldn't hear him, he said, We'll get you out of here. Take the boards off one of these windows and you can climb down. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you it's going to be an easy drop, but some of the trash down there should break your fall. I'm not leaving without her, Brian said. I, I can't. She's not. Tommy was losing his composure, unable to finish a sentence or stop himself from shaking. Brian winced as he watched his brother's finger tap the start button repeatedly. A little more pressure would have switched the blender on. Moving restlessly in the pitcher, Harper pouted and let out a sharp squeal. Another floorboard creaked in the hallway, closer to the front door. Brian said, You can't do this to her. To me, no matter what you think, I've always been by your side. I never gave up on you. Never gave you any ultimatums. None of that. Even after you, you killed that baby in front of me, I let you live. I wanted to, to kill you so badly. So fucking badly, Tommy, but I let you go. With a mirthless smile and teary eyes, Tommy said, You whooped my ass before you left, though. I should have killed you, Brian wanted to say. He didn't want to agitate him with his brutal honesty, though. He gripped the hammer's handle hard enough to turn his knuckles white and took two steps forward, closing the gap between them a little more. He set his sights on Tommy's head. He only needed one good swing to the temple to knock him out. He said, You don't have to make the same mistake over and over. This addiction, this sickness, it's like living the same nightmare on repeat, Groundhog Day, you know? It repeats for so long that we just stop fighting it. I don't want to hurt this precious, beautiful princess. I don't want to kill all those babies or women. It's just automatic. It's in my DNA now. It's too late for me. Too late for this world. No, no, no. It's not too late to give Harper a chance to live. He took another two steps forward. He stood about three meters away from his brother, just out of arm's reach. He started to raise his hammer. Then gunfire erupted. Brian dropped the hammer and fell over the counter to his left. Three bullets hit the wall above him. No! Tommy yelled. He spun around, returned fire with his pistol indiscriminately, and marched towards the gunfire. Floyd was standing in the doorway, shooting into the room. He was shot twice, once in the shoulder, once in the chest, before he could even realize his own boss was attacking him. Wobbly legged from the pain, he crashed into the doorframe and took aim at Tommy. With bullets whizzing past him, he shot his boss four times. Four rounds hit his torso. Two of the bullets penetrated his vest. One ended up in his gut. The other struck him at the dead center of his torso. Tommy jerked and stumbled with each hit. Blood squinted from the injury wounds, 
drizzling onto the floor in thick curved dash red lines. He kept moving forward though. He shot Floyd two more times in the center of his chest and through his neck. The underling collapsed in the doorway. Motherfucker! Tommy yelled as he walked up to him. He shot him twice in the head, just in case. Bits of brain rolled a wave of blood out of the back of Floyd's skull. Tommy limped over his dead body and checked the hallway for any other cannibals. There was no one else around. He took a magazine out of his pocket and, fumbling about, he reloaded his pistol. He felt giddy and unsteady and flushed. As he looked back into the modified kitchen, he felt the hallway start to tilt like a seesaw and the walls start to whirl around him. His world came crashing down. Although his vision was out of focus, he could see his brother sprawled over the blender. Harper's weak cries came out from under him. No, Tommy stuttered as he hobbled towards him. Brian, 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 say, say something. It, it's not supposed to be like this. He put his hand on his brother's back and burst into tears. Brian whipped around and, with a knife on the counter, he stabbed him. He plunged the blade into Tommy's chest right under his sternum at an upward angle. Widening with the stab, the gunshot hole on his ballistic vest had given him the perfect opening. Tommy reeled back against a kitchen island, then he slid down to his ass. He dropped his pistol and stared down at the knife sticking out of him in disbelieving horror. Bry, he said weakly. Brian looked down at himself, inspecting himself for any new injuries. A bullet had grazed his tricep during the shooting. The wound stung, but it didn't incapacitate his arm. His daughter was unharmed. Tired, scared, grumpy, uncomfortable, but safe. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, he said as he carried her out of her blender. She stuck her lower lip out, then started crying. He shushed her and rocked her in his arms. A hot flood of tears came back to his eyes. We're getting out of here, he said. Mama and Cam are waiting for you. He dressed her in her clothes, but left the soiled diaper on the counter. He carried her with one arm, and swept his eyes across the room. His gaze landed on the pistol next to his brother. As he went to pick it up, Tommy said, Ryan, please, help, help me. I can't breathe. It hurts to breathe. Ryan stopped with his hand on the gun. Crouched in front of his brother, he didn't see a cruel, sadistic hive leader anymore. He saw his younger sibling. He remembered the many times Tommy had cried to him when he wanted to kill himself after enduring relentless bullying in high school, when he was kicked out of their house for dealing drugs out of the garage, when he was revived at a hospital after an overdose, when he needed a job after getting fired for abusing narcotics. Brian had always been there for him. He couldn't bring himself to turn his back on him. He grabbed the pistol and stood up. Harper sniveled into his chest. Looking up at them without lifting his head, Tommy mouthed, I don't want to die. I loved you, Brian said. One corner of Tommy's mouth twitched in an unstable smile. Brian stepped on the butt of the knife's handle, driving it deeper into his chest. Tommy's eyes widened and shrank to slits. His head slumped forward and he blew a long, gurgly exhale. Then he fell to his side. Brian sniffled as he fought back an emotional meltdown. He knew he had ended his brother's misery, but the murder only added one more blood to his inner fountain of grief. He kissed Harper's forehead, cherishing his remaining family. He exited the room. Chapter 21 Mercy Smoke blanketed the ceiling of the second floor hallway. The fire had spread to the modified kitchen in the apartment next to the armory. The flames crawled across the back of the building too. As soon as he reached the second floor, Brian felt the suffocating heat hit him. He crouched to avoid the smoke and turned his back to the fire to protect Harper from the heat. He hurried down the stairs. Down on the first floor, an old cannibal with a slim build and straggly white hair was dragging a young brunette woman out of the baby factory. He held her legs by the ankles, leaned back, and pulled with all the strength he could summon. She was on her back, holding on to the door frame, flailing and sobbing. Brian adjusted his grip on Harper, holding her head closer to his chest, then he shot at the cannibal. Three bullets to the chest put him down. The gunfire made Harper screech. Sprawled across the apartment complex's entrance, the old cannibal writhed and moaned. The brunette woman removed her ball gag, then gasped for air. Brian kept his eyes on his surroundings while soothing his daughter. The cannibal stopped moving after about 30 seconds. 
The woman didn't try to stand up or crawl away. The other women wept in the baby factory, their stifled cries competing with the roar of the fire upstairs. With Harper mewling in his arm, Brian approached the woman. Her baby bump awakened memories of the times when Leslie was pregnant with their children. You can't stay here, he said. You have to run. Get out of the city. After mumbling a string of nonsense, she managed to say, I can't. You have to. Death. Die. Kill me. Listen, if you can keep up, I can take you somewhere safe. But you have to haul ass, okay? I can't carry you. Are you listening to me? He glanced around once more, on the lookout for any potential threats. He removed the woman's blindfold. Unease invaded his face. Her corny ears were cloudy and opaque, and the whites of her eyes had turned yellow. Although her eyes were fixed on the ceiling, she gazed blankly at nothing. Kill me, she repeated. I'll, um, I'll get help. I know people, okay? Good people. I can't move. Donald will know what to do. Using her last ounce of energy, grimacing and trembling from the intolerable pain, she rolled onto her side. Brian saw the cavernous bed sores festering across her back like black holes eating away at her flesh. She whispered, I can't feel my back, my feet, my heart. Kill me. Stop saying that, Brian responded. Please, I don't want to do that. Don't leave me. Don't let them take me. Take us. Brian looked at the door in front of him. It was open halfway. He was trying to ignore the other victim's cries because he knew he couldn't save everyone. He pushed the door open all the way and heaved a sigh. Although they couldn't see him, the women cried out to him. Despite their suppressed, overlapping voices, he picked up on their message. They were terrified of being abandoned. They didn't want to be unshackled from their chains. They wanted to be unshackled from life. As he thought about the Lord of Flesh and the other hives throughout the city, he began to understand their rationale. He knew that if he had left them alive, they were going to be kidnapped by another band of baby fiends and subjected to prolonged suffering. I'll be back, he said. He held Harper close to his chest and went up to the second floor. In the hallway, he recoiled upon hearing a loud crack. A floor had collapsed in the apartment down the hall. The fire spilled into the home below. He dashed into the army and grabbed a Molotov cocktail. The bottle was so hot that it seared his palm. He was afraid it was going to blow up in his hand. Harper coughed violently due to the smoke, so Brian made a brisk retreat to the first floor. The brunette woman was gone. He approached the baby factory and found her inside of the room. She wanted to die with her fellow prisoners. Their cries of anguish softened the whimpers of acceptance. They knew what was coming. I'm sorry, Brian said. Flustered, Harper said something that sounded like a mix of Papa and Mama. Upon hearing her voice, a small, hopeful smile came to the brunette woman's face. Although she couldn't see well, she looked towards the door. She said, Take care of her. While balancing Harper in his arm, Brian lit the Molotov cocktail's wick with his lighter. He hesitated, thinking about all the people he had murdered since the raid at the precinct. Self-defense, mercy killings. He had trouble justifying the murders to himself because all of it was so violent. I'm sorry, he repeated in his head, as if apologizing to himself. He threw the Molotov cocktail into the baby factory. He saw it explode in a firestorm, then walked away. He wasn't going to stand around and watch them burn to death. He was convinced they were either going to die from the fire or smoke inhalation before any of the other baby fiends in the area could find a way to get them out. Lunging over the dead cannibal in the entryway, Brian exited the Sunny Vista apartment complex. Behind him, the victims shrieking, the fires crackling and popping, and the buildings creaking and rumbling blended in a song of tragedy. And with each hurried step he took away from the apartment complex, the noise got louder. He sped up his pace from a hasty walk to a jog, yet the wailing grew louder. He transitioned into a full sprint, but still, he couldn't outrun the noise. He was running down the middle of the street, away from the fallen palm tree, when an explosion rocked the neighborhood. He turned around, and, while running backwards, he looked back at the Sunny Vista apartment complex. A column of smoke curled up from the building. The pipe bombs in the armory had detonated, groaning and cracking and snapping. It sounded like the apartment complex was on the verge of collapsing. Brian couldn't hear the prisoners anymore. 
Harper whined and babbled some gibberish. He wiped the tears off her cheeks, then hummed to her and bounced her in his arms. He turned away from the building burning and continued running. Chapter 22 It's Over Cradling Harper in one arm and gripping the pistol in his other hand, Brian ran through a residential neighborhood. Rays of sunshine penetrated the smoky haze in the sky. He couldn't hear the fire at the Sunny Vista apartment complex anymore, though. In order to avoid the Lord of Flesh's territory, he had decided against retracing his steps. He hoped they would be safe as long as they steered clear of common hive locations, large stores, shopping centers, apartment complexes. He was taking the long way back to Boucher College. He was familiar with the neighborhood, though. There were vandalized homes to his left and right. Sticking to the sidewalks, he used the overgrown lawns and the overhanging trees as cover. He stopped at every intersection to catch his breath, investigate the area, and check on Harper. With the thrill of the fight wearing off, he felt fresh throbs of pain across his body. The gash on his rib cage made it difficult for him to breathe. Harper was dozing in and out of sleep, fussy but too tired to fight. He didn't see any baby fiends around. He wanted to believe they were all converging at the burning apartment complex, drawn to the fire like moths and itching to fight for scraps like starved dogs. Yet he couldn't help but feel like he was being stalked. He felt a set of prying, piercing eyes riveted on them. The tranquility in the neighborhood worried him as well. It was too quiet. Baby fiends tended to execute their raids at night, but they weren't all nocturnal. He kissed Harper and rocked her, helping her get back to sleep. Then he continued his trek through the hellscape, they arrived at Brucher College without running into any baby fiends. They entered Alcott Hall through the break room, went down into the maintenance level, then followed the sound of liquids plopping and the stench of sewage into the tunnels under the school. He navigated the dark sewers with the flashlight Donald had given him. Batteries low, its beam was dim and flickering, but it was enough to illuminate his steps. Did we take a left here? He asked himself as he reached the junction in the tunnels. Shit, did we even pass through here? Donald, he exclaimed, louder than his regular voice, but just below a shout to avoid attracting the wrong attention. Donald, it's Brian, we're here. He went left down an identical passageway. He discovered a tent with a rickety folding chair in front of it and an overturned duffel bag next to it. He recalled seeing collapsed tents during his first visit to the tunnels. This one stood erect, though. As Harper complained, Brian said, It's okay, it's okay, we just... I took a wrong turn. It's this way. It has to be this way. He backtracked and crossed a junction. A slit of sunshine beaming down from a manhole above led him to another crossroads. He took a left and searched for anything familiar, but his memories of the tunnels were a dark blur of brick walls and disgusting sewage. Brian couldn't tell one passageway from another. Desperate for clues, he started searching for the corpse of Amanda's supposed nephew, Sammy who he had gunned down in the sewers just a few hours earlier. Where are you? He murmured as he eyeballed the sewage. You were here. You had to be here. Where did you go? He wondered if Sammy's corpse had floated to a different location, but the sewage didn't have a current. He froze upon hearing the last echoes of a banging sound. He dropped the flashlight and drew his pistol, then turned around and pointed the gun behind him. Then he heard a faint splashing noise. He did another 180 and aimed his gun down the tunnel in front of him. His heart rate spiked. He feared he was being surrounded once again. He felt the walls closing in on him. He glanced down and searched for the flashlight, but it had disappeared in the sewage. He ran forward, swinging his gun around wildly. Awoken from her slumber, Harper tried to speak again. The baby talk sounded something like, Papa, Baba, Wawa. Brian tripped and fell to his knees in the sewage. He slammed his pistol on the floor to stop himself and Harper from plummeting into the thick, dirty water. He scrambled out of the sewage. Sitting on his ass, back against the wall, he listened to the distant plopping and splashing. He aimed his pistol to the left, then to the right, and then to his left again. Right, left, right, left, right, left. No one came after them. Brian shifted his focus to Harper. She was prattling on and on without saying any actual words while wriggling against his chest. I think we're lost, honey, he said. This is, this is it. I, I think it's over. I'm so sorry. The baby kept babbling. Her voice brought a smile to his face. 
She had no idea what he was saying, but it sounded good to her because it was coming out of her father's mouth. Brian heard more splashing down the tunnel to his left, and just like that, his smile evaporated, and a distressing thought settled in his mind. It's over. He didn't want Harper to suffer at the hands of the baby fiends. He didn't want her to be frozen to death and stored in a freezer with dozens of other dead babies. He didn't want her blood to be siphoned and packed in the squeeze bottles. He didn't want her body to be cooked or blended or both. Although he had trouble seeing through his tears in the darkness, he glanced at the gun in his hand, then at his daughter. He considered killing her and stashing her body in the sewage to stop the baby fiends from finding her. Tears coursed down his cheeks, but his vision didn't improve. The tears kept coming and coming. She can't survive in this world, he thought. I can't protect her forever. Teeth chattering, he stuttered. I, I love you. He moved the gun closer to Harper, but he didn't point it at her. He couldn't aim it at her. His wrist refused to cooperate with his commands. It was as if his arm had become paralyzed. White light flooded the tunnel. Wide-eyed, Brian pivoted away from the wall and aimed his gun at the light. He was blinded by the beam. His finger curled on the trigger. He held his breath unwittingly. Then a man's voice came from behind the light. Brian? Brian knitted his eyebrows and cocked his head to the side. The light moved down, reflecting on the murky sewage water. As his vision adjusted, Brian saw Donald, a flashlight in one hand and a revolver in the other, standing at the other end of the tunnel. Ben stood next to him, armed with a semi-automatic rifle. Brian, Donald repeated, voice soft with awe. Brian got up slowly, then plodded towards the light. Donald and Ben approached him with caution. The beatings had transformed Brian's face into an unrecognizable mass of lumps and cuts. His clothes were soaked in blood. There was too much of it for all of it to belong to him. He resembled a baby fiend coming down from a binge. This wasn't the man Donald had remembered meeting in the police station. Les Leslie, Cam, uh, are they okay? Brian asked, speaking so fast he was stumbling over his words. Donald pressed the flashlight against Brian's chest to stop him from falling over and to keep him under control. He still had trouble believing his eyes. Ben stood to the side, pointing his rifle at Brian's gut. Slack-jawed, he stared at the survivors with a mix of astonishment and admiration. Are they okay? Brian said, his voice sharpening and echoing through the tunnel. They're fine, Donald answered. Our medics think Leslie might be concussed. Her leg was cut up badly, too, so she lost a lot of blood. It hasn't been a pretty picture, but she's recovering. The boy, he's a tough one. He got banged up and he took that beating like a trooper. He hasn't left his mom's side since they checked in. Overwhelmed with relief, a tired, faint smile crossed Brian's face. He said, they made it. Harper whined. He kissed his daughter's cheek and repeated, they made it. Donald patted Brian's shoulder and said, We have to get going if we're going to make it too. Come on. Along with Ben, he led them through the tunnels. Brian let his guard down, tucking his pistol into his waistband. He didn't pay attention to the passageways. Didn't think about memorizing the path. He had no intention of ever leaving the safe haven in the abandoned subway system once he was inside. Down one tunnel, Donald unlocked a grated door with a key from a ring on his belt. He held the door open and beckoned to the others. Pick up the pace, he said. We still have a long way to go before we get back to the subway. Brian carried Harper across the threshold into a dark, narrow corridor. Ben went through the doorway next, rifle ready to fire. Donald followed them, locking the door behind them. As Ben and Donald moved down the corridor, Brian turned around and squinted through the grated door. He went back and gripped one of the door's bars, staring fixedly as if hypnotized by the darkness. Brian, Donald hissed as he returned to his side. What do you think you're doing? The longer you stall, the higher the chance of them spotting us. I heard something. What? A splash. A, a footstep, maybe. You didn't hear that? I didn't hear a thing, Donald responded. He peered through the grated door and craned his neck around for a better view. Then he looked back at Ben and asked, You hear anything? Standing towards the middle of the corridor, Aiming his rifle away from the group, Ben shook his head and said, Nothing. Donald pried Brian's hand off the door and said, Your family's waiting. Don't jeopardize our safety for nothing. 
Let's go. Although he was skeptical, thoughts of his family convinced Brian to cooperate. He followed Donald and Ben down the corridor. The tunnels under Boucher College remained dark and quiet. There were only the usual sounds of the tunnel system. The rattling of old pipes. The gurgling of sewage. The plopping of water. There was a splash. And then another. Your lordship, a soft, raspy voice said from the shadows. The traitor. He went this way. Join the mailing list. Did you enjoy this bloody journey? Thirsty for more? I don't have any more blender babies for you, but I've published over 50 extreme horror novels throughout my career. If you need more blood in your books, I've got you covered. Over the years, I've dipped into the many different subgenres of horror, slashers, revenge thrillers, coming of age, political, psychological, supernatural, cannibals, snuff, dystopian, and now post apocalyptic. So I believe I have something for everyone, and I continue to explore new subgenres and tackle different themes with each new book. If you like what you're hearing, I strongly recommend you sign up for my mailing list. By signing up, you'll stay up to date with my latest books and you'll ensure you never miss any of my massive book sales. I usually send one email a month. Sometimes I send two if it's a busy month. Sometimes I send none if I have nothing going on. And this newsletter is only about my writing. I won't be spamming you with any horoscopes, weather updates, my opinions on politics, or even my personal life, unless something very serious has happened. It's also completely free to sign up. Visit the link to register, eepurl.com slash bn11cp. Dear reader, you might be asking yourself, what the hell did I just read? Well, I'm sitting here thinking, what the hell did I just write? When it comes to my career, the safe bet at this point would have been to write a direct sequel to one of my popular books, like The Groomer or The Abuse of Ashley Collins. Or maybe I could have written a new story of human horror, what I'm known for, what I'm good at. But after tackling a very personal human horror story with Share by Two and a sequel with Do Not Disturb Three, Goldbrush, earlier this year, I didn't want to do the safe thing. This story was spawned by my need to break new ground, a desire to challenge myself. I'm always looking to explore new territory. I'm open to writing about the darkest subjects and the most taboo themes. Last year, I published a political extreme horror epic called The President's Son. You should read it. I heard it was pretty good. Now, this is my first foray into the post-apocalyptic subgenre. Of course, I had to put my own spin on it. I needed a concept that went beyond the typical nuclear holocaust or climate crisis. During my research for The President's Son, which went on for several years, I stumbled upon some conspiracy theories regarding adrenochrome and population control and I thought this is perfect for my fictional hellscape. I didn't want to spell out exactly how the craze spread in this book. I wanted to leave an air of mystery around the outbreak. However, I would just like to say it is wild to me just how easily dangerous challenges spread through social media like the Tide Pod Challenge or the Blackout Challenge. While writing this book, I did start to wonder how far people would go for likes and followers. I'm sure something like the fictional hashtag baby food challenge could happen. I've seen quite a few people happily endangering their kids for social media. I just saw the video of a dumbass of a dad carrying his two-year-old daughter into an elephant enclosure for a picture. So anything's possible. There are some interesting themes and questions I want to address with this book, but it's not meant to be taken seriously. Rest assured, though, I am planning on exploring themes of addiction, a non-substance addiction to be specific, and others in a more serious manner in a future book. I hope you will look at Blender Babies as something akin to a slasher. It's supposed to be entertaining, extremely disturbing, very outlandish, but entertaining. I also saw this book as the perfect opportunity to change up my formula, for lack of a better word. When I look back at my older books, there are a lot of scenes where characters end up captured, restrained, and tortured. There are a few scenes like that in here, but I aim to spoof things up. 
With its post-apocalyptic setting, I wanted there to be an emphasis on survival horror. From beginning to end, this book is one great battle for survival, a bloody journey to salvation. This story ends with a big tease. I suppose you can call it a cliffhanger. I'm not 100% sure if I'll ever write a sequel to this book, though. I certainly have some ideas for potential sequels. I loved creating this grim world, and I would love to revisit the Lord of Flesh's hive and even make him the main antagonist in a future book. At one point, I considered doing a spin-off series that would have shared the subtitle Stories from the Craze. This was a tough book to write, though. It took me years to finish it. I think I revealed the cover for the first time in 2021. As I mentioned before, this is my first attempt at a post-apocalyptic extreme horror story. Although it has my writing DNA all over it, it's very different from my traditional human horror stories. So, this is the part where I tell you that you can decide if I expand this story into a series or not. How? If you love the book, please leave an honest review on Amazon and let your voice be heard. Reviews on Goodread, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and your blogs are also greatly appreciated. Your enthusiasm and love for my writing has always fueled my passion and has kept me motivated for years. In fact, being a completely independent author, your word of mouth support is the reason I've been able to write full-time for so many years. If you need help writing your review, you can answer questions like these. Did you enjoy this story? Would you like to read a sequel? Or are you more interested in that spin-off series, Stories from the Craze? Who was your favorite antagonist? Tommy? Doc and Meat Man? The Lord of Flesh? Positive or negative, short or long, whether you want a sequel or not, your reviews will help me reach new readers and improve as a storyteller. The date is September 14, 2023. I just turned 31 years old. It's funny. Every time my birthday comes around, people mention that they're surprised I'm so young at least when considering how many books I've written and how long I've been publishing. I'm not complaining, but I wonder when I'll get to the age when people just think, oh, he's just a normal adult guy. It was a great birthday, though. Had a wonderful lunch with my wife at Bubba Gump, and I realized I ordered the coconut shrimp every time I go there. My daughter turned six months old a few days before my birthday, and it was great to hear her start babbling. I'm convinced she said, Papa, and I won't let anyone take that away from me. As for writing, life has forced me to slow down quite a bit. Parenthood has a lot to do with it, but I also have a lot going on in life at the moment. However, I am already working on one of my next projects. I emphasize one because I'm not sure in which order I'll release my next few books. If this book is too outlandish for you, don't worry. I'll be returned to more traditional human horror soon. I have a home invasion story in the works. I'm hoping to finally finish the sequel to Our Dead Girlfriend. I'm still tinkering with the spiritual successor to The Groomer, and I'm loving my passion project set in Japan in an underworld of horror. Oh, and I also have some fantastic concepts for more twisted romance stories, like Lovesick. However, I should help set the right expectations. None of these books are right around the corner. After Blender Babies, I'll be giving myself some breathing room. I'm still adjusting to being a father and dealing with life's other struggles. And I have to admit that I put too much pressure on myself with this year's deadlines. I even had to go to the clinic for chest pains, which my doctor credited to chronic stress. So I won't be announcing any books until they are very close to completion. I'm talking 80% finished or so. I'll still be around, though. Over the next few months, you can expect new editions of old books with snazzy new covers, new audiobooks, a very special omnibus, and maybe even the launch of my personal store. I have a lot to share. Thank you for reading my 57th novel. I wonder what will be my 60th book. I hope you enjoyed this nightmarish journey through my vision of hell on earth. If you'd like to read more of my writing, please visit my Amazon's authors page and check out my catalog. With over 50 books, I have something for everyone. From the most hardened fans of extreme horror to those just starting to dip their toes into the genre. My previous book, Do Not Disturb 3, Gold Brush, follows a group of residents in a remote village in middle of nowhere, Nevada, when they're attacked by a crew of killer clowns. Inspired by the 2016 clown sightings, this book is part of a series of hardcore slashers, but all the books work as standalones and can be read in any order. 
Once again, thank you for all of your support. I appreciate all of you. Until our next venture into the dark and disturbing, John Ethan. P.S. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me directly using my business email, info at john athancom You can also contact me through Twitter at Johnny Athan, my Facebook page, or Instagram at Author Johnny Athan. I can't promise you that I'll reply right away, but I always try to respond. Thanks. This has been Blender Babies, written by John Athan, narrated by Jamal West. Copyright 2023 by Jonathan Sistos. Production copyright by Jonathan Sistos. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.